Chapter One, Part One of North America, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Céline Major. North America, Volume Two by Anthony Trollope. Chapter One, Washington, Part One the site of the present city of washington was chosen with three special views firstly that being on the potomac it might have the full advantage of water carriage and a seaport secondly that it might be so far removed from the seaboard as to be safe from invasion and thirdly that it might be central alike to all the states it was presumed when washington was founded that these three advantages would be secured by the selected position as regards the first the potomac affords to the city but few of the advantages of a seaport ships can come up but not ships of large burthen the river seems to have dwindled since the site was chosen and at present it is i think evident that washington can never be great in its shipping statio benefida carinis can never be its motto as regards the second point singularly enough washington is the only city of the union that has been in an enemy's position since the united states became a nation in the war of eighteen twelve it fell into our hands and we burnt it as regards the third point washington from the lie of the land can hardly have been said to be centrical at any time owing to the irregularities of the coast it is not easy of access by railways from different sides baltimore would have been far better but as far as we can now see and as well as we can now judge washington will soon be on the borders of the nation to which it belongs instead of at its centre i fear therefore that we must acknowledge that the site chosen for his country's capital by george washington has not been fortunate i have a strong idea which i expressed before in speaking of the capital of the canadas that no man can ordain that on such a spot shall be built a great and thriving city no man can so ordain even though he leave behind him as was the case with washington a prestige sufficient to bind his successors to his wishes the political leaders of the country have done what they could for washington the pride of the nation has endeavoured to sustain the character of its chosen metropolis there has been no rival soliciting favour on the strength of other charms the country has all been agreed on the point since the father of the country first commenced the work florence and rome in italy have each their pretensions but in the states no other city has put itself forward for the honour of entertaining congress and yet washington has been a failure it is commerce that makes great cities and commerce has refused to back the general's choice new york and philadelphia without any political power have become great among the cities of the earth they are beaten by none except by london and paris but washington is but a ragged unfinished collection of unbuilt broad streets as to the completion of which there can now i imagine be but little hope of all places that i know it is the most ungainly and most unsatisfactory i fear i must also say the most presumptuous in its pretensions there is a map of washington accurately laid down and taking that map with him in his journeyings a man may lose himself in the streets not as one loses oneself in london between shoreditch and russell square but as one does so in the deserts of the holy land between emmaus and arimathea in the first place no one knows where the places are or is sure of their existence and then between their presumed localities the country is wild trackless unbridged uninhabited and desolate massachusetts avenue runs the whole length of the city and is inserted on the maps as a full-blown street about four miles in length go there and you will find yourself not only out of town away among the fields but you will find yourself beyond the fields in an uncultivated undrained wilderness tucking your trousers up to your knees you will wade through the bogs you will lose yourself among rude hillocks you will be out of the reach of humanity the unfinished dome of the capital will loom before you in the distance and you will think that you approach the ruins of some western palmyra if you are a sportsman you will desire to shoot snipe within sight of the president's house there is much unsettled land within the states of america but i think none so desolate in its state of nature as three-fourths of the ground on which is supposed to stand the city of washington 
the city of washington is something more than four miles long and is something more than two miles broad the land apportioned to it is nearly as compact as may be and it exceeds in area the size of a parallelogram four miles long by two broad these dimensions are adequate for a noble city for a city to contain a million of inhabitants it is impossible to state with accuracy the actual population of washington for it fluctuates exceedingly the place is very full during congress and very empty during the recess by which i mean it to be understood that those streets which are blessed with houses are full when congress meets i do not think that congress makes much difference to massachusetts avenue i believe that the city never contains as many as eighty thousand and that its permanent residents are less than sixty thousand but it will be said was it not well to prepare for a growing city is it not true that london is choked by its own fatness not having been endowed at its birth or during its growth with proper means for accommodating its own increasing proportions was it not well to lay down fine avenues and broad streets so that future citizens might find a city well prepared to their hand there is no doubt much in such an argument but its correctness must be tested by its success when a man marries it is well that he should make provision for a coming family but a benedict who early in his career shall have carried his friends with considerable self-applause through half a dozen nurseries and at the end of twelve years shall still be the father of one rickety baby will incur a certain amount of ridicule it is very well to be prepared for good fortune but one should limit one's preparation within a reasonable scope two miles by one might perhaps have done for the skeleton sketch of a new city less than half that would contain much more than the present population of washington and there are i fear few towns in the union so little likely to enjoy any speedy increase three avenues sweep the whole length of washington virginia avenue pennsylvania avenue and massachusetts avenue but pennsylvania avenue is the only one known to ordinary men and the half of that only is so known this avenue is the backbone of the city and those streets which are really inhabited cluster round that half of it which runs westward from the capital the eastern end running from the front of the capital is again a desert the plan of the city is somewhat complicated it may truly be called a mighty maze but not without a plan the capital was intended to be the centre of the city it faces eastward away from the potomac or rather from the main branch of the potomac and also unfortunately the main body of the town it turns its back upon the chief thoroughfare upon the treasury buildings and upon the president's house and indeed upon the whole place it was i suppose intended that the streets to the eastward should be noble and populous but hitherto they have come to nothing the building therefore is wrong side foremost and all mankind who enter it senators representatives and judges included go in at the back door of course it is generally known that in the capital is the chamber of the senate that of the house of representatives and the supreme judicial court of the union it may be said that there are two centres in washington this being one and the president's house the other at these centres the main avenues are supposed to cross each other which avenues are called by the names of their respective states at the capital pennsylvania avenue new jersey avenue delaware avenue and maryland avenue converge they come from one extremity of the city to the square of the capital on one side and run out from the other side of it to the other extremity of the city pennsylvania avenue new york avenue vermont avenue and connecticut avenue do the same at what is generally called president square in theory or on paper this seems to be a clear and intelligible arrangement but it does not work well these centre depots are large spaces and consequently one portion of a street is removed a considerable distance from the other it is as though the same name should be given to two streets one of which entered st james park at buckingham gate while the other started from the park at marlborough house to inhabitants the matter probably is not of much moment as it is well known that this portion of such an avenue and that portion of such another avenue are merely myths unknown lands away in the wilds but a stranger finds himself in the position of being sent across the country knee-deep into the mud wading through snipe grounds looking for civilization where none exists all these avenues have a slanting direction 
they are so arranged that none of them run north and south or east and west but the streets so called all run in accordance with the points of the compass those from east to west are a street b street c street and so on counting them away from the capital on each side so that there are two a streets and two b streets on the map these streets run up to v street both right and left v street north and v street south those really known to mankind are e f g h i and k streets north then those streets which run from north to south are numbered first street second street third street and so on on each front of the capital running to twenty-fourth or twenty-fifth street on each side not very many of these have any existence or i might properly say any vitality in their existence such is the plan of the city that being the arrangement and those the dimensions intended by the original architects and founders of washington but the inhabitants have hitherto confined themselves to pennsylvania avenue west and to the streets abutting from it or near to it whatever address a stranger may receive however perplexing it may seem to him he may be sure that the house indicated is near pennsylvania avenue if it be not i should recommend him to pay no attention to the summons even in those streets with which he will become best acquainted the houses are not continuous there will be a house and then a blank then two houses and then a double blank after that a hut or two and then probably an excellent roomy handsome family mansion taken altogether washington as a city is most unsatisfactory and falls more grievously short of the thing attempted than any other of the great undertakings of which i have seen anything in the states san jose the capital of the republic of costa rica in central america has been prepared and arranged as a new city in the same way but even san jose comes nearer to what was intended than does washington for myself i do not believe in cities made after this fashion commerce i think must select the site of all large congregations of mankind in some mysterious way she ascertains what she wants and having acquired that draws men in thousands round her properties liverpool new york lyon glasgow venice marseille hamburg calcutta chicago and leghorn have all become populous and are or have been great because trade found them to be convenient for its purposes trade seems to have ignored washington altogether such being the case the legislature and the executive of the country together have been unable to make of washington anything better than a straggling congregation of buildings in a wilderness we are now trying the same experiment at ottawa in canada having turned our back upon montreal in dudgeon the sight of ottawa is more interesting than that of washington but i doubt whether the experiment will be more successful a new town for art fashion and politics has been built at munich and there it seems to answer the expectation of the builders but at munich there is an old city as well and commerce had already got some considerable hold on the spot before the new town was added to it the streets of washington such as exist are all broad throughout the town there are open spaces spaces i mean intended to be opened by the plan laid down for the city at the present moment it is almost all open space there is also a certain nobility about the proposed dimensions of the avenues and squares desirous of praising it in some degree i can say that the design is grand the thing done however falls so infinitely short of that design that nothing but disappointment is felt and i fear that there is no lookout into the future which can justify a hope that the design will be fulfilled it is therefore a melancholy place the society into which one falls there consists mostly of persons who are not permanently resident in the capital but of those who were permanent residents i found none who spoke of their city with affection the men and women of boston think that the sun shines nowhere else and boston common is very pleasant the new yorkers believe in fifth avenue with an unswerving faith and fifth avenue is calculated to inspire a faith philadelphia to a philadelphian is the centre of the universe and the progress of philadelphia perhaps justifies the partiality the same thing may be said of chicago of buffalo and of baltimore but the same thing cannot be said in any degree of washington they who belong to it turn up their noses at it they feel that they live surrounded by a failure 
its grand names are as yet false and none of the efforts made have hitherto been successful even in winter when congress is sitting washington is melancholy but washington in summer must surely be the saddest spot on earth there are six principal public buildings in washington as to which no expense seems to have been spared and in the construction of which a certain amount of success has been obtained in most of these this success has been more or less marred by an independent deviation from recognized rules of architectural taste these are the capitol the post office the patent office the treasury the president's house and the smithsonian institute the five first are grecian and the last in washington is called romanesque had i been left to classify it by my own unaided lights i should have called it bastard gothic the capital is by far the most imposing and though there is much about it with which i cannot but find fault it certainly is imposing the present building was i think commenced in eighteen fifteen the former capital having been destroyed by the english in the war of eighteen twelve to thirteen it was then finished according to the original plan with a fine portico and well-proportioned pediment above it looking to the east the outer flight of steps leading up to this from the eastern approach is good and in excellent taste the expanse of the building to the right and left as then arranged was well proportioned and as far as we can now judge the then existing dome was well proportioned also as seen from the east the original building must have been in itself very fine the stone is beautiful being bright almost as marble and i do not know that there was any great architectural defect to offend the eye the figures in the pediment are mean there is now in the capital a group apparently prepared for a pediment which is by no means mean i was informed that they were intended for this position but they on the other hand are too good for such a place and are also too numerous this set of statues is by crawford most of them are well known and they are very fine they now stand within the old chamber of the representative house and the pity is that if elevated to such a position as that indicated they can never be really seen there are models of them all at west point and some of them i have seen at other places in marble the historical society at new york has one or two of them in and about the front of the capitol there are other efforts of sculpture imposing in their size and assuming if not affecting much in the attitudes chosen statuary at washington runs too much on two subjects which are repeated perhaps almost ad nauseam one is that of a stiff steady-looking healthy but ugly individual with a square jaw and a big jowl which represents the great general he does not prepossess the beholder because he appears to be thoroughly ill-natured and the other represents a melancholy weak figure without any hair but often covered with feathers and is intended to typify the red indian the red indian is generally supposed to be receiving comfort but it is manifest that he never enjoys the comfort ministered to him there is a gigantic statue of washington by greenough out in the grounds in front of the building the figure is seated and holding up one of its arms towards the city there is about it a kind of weighty magnificence but it is stiff ungainly and altogether without life but the front of the original building is certainly grand the architect who designed it must have had skill taste and nobility of conception but even this was spoilt or rather wasted by the fact that the front is made to look upon nothing and is turned from the city it is as though the facade of the london post office had been made to face the goldsmith's hall the capital stands upon the side of a hill the front occupying a much higher position than the back consequently they who enter it from the back and everybody does so enter it are first called on to rise to the level of the lower floor by a stiff ascent of exterior steps which are in no way grand or imposing and then having entered by a mean back door are instantly obliged to ascend again by another flight by stairs sufficiently appropriate to a back entrance but altogether unfitted for the chief approach to such a building it may of course be said that persons who are particular in such matters should go in at the front door and not at the back but one must take these things as one finds them the entrance by which the capital is approached is such as i have described there are mean little brick chimneys at the left hand as one walks in attached to modern bakeries which have been constructed in the basement for the use of the soldiers 
and there is on the other hand the road by which wagons find their way to the underground region with fuel stationery and other matters desired by senators and representatives and at present by bakers also in speaking of the front i have spoken of it as it was originally designed and built since that period very heavy wings have been added to the pile wings so heavy that they are or seem to be much larger than the original structure itself this to my thinking has destroyed the symmetry of the whole the wings which in themselves are by no means devoid of beauty are joined to the centre by passages so narrow that from exterior points of view the light can be seen through them this robs the mass of all oneness of all entirety as a whole and gives a scattered straggling appearance where there should be a look of massiveness and integrity the dome also has been raised a double drum having been given to it this is unfinished and should not therefore yet be judged but i cannot think that the increased height will be an improvement this again to my eyes appears to be straggling rather than massive at a distance it commands attention and to one journeying through the desert places of the city gives that idea of palmyra which i have before mentioned nevertheless and in spite of all that i have said i have had pleasure in walking backwards and forwards and through the grounds which lie before the eastern front of the capital the space for the view is ample and the thing to be seen has points which are very grand if the capital were finished and all washington were built around it no man would say that the house in which congress sat disgraced the city going west but not due west from the capital pennsylvania avenue stretches in a right line to the treasury chambers the distance is beyond a mile and men say scornfully that the two buildings have been put so far apart in order to save the secretaries who sit in the bureaus from a too rapid influx of members of congress this statement i by no means endorse but it is undoubtedly the fact that both senators and representatives are very diligent in their calls upon gentlemen high in office i have been present on some such occasions and it has always seemed to me that questions of patronage have been paramount this reach of pennsylvania avenue is the quarter for the best shops of washington that is to say the frequented side of it is so that side which is on your right as you leave the capital of the other side the world knows nothing and very bad shops they are i doubt whether there be any town in the world at all equal in importance to washington which is in such respects so ill provided the shops are bad and dear in saying this i am guided by the opinions of all whom i heard speak on the subject the same thing was told me of the hotels hearing that the city was very full at the time of my visit full to overflowing i had obtained private rooms through a friend before i went there had i not done so i might have lain in the streets or have made one with three or four others in a small room at some third-rate inn there had never been so great a throng in the town i am bound to say that my friend did well for me i found myself put up at the house of one warmly a coloured man in i street to whose attention i can recommend any englishman who may chance to want quarters in washington he has a hotel on one side of the street and private lodging-houses on the other in which i found myself located from what i heard of the hotels i conceived myself to be greatly in luck willard's is the chief of these and the everlasting crowd and throng of men with which the halls and passages of the house were always full certainly did not seem to promise either privacy or comfort but then there are places in which privacy and comfort are not expected are hardly even desired and washington is one of them the post office and the patent office lie a little away from pennsylvania avenue in f street and are opposite to each other the post office is certainly a very graceful building it is square and hardly can be said to have any settled front or any grand entrance it is not approached by steps but stands flush on the ground alike on each of the four sides it is ornamented with corinthian pilasters but is not over ornamented it is certainly a structure creditable to any city the streets around it are all unfinished and it is approached through seas of mud and sloughs of despond which have been contrived as i imagine to lessen if possible the crowd of callers and lighten in this way the overtasked officials within that side by which the public in general were supposed to approach was during my sojourn always guarded by vast mountains of flour-barrels 
looking up at the windows of the building i perceived also that barrels were piled within and then i knew that the post office had become a provision depot for the army the official arrangements here for the public were so bad as to be absolutely barbarous i feel some remorse in saying this for i was myself treated with the utmost courtesy by gentlemen holding high positions in the office to which i was specially attracted by my own connection with the post office in england but i do not think that such courtesy should hinder me from telling what i saw that was bad seeing that it would not hinder me from telling what i saw that was good in washington there is but one post office there are no iron pillars or wayside letter boxes as are to be found in other towns of the union no subsidiary offices at which stamps can be bought and letters posted the distances of the city are very great the means of transit through the city very limited the dirt of the city weighs unrivalled in depth and tenacity and yet there is but one post office nor is there any established system of letter carriers to those who desire it letters are brought out and delivered by carriers who charge a separate porterage for that service but the rule is that letters shall be delivered from the window for strangers this is of course a necessity of their position and i found that when once i had left instructions that my letters should be delivered those instructions were carefully followed indeed nothing could exceed the civility of the officials within but so also nothing can exceed the barbarity of the arrangements without the purchase of stamps i found to be utterly impracticable they were sold at a window in a corner at which newspapers were also delivered to which there was no regular ingress and from which there was no egress it would generally be deeply surrounded by a crowd of muddy soldiers who would wait there patiently till time should enable them to approach the window the delivery of letters was almost more tedious though in that there was a method the aspirants stood in a long line on cue as we are told by carlyle that the bread-seekers used to approach the bakers shops at paris during the revolution this cue would sometimes project out into the street the work inside was done very slowly the clerk had no facility by use of a desk or otherwise for running through the letters under the initials denominated but turned letter by letter through his hand to one questioner out of ten would a letter be given it no doubt may be said in excuse for this that the presence of the army round washington caused at that period special inconvenience and that plea should of course be taken were it not that a very trifling alteration in the management within would have remedied all the inconvenience as a building the washington post office is very good as the centre of a most complicated and difficult department i believe it to be well managed but as regards the special accommodation given by it to the city in which it stands much cannot i think be said in its favour opposite to that which is i presume the back of the post office stands the patent office this also is a grand building with a fine portico of doric pillars at each of its three fronts these are approached by flights of steps more gratifying to the eye than to the legs the whole structure is massive and grand and if the streets round it were finished would be imposing the utilitarian spirit of the nation has however done much toward marring the appearance of the building by piercing it with windows altogether unsuited to it both in number and size the walls even under the porticos have been so pierced in order that the whole space might be utilized without loss of light and the effect is very mean the windows are small and without ornament something like a london window of the time of george the third the effect produced by a dozen such at the back of a noble doric porch looking down among the pillars may be imagined in the interior of this building the minister of the interior holds his court and of course also the commissioners of patents here is in accordance with the name of the building a museum of models of all patents taken out i wandered through it gazing with listless eye now upon this and now upon that but to me in my ignorance it was no better than a large toy-shop when i saw an ancient dusty white hat with some peculiar appendage to it which was unintelligible it was no more to me than any other old white hat but had i been a man of science what a tale it might have told wandering about through the patent office i also found a hospital for soldiers a british officer was with me who pronounced it to be in its kind very good at any rate it was sweet airy and large in these days the soldiers had got hold of everything 
the treasury chambers is as yet an unfinished building the front to the south has been completed but that to the north has not been built here at the north stands as yet the old secretary of state's office this is to come down and the secretary of state is to be located in the new building which will be added to the treasury this edifice will probably strike strangers more forcibly than any other in the town both from its position and from its own character it stands with its side to pennsylvania avenue but the avenue here has turned round and runs due north and south having taken a twist so as to make way for the treasury and for the president's house through both of which it must run had it been carried straight on throughout these public offices stand with their side to the street and the whole length is ornamented with an exterior row of ionic columns raised high above the footway this is perhaps the prettiest thing in the city and when the front to the north has been completed the effect will be still better the granite monoliths which have been used and which are to be used in this building are very massive as one enters by the steps to the south there are two flat stones one on each side of the ascent the surface of each of which is about twenty feet by eighteen the columns are i think all monoliths of those which are still to be erected and which now lie about in the neighbouring streets i measured one or two one which was still in the rough i found to be thirty-two feet long by five feet broad and four and a half deep these granite blocks have been brought to washington from the state of maine the finished front of this building looking down to the potomac is very good but to my eyes this also has been much injured by the rows of windows which look out from the building in the space of the portico End of chapter 1 part 1chapter one part two of north america volume two by antony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain one washington part two the president's house or the white house as it is now called all the world over is a handsome mansion fitted for the chief officer of a great republic and nothing more i think i may say that we have private houses in london considerably larger it is neat and pretty and with all its immediate outside belonging calls down no adverse criticism it faces on to a small garden which seems to be always accessible to the public and opens out upon that everlasting pennsylvania avenue which has now made another turn here in front of the white house is president square as it is generally called the technical name is i believe lafayette square the houses round it are few in number not exceeding three or four on each side but they are among the best in washington and the whole place is neat and well kept president's square is certainly the most attractive part of the city the garden of the square is always open and does not seem to suffer from any public ill usage by which circumstance i am again led to suggest that the gardens of our london squares might be thrown open in the same way in the centre of this one at washington immediately facing the president's house is an equestrian statue of general jackson it is very bad but that is not nearly as bad as it might be as proved by another equestrian statue of general washington erected in the centre of a small garden plat at the end of pennsylvania avenue near the bridge leading to georgetown of all the statues on horseback which i ever saw either in marble or bronze this is by far the worst and most ridiculous the horse is most absurd but the man sitting on the horse is manifestly drunk i should think the time must come when this figure at any rate will be removed i did not go inside the president's house not having had while at washington an opportunity of paying my personal respects to mr lincoln i had been told that this was to be done without trouble but when i inquired on the subject i found that this was not exactly the case i believe there are times when anybody may walk into the president's house without an introduction but that i take it is not considered to be the proper way of doing the work i found that something like a favour would be incurred or that some disagreeable trouble would be given if i made a request to be presented and therefore i left washington without seeing the great man the president's house is nice to look at but it is built on marshy ground not much above the level of the potomac and is very unhealthy i was told that all who live there become subject to fever and ague and that few who now live there have escaped it altogether 
this comes of choosing the site of a new city and decreeing that it shall be built on this or on that spot large cities especially in these latter days do not collect themselves in unhealthy places men desert such localities or at least do not congregate at them when their character is once known but the poor president cannot desert the white house he must make the most of the residence which the nation has prepared for him of the other considerable public building of washington called the smithsonian institution i have said that its style was bastard gothic by this i mean that its main attributes are gothic but that liberties have been taken with it which whether they may injure its beauty or no certainly are subversive of architectural purity it is built of red stone and is not ugly in itself there is a very nice norman porch to it and little bits of lombard gothic have been well copied from cologne but windows have been fitted in with stilted arches of which the stilts seem to crack and bend so narrow are they and so high and then the towers with high pinnacled roofs are a mistake unless indeed they be needed to give to the whole structure that name of romanesque which it has assumed the building is used for museums and lectures and was given to the city by one james smithson an englishman i cannot say that the city of washington seems to be grateful for all to whom i spoke on the subject hinted that the institution was a failure it is to be remarked that nobody in washington is proud of washington or of anything in it if the smithsonian institution were at new york or at boston one would have a different story to tell there has been an attempt made to raise at washington a vast obelisk to the memory of washington the first in war and first in peace as the country is proud to call him this obelisk is a fair type of the city it is unfinished not a third of it having as yet been erected and in all human probability will ever remain so if finished it would be the highest monument of its kind standing on the face of the globe and yet after all what would it be even then as compared with one of the great pyramids modern attempts cannot bear comparison with those of the old world in simple vastness but in lieu of simple vastness the modern world aims to achieve either beauty or utility by the washington monument if completed neither would be achieved an obelisk with the proportions of a needle may be very graceful but an obelisk which requires an expanse of flat-roofed sprawling buildings for its base and of which the shaft shall be as big as a cathedral tower cannot be graceful at present some third portion of the shaft has been built and there it stands no one has a word to say for it no one thinks that money will ever again be subscribed for its completion i saw somewhere a box of plate glass kept for contributions for this purpose and looking in it perceived that two half-dollar pieces had been given but both of them were bad i was told also that the absolute foundation of the edifice is bad that the ground which is near the river and swampy would not bear the weight intended to be imposed on it a sad and saddening spot was that marsh as i wandered down on it all alone one sunday afternoon the ground was frozen and i could walk dry shod but there was not a blade of grass around me on all sides were cattle in great numbers steers and big oxen lowing in their hunger for a meal they were beef for the army and never again i suppose would it be allowed to them to fill their big maws and chew the patient cud there on the brown ugly undrained field within easy sight of the president's house stood the useless shapeless graceless pile of stones it was as though i were looking on the genius of the city it was vast pretentious bold boastful with a loud voice already taller by many heads than other obelisks but nevertheless still in its infancy ugly unpromising and false the founder of the monument had said here shall be the obelisk of the world and the founder of the city had thought of his child somewhat in the same strain it is still possible that both city and monument shall be completed but at the present moment nobody seems to believe in the one or in the other for myself i have much faith in the american character but i cannot believe either in washington city or in the washington monument the boast made has been too loud and the fulfilment yet accomplished has been too small have i as yet said that washington was dirty in that winter of eighteen sixty one to sixty two or i should rather ask 
have i made it understood that in walking about washington one waded as deep in mud as one does in floundering through an ordinary ploughed field in november there were parts of pennsylvania avenue which would have been considered heavy ground by most hunting men and through some of the remoter streets none but light weights could have lived long this was the state of the town when i left it in the middle of january on my arrival in the middle of december everything was in a cloud of dust one walked through an atmosphere of floating mud for the dirt was ponderous and thick and very palpable in its atoms then came a severe frost and a little snow and if one did not fall while walking it was very well after that we had the thaw and washington assumed its normal winter condition i must say that during the whole of this time the atmosphere was to me exhilarating but i was hardly out of the doctor's hands while i was there and he did not support my theory as to the goodness of the air it is poisoned by the soldiers he said and everybody is ill but then my doctor was perhaps a little tinged with southern proclivities on the virginian side of the potomac stands a country house called arlington heights from which there is a fine view down upon the city arlington heights is a beautiful spot having all the attractions of a fine park in our country it is covered with grand timber the ground is varied and broken and the private roads about sweep here into a dell and then up a brayside as roads should do in such a domain below it was the potomac and immediately on the other side stands the city of washington any city seen thus is graceful and the white stones of the big buildings when the sun gleams on them showing the distant rows of columns seem to tell something of great endeavour and of achieved success it is the place from whence washington should be seen by those who wish to think well of the present city and its future prosperity but is it not the case that every city is beautiful from a distance the house at arlington heights is picturesque but neither large nor good it has before it a high greek colonnade which seems to be almost bigger than the house itself had such been built in a city and many such a portico does stand in cities throughout the states it would be neither picturesque nor graceful but here it is surrounded by timber and as the columns are seen through the trees they gratify the eye rather than offend it the place did belong and as i think still does belong to the family of the lees if not already confiscated general lee who is or would be the present owner bears high command in the army of the confederalists and knows well by what tenure he holds or is likely to hold his family property the family were friends of general washington whose seat mount vernon stands about twelve miles lower down the river and here no doubt washington often stood looking on the site he had chosen if his spirit could stand there now and look around upon the masses of soldiers by which his capital is surrounded how would it address the city of his hopes when he saw that every foot of the neighboring soil was desecrated by a camp or torn into loathsome furrows of mud by cannon and army wagons that agriculture was gone and that every effort both of north and south was concentrated on the art of killing when he saw that this was done on the very spot chosen by himself for the centre temple of an everlasting union what would he then say as to that boast made on his behalf by his countrymen that he was first in war and first in peace washington was a great man and i believe a good man i at any rate will not belittle him i think that he had the firmness and audacity necessary for a revolutionary leader that he had honesty to preserve him from the temptations of ambition and ostentation and that he had the good sense to be guided in civil matters by men who had studied the laws of social life and the theories of free government he was used to set tenax propositi and in periods that might well have dismayed a smaller man he feared neither the throne to which he opposed himself nor the changing voices of the fellow-citizens for whose welfare he had fought but sixty or seventy years will not suffice to give to a man the fame of having been first among all men washington did much and i for one do not believe that his work will perish but i have always found it difficult i may say impossible to sound his praises in his own land let us suppose that a courteous frenchman ventures an opinion among englishmen that wellington was a great general 
would he feel disposed to go on with his eulogium when encountered on two or three sides at once with such observations as the following i should rather calculate he was about the first that ever did live or ever will live why he whipped your napoleon everlasting whenever he met him he whipped everybody out of the field there weren't anybody ever lived was able to stand nigh him and there won't come any like him again sir i guess our wellington never had his legs on your side of the water such men can't grow in a downtrodden country of slaves and paupers under such circumstances the frenchman would probably be shut up and when i strove to speak of washington i generally found myself shut up also arlington heights when i was at washington was the headquarters of general mcdowell the general to whom it is attributed i believe most wrongfully the loss of the battle of bull's run the whole place was then one camp the fences had disappeared the gardens were trodden into mud the roads had been cut to pieces and new tracks made everywhere through the grounds but the timber still remained some no doubt had fallen but enough stood for the ample ornamentation of the place i saw placards up prohibiting the destruction of the trees and it is to be hoped that they have been spared very little in this way has been spared in the country all around mount vernon washington's own residence stands close over the potomac above six miles below alexandria it will be understood that the capital is on the eastern or maryland side of the river and that arlington heights alexandria and mount vernon are in virginia the river potomac divided the two old colonies or states as they afterwards became but when washington was to be built a territory said to be ten miles square was cut out of the two states and was called the district of columbia the greater portion of this district was taken from maryland and on that the city was built it comprised the pleasant town of georgetown which is now a suburb and the only suburb of washington the portion of the district on the virginian side included arlington heights and went so far down the river as to take in the virginian city of alexandria this was the extreme western point of the district but since that arrangement was made the state of virginia petitioned to have their portion of columbia back again and this petition was granted now it is felt that the land on both sides of the river should belong to the city and the government is anxious to get back the virginian section the city and the immediate vicinity are freed from all state allegiance and are under the immediate rule of the united states government having of course its own municipality but the inhabitants have no political power as power is counted in the states they vote for no political officer not even for the president and return no member to congress either as a senator or as a representative mount vernon was never within the district of columbia when i first made inquiry on the subject i was told that mount vernon at that time was not to be reached that though it was not in the hands of the rebels neither was it in the hands of northerners and that therefore strangers could not go there but this though it was told to me and others by those who should have known the facts was not the case i had gone down the river with a party of ladies and we were opposite to mount vernon but on that occasion we were assured we could not land the rebels we were told would certainly seize the ladies and carry them off into secessia on hearing which the ladies were of course doubly anxious to be landed but our stern commander for we were on a government boat would not listen to their prayers but carried us instead on board the pensacola a sloop of war which was now lying in the river ready to go to sea and ready also to run the gauntlet of the rebel batteries which lined the virginian shore of the river for many miles down below alexandria and mount vernon a sloop of war in these days means a large man of war the guns of which are so big that they only stand on one deck whereas a frigate would have them on two decks and a line of battleship on three of line of battleships there will i suppose soon be none as the warrior is only a frigate we went over the pensacola and i must say she was very nice pretty and clean i have always found american sailors on their men of war to be clean and nice-looking as much so i should say as our own but nothing can be dirtier more untidy or apparently more ill-preserved than all the appurtenances of their soldiers we landed also on this occasion at alexandria and saw as melancholy and miserable a town as the mind of man can conceive 
its ordinary male population counting by the voters is fifteen hundred and of these seven hundred were in the southern army the place had been made a hospital for northern soldiers and no doubt the site for that purpose had been well chosen but let any woman imagine what would be the feelings of her life while living in a town used as a hospital for the enemies against whom her absent husband was then fighting her own man would be away ill wounded dying for what she knew without the comfort of any hospital attendance without physic with no one to comfort him but those she hated with a hatred much keener than his were close to her hand using some friend's house that had been forcibly taken crawling out into the sun under her eyes taking the bread from her mouth life in alexandria at this time must have been sad enough the people were all secessionists but the town was held by the northern party through the lines into virginia they could not go at all up to washington they could not go without a military pass not to be obtained without some cause given all trade was at an end in no town at that time was trade flourishing but here it was killed altogether except that absolutely necessary trade of bread who would buy boots or coats or want new saddles or waste money on books in such days as these in such a town as alexandria and then out of fifteen hundred men one half had gone to fight the southern battles among the women of alexandria secession would have found but few opponents it was here that a hot-brained young man named ellsworth was killed in the early days of the rebellion he was a colonel in the northern volunteer army and on entering alexandria found a secession flag flying at the chief hotel instead of sending up a corporal's guard to remove it he rushed up and pulled it down with his own hand as he descended the landlord shot him dead and one of his soldiers shot the landlord dead it was a pity that so brave a lad who had risen so high should fall so vainly but they have made a hero of him in america have inscribed his name on marble monuments and counted him up among their great men in all this their mistake is very great it is bad for a country to have no names worthy of monumental brass but it is worse for a country to have monumental brasses covered with names which have never been made worthy of such honour ellsworth had shown himself to be brave and foolish let his folly be pardoned on the score of his courage and there i think should have been an end of it i found out afterwards that mount vernon was accessible and i rode thither with some officers from the staff of general heintzelman whose outside pickets were stationed beyond the old place i certainly should not have been well pleased had i been forced to leave the country without seeing the house in which washington had lived and died till lately this place was owned and inhabited by one of the family a washington descended from a brother of the general's but it has now become the property of the country under the auspices of mr everett by whose exertions was raised the money with which it was purchased it is a long house of two stories built i think chiefly of wood with a veranda or rather long portico attached to the front which looks upon the river there are two wings or sets of outhouses containing the kitchen and servants rooms which were joined by open wooden verandas to the main building but one of these verandas has gone under the influence of years by these a semicircular sweep is formed before the front door which opens away from the river and towards the old prim gardens into which we were told general washington used to take much delight there is nothing very special about the house indeed as a house it would now be found comfortless and inconvenient but the ground falls well down to the river and the timber if not fine is plentiful and picturesque the chief interest of the place however is the tomb of washington and his wife it must be understood that it was a common practice throughout the states to make a family burying ground in any secluded spot on the family property i have not unfrequently come across these in my rambles and in virginia i have encountered small unpretending gravestones under a shady elm dated as lately as eight or ten years back at mount vernon there is now a cemetery of the washington family and there in an open vault a vault open but guarded by iron grating is the great man's tomb and by his side the tomb of martha his wife 
as i stood there alone with no one by to irritate me by assertions of the man's absolute supremacy i acknowledged that i had come to the final resting-place of a great and good man of a man whose patriotism was i believe an honest feeling untinged by any personal ambition of a selfish nature that he was preeminently a successful man may have been due chiefly to the excellence of his cause and the blood and character of the people who put him forward as their right arm in their contest but that he did not mar that success by arrogance or destroy the brightness of his own name by personal aggrandizement is due to a noble nature and to the calm individual excellence of the man considering the circumstances and history of the place the position of mount vernon as i saw it was very remarkable it lay exactly between the lines of the two armies the pickets of the northern army had been extended beyond it not improbably with the express intention of keeping a spot so hollowed within the power of the northern government but since the war began it had been in the hands of the seceders in fact it stood there in the middle of the battlefield on the very line of division between loyalism and secession and this was the spot which washington had selected as the heart and centre and safest rallying homestead of the united nation which he left behind him but washington when he resolved to found his capital on the banks of the potomac knew nothing of the glories of the mississippi he did not dream of the speedy addition to his already gathered constellations of those western stars of wisconsin illinois minnesota and iowa nor did he dream of texas conquered louisiana purchased and missouri and kansas rescued from the wilderness i have said that washington was at that time the christmas of eighteen sixty one to sixty two a melancholy place this was partly owing to the despondent tone in which so many americans then spoke of their own affairs it was not that the northern men thought that they were to be beaten or that the southern men feared that things were going bad with their party across the river but that nobody seemed to have any faith in anybody mcclellan had been put up as the true man exalted perhaps too quickly considering the limited opportunities for distinguishing himself which fortune had thrown in his way but now belief in mcclellan seemed to be slipping away one felt that it was so from day to day though it was impossible to define how or whence the feeling came and then the character of the ministry fared still worse in public estimation that lincoln the president was honest and that chase the secretary of the treasury was able was the only good that one heard spoken at this time two jonahs were specially pointed out as necessary sacrifices by whose immersion into the comfortless ocean of private life the ship might perhaps be saved these were mr cameron the secretary of war and mr wells the secretary of the navy it was said that lincoln when pressed to rid his cabinet of cameron had replied that when a man was crossing a stream the moment was hardly convenient for changing his horse but it came to that at last that he found he must change his horse even in the very sharpest run of the river better that than sit an animal on whose exertions he knew that he could not trust so mr cameron went and mr stanton became secretary at war in his place but mr cameron though put out of the cabinet was to be saved from absolute disgrace by being sent as minister to russia i do not know that it would become me here to repeat the accusations made against mr cameron but it had long seemed to me that the maintenance in such a position at such a time of a gentleman who had to sustain such a universal absence of public confidence must have been most detrimental to the army and to the government men whom one met in washington were not unhappy about the state of things as i had seen men unhappy in the north and in the west they were mainly indifferent but with that sort of indifference which arises from a breakdown of faith in anything there was the army yes the army but what an army nobody obeyed anybody nobody did anything nobody thought of advancing there were perhaps two hundred thousand men assembled round washington and now the effort of supplying them with food and clothing was as much as could be accomplished but the contractors in the meantime were becoming rich and then as to the government who trusted it who would put their faith in seward and cameron cameron was now gone it was true 
and in that way the whole of the cabinet would soon be broken up as to congress what could congress do ask questions which no one would care to answer and finally get itself packed up and sent home the president and the constitution fared no better in men's mouths the former did nothing neither harm nor good and as for the latter it had broken down and shown itself to be inefficient so men ate and drank and laughed waiting till chaos should come secure in the belief that the atoms into which their world would resolve itself would connect themselves again in some other form without trouble on their part and at washington i found no strong feeling against england and english conduct towards america we men of the world a washington man might have said know very well that everybody must take care of himself first we are very good friends with you of course and are very glad to see you at our table whenever you come across the water but as for rejoicing at your joys or expecting you to sympathize with our sorrows we know the world too well for that we are splitting into pieces and of course that is gain to you take another cigar this polite fashionable and certainly comfortable way of looking at the matter had never been attained at new york or philadelphia at boston or chicago the northern provincial world of the states had declared to itself that those who were not with it were against it that its neighbors should be either friends or foes that it would understand nothing of neutrality this was often mortifying to me but i think i liked it better on the whole than the laissez aller indifference of washington everybody acknowledged that society in washington had been almost destroyed by the loss of the southern half of the usual sojourners in the city the senators and members of government who heretofore had come from the southern states had no doubt spent more money in the capital than their northern brethren they and their families had been more addicted to social pleasures they are the descendants of the old english cavaliers whereas the northern men have come from the old english roundheads or if as may be the case the blood of the races has now been too well mixed to allow of this being said with absolute truth yet something of the manners of the old forefathers has been left the southern gentleman is more genial less dry i will not say more hospitable but more given to enjoy hospitality than his northern brother and this difference is quite as strong with the women as with the men it may therefore be understood that secession would be very fatal to the society of washington it was not only that the members of congress were not there as to the very many of the representatives it may be said that they do not belong sufficiently to washington to make a part of its society it is not every representative that is perhaps qualified to do so but secession had taken away from washington those who held property in the south who were bound to the south by any ties whether political or other who belonged to the south by blood education and old habits in very many cases nay in most such cases it had been necessary that a man should select whether he would be a friend to the south and therefore a rebel or else an enemy to the south and therefore untrue to all the predilections and sympathies of his life here has been the hardship for such people there has been no neutrality possible ladies even have not been able to profess themselves simply anxious for peace and good will and so to remain tranquil they who are not for me are against me has been spoken by one side and by the other and i suppose that in all civil war it is necessary that it should be so i heard of various cases in which father and son had espoused different sides in order that property might be retained both in the north and in the south under such circumstances it may be supposed that society in washington would be considerably cut up all this made the place somewhat melancholy End of chapter one chapter two of north america volume two by antony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain two congress in the interior of the capital much space is at present wasted but this arises from the fact of great additions to the original plan having been made the two chambers that of the senate and of the representatives are in the two new wings on the middle of what we call the first floor 
the entrance is made under a dome to a large circular hall which is hung around with surely the worst pictures by which a nation ever sought to glorify its own deeds there are yards of paintings at versailles which are bad enough but there is nothing at versailles comparable in villainy to the huge daubs which are preserved in this hall at the capital it is strange that even self-laudatory patriotism should desire the perpetuation of such rubbish when i was there the new dome was still in progress and an ugly column of woodwork required for internal support and affording a staircase to the top stood in this hall this of course was a temporary and necessary evil but even this was hung around with the vilest of portraits from the hall turning to the left if the entrance be made at the front door one goes to the new chamber of representatives passing through that which was the old chamber this is now dedicated to the exposition of various new figures by crawford and to the sale of tarts and gingerbread of very bad tarts and gingerbread let that old woman look to it or let the house dismiss her in fact this chamber is now but a vestibule to a passage a second hall as it were and thus thrown away changes probably will be made which will bring it into some use or some scheme of ornamentation from this a passage runs to the representative chamber passing between those tell-tale windows which looking to the right and left proclaim the tenuity of the building the windows on one side that looking to the east or front should i think be closed the appearance both from the inside and from the outside would be thus improved the representative chamber itself which of course answers to our house of commons is a handsome commodious room admirably fitted for the purposes required it strikes one as rather low but i doubt if it were higher whether it would be better adapted for hearing even at present it is not perfect in this respect as regards the listeners in the gallery it is a handsome long chamber lighted by skylights from the roof and is amply large enough for the number to be accommodated the speaker sits opposite to the chief entrance his desk being fixed against the opposite wall he is thus brought nearer to the body of men before him than is the case with our speaker he sits at a marble table and the clerks below him are also accommodated with marble every representative has his own armchair and his own desk before it this may be done for a house consisting of about two hundred forty members but could hardly be contrived with us these desks are arranged in a semicircular form or in a broad horseshoe and every member as he sits faces the speaker a score or so of little boys are always running about the floor ministering to the members wishes carrying up petitions to the chair bringing water to long-winded legislators delivering and carrying out letters and running with general messages they do not seem to interrupt the course of business and yet they are the liveliest little boys i ever saw when a member claps his hands indicating a desire for attendance three or four will jockey for the honour on the whole i thought the little boys had a good time of it but not so the speaker it seemed to me that the amount of work falling upon the speaker's shoulders was cruelly heavy his voice was always ringing in my ears exactly as does the voice of the croupier at a gambling table who goes on declaring and explaining the results of the game and who generally does so in sharp loud ringing tones from which all interest in the proceeding itself seems to be excluded it was just so with this speaker in the house of representatives the debate was always full of interruptions but on every interruption the speaker asked the gentleman interrupted whether he would consent to be so treated the gentleman from indiana has the floor the gentleman from ohio wishes to ask the gentleman from indiana a question the gentleman from indiana gives permission the gentleman from ohio these last words being a summons to him of ohio to get up and ask his question the gentleman from pennsylvania rises to order the gentleman from pennsylvania is in order and then the house seems always to be voting and the speaker is always putting the question the gentlemen who agree to the amendment will say aye not a sound is heard the gentlemen who oppose the amendment will say no again not a sound the ayes have it says the speaker and then he goes on again all this he does with amazing rapidity and is always at it with the same hard quick ringing uninterested voice the gentleman whom i saw in the chair was very clever and quite up to the task 
but as for dignity perhaps it might be found that any great accession of dignity would impede the celerity of the work to be done and that a closer copy of the british model might not on the whole increase the efficiency of the american machine when any matter of real interest occasioned a vote the eyes and nose would be given aloud and then if there were a doubt arising from the volume of sound the speaker would declare that the eyes or the nose would seem to have it and upon this a poll would be demanded in such cases the speaker calls on two members who come forth and stand fronting each other before the chair making a gangway through this the eyes walk like sheep the tellers giving them an accelerating poke when they fail to go on with rapidity thus they are counted and the nose are counted in the same way it seemed to me that it would be very possible in a dishonest legislator to vote twice on any subject of great interest but it may perhaps be the case that there are no dishonest legislators in the house of representatives according to a list which i obtained the present number of members is one hundred seventy three and there are sixty-three vacancies occasioned by secession new york returns thirty-three members pennsylvania twenty-five ohio twenty-one virginia thirteen massachusetts and indiana eleven tennessee and kentucky ten south carolina six and so on till delaware kansas and florida return only one each when the constitution was framed pennsylvania returned eight and new york only six whereas virginia returned ten and south carolina five from which may be gathered the relative rate of increase in population of the free soil states and the slave states all these states return two senators each to the other house kansas sending as many as new york the work in the house begins at twelve noon and is not often carried on late into the evening indeed this i think is never done till towards the end of the session the senate house is in the opposite wing of the building the position of the one house answering exactly to that of the other it is somewhat smaller but is as a matter of course much less crowded there are thirty-four states and therefore sixty-eight seats and sixty-eight desks only are required these also are arranged in a horseshoe form and face the president but there was a sad array of empty chairs when i was in washington nineteen or twenty seats being vacant in consequence of secession in this house the vice-president of the united states acts as president but has by no means so hard a job of work as his brother on the other side of the way mr hannibal hamlin from maine now fills this chair i was driven while in washington to observe something amounting almost to a peculiarity in the christian names of the gentlemen who were then administrating the government of the country mr abraham lincoln was the president mr hannibal hamlin the vice-president mr galusha grow the speaker of the representatives mr salmon chase the secretary of the treasury mr caleb smith the attorney-general mr simon cameron the secretary at war and mr gideon wells the secretary of the navy in the senate house as in the other house there are very commodious galleries for strangers running round the entire chambers and these galleries are open to all the world as with all such places in the states a large portion of them is appropriated to ladies but i came at last to find that the word lady signified a female or a decently dressed man any arrangement for classes is in america impossible the seats intended for gentlemen must as a matter of course be open to all men but by giving up to the rougher sex half the amount of accommodation nominally devoted to ladies the desirable division is to a certain extent made i generally found that i could obtain admittance to the ladies gallery if my coat were decent and i had gloves with me all the adjuncts of both these chambers are rich and in good keeping the staircases are of marble and the outside passages and lobbies are noble in size and in every way convenient one knows well the trouble of getting into the house of lords and house of commons and the want of comfort which attends one there and an englishman cannot fail to make comparisons injurious to his own country it would not perhaps be possible to welcome all the world in london as is done in washington but there can be no good reason why the space given to the public with us should not equal that given in washington but so far are we from sheltering the public that we have made our house of commons so small that it will not even hold all its own members 
i had an opportunity of being present at one of their field days in the senate slidell and mason had just then been sent from fort warren across to england in the rinaldo and here i may as well say what further there is for me to say about those two heroes i was in boston when they were taken and all boston was then full of them i was at washington when they were surrendered and at washington for a time their names were the only household words in vogue to me it had from the first been a matter of certainty that england would demand the restitution of the men i had never attempted to argue the matter on the legal points but i felt as though by instinct that it would be so first of all there reached us by telegram from cape race rumours of what the press in england was saying rumours of a meeting in liverpool and rumours of the feeling in london and then the papers followed and we got our private letters it was some days before we knew what was actually the demand made by lord palmerston's cabinet and during this time through the five or six days which were thus passed it was clear to be seen that the american feeling was undergoing a great change or if not the feeling at any rate the purpose men now talked of surrendering these commissioners as though it were a line of conduct which mr seward might find convenient and then men went further and said that mr seward would find any other line of conduct very inconvenient the newspapers one after another came round that under all the circumstances the state's government behaved well in the matter no one i think can deny but the newspapers taken as a whole were not very consistent and i think not very dignified they had declared with throats of brass that these men should never be surrendered to perfidious albion but when it came to be understood that in all probability they would be so surrendered they veered round without an excuse and spoke of their surrender as of a thing of course and thus in the course of about a week the whole current of men's minds was turned for myself on my first arrival at washington i felt certain that there would be war and was preparing myself for a quick return to england but from the moment that the first whisper of england's message reached us and that i began to hear how it was received and what men said about it i knew that i need not hurry myself one met a minister here and a senator there and anon some wise diplomatic functionary by none of these grave men would any secret be divulged none of them had any secret ready for divulging but it was to be read in every look of the eye in every touch of the hand and in every fall of the foot of each of them that mason and slidell would go to england then we had in all the fullness of diplomatic language lord russell's demand and mr seward's answer lord russell's demand was worded in language so mild was so devoid of threat was so free from anger that at the first reading it seemed to ask for nothing it almost disappointed by its mildness mr seward's reply on the other hand by its length of argumentation by a certain sharpness of diction to which that gentleman is addicted in his state papers and by a tone of satisfaction inherent through it all seemed to demand more than he conceded but in truth lord russell had demanded everything and the united states government had conceded everything i have said that the american government behaved well in its mode of giving the men up and i think that so much should be allowed to them on a review of the whole affair that captain wilkes had no instructions to seize the two men is a known fact he did seize them and brought them into boston harbour to the great delight of his countrymen this delight i could understand though of course i did not share it one of these men had been the parent of the fugitive slave law the other had been great in fostering the success of filibustering both of them were hot secessionists and undoubtedly rebels no two men on the continent were more grievous by their antecedents and present characters to all northern feeling it is impossible to deny that they were rebels against the government of their country that captain wilkes was not on this account justified in seizing them is now a matter of history but that the people of the loyal states should rejoice in their seizure was a matter of course wilkes was received with an ovation which as regarded him was ill-judged and undeserved but which in its spirit was natural had the president's government at that moment disowned the deed done by wilkes and declared its intention of giving up the men unasked the clamour raised would have been very great and perhaps successful we were told that the american lawyers were against their doing so 
and indeed there was such a shout of triumph that no ministry in a country so democratic could have ventured to go at once against it and to do so without any external pressure then came the one ministerial blunder the president put forth his message in which he was cunningly silent on the slidell and mason affair but to his message was appended according to custom the report from mr wells the secretary of the navy in this report approval was expressed of the deed done by captain wilkes captain wilkes was thus in all respects indemnified and the blame if any was taken from his shoulders and put on the shoulders of that officer who was responsible for the secretary's letter it is true that in that letter the secretary declared that in case of any future seizure the vessel seized must be taken into port and so declared in animadverting on the fact that captain wilkes had not brought the trent into port but nevertheless secretary wells approved of captain wilkes's conduct he allowed the reasons to be good which wilkes had put forward for leaving the ship and in all respects indemnified the captain then the responsibility shifted itself to secretary wells but i think it must be clear that the president in sending forward that report took that responsibility upon himself that he is not bound to send forward the reports of his secretaries as he receives them that he can disapprove them and require alteration was proved at the very time by the fact that he had in this way condemned secretary cameron's report and caused a portion of it to be omitted secretary cameron had unfortunately allowed his entire report to be printed and it appeared in a new york paper it contained a recommendation with reference to the slave question most offensive to a part of the cabinet and to the majority of mr lincoln's party this by order of the president was omitted in the official way it was certainly a pity that mr wells paragraph respecting the trent was not omitted also the president was dumb on the matter and that being so the secretary should have been dumb also but when the demand was made the state's government yielded at once and yielded without bluster i cannot say i much admired mr seward's long letter it was full of smart special pleading and savoured strongly as mr seward's productions always do of the personal author mr seward was making an effort to place a great state paper on record but the as celare artem was altogether wanting and if i am not mistaken he was without the art itself i think he left the matter very much where he found it the men however were to be surrendered and the good policy consisted in this that no delay was sought no diplomatic ambiguities were put into request it was the opinion of very many that some two or three months might be gained by correspondence and that at the end of that time things might stand on a different footing if during that time the north should gain any great success over the south the states might be in a position to disregard england's threats no such game was played the illegality of the arrest was at once acknowledged and the men were given up with a tranquillity that certainly appeared marvellous after all that had so lately occurred then came mr sumner's field day mr charles sumner is a senator from massachusetts known as a very hot abolitionist and as having been made the victim of an attack made upon him in the senate house by senator brooks he was also at the time of which i am writing chairman of the committee on foreign affairs which position is as near akin to that of a british minister in parliament as can be attained under the existing constitution of the states it is not similar because such chairman is by no means bound to the government but he has ministerial relations and is supposed to be specially conversant with all questions relating to foreign affairs it was understood that mr sumner did not intend to find fault either with england or with the government of his own country as to its management of this matter or that at least such fault-finding was not his special object but that he was desirous to put forth views which might lead to a final settlement of all difficulties with reference to the right of international search on such an occasion a speaker gives himself very little chance of making a favourable impression on his immediate hearers if he reads his speech from a written manuscript mr sumner did so on this occasion and i must confess that i was not edified it seemed to me that he merely repeated at greater length the arguments which i had heard fifty times during the last thirty or forty days i am told that the discourse is considered to be logical and that it reads well as regards the gist of it or that result which mr sumner thinks to be desirable 
i fully agree with him as i think will all the civilized world before many years have passed if international law be what the lawyers say it is international law must be altered to suit the requirements of modern civilization by those laws as they are construed everything is to be done for two nations at war with each other but nothing is to be done for all the nations of the world that can manage to maintain the peace the belligerents are to be treated with every delicacy as we treat our heinous criminals but the poor neutrals are to be handled with unjust rigour as we handle our unfortunate witnesses in order that the murderer may if possible be allowed to escape two men living in the same street choose to pelt each other across the way with brickbats and the other inhabitants are denied the privileges of the footpath lest they should interfere with the due prosecution of the quarrel it is i suppose the truth that we english have insisted on this right of search with more pertinacity than any other nation now in this case of slidell and mason we have felt ourselves aggrieved and have resisted luckily for us there was no doubt of the illegality of the mode of seizure in this instance but who will say that if captain wilkes had taken the trent into the harbour of new york in order that the matter might have been adjudged there england would have been satisfied our grievance was that our mail packet was stopped on the seas while doing its ordinary beneficent work and our resolve is that our mail packet shall not be so stopped with impunity as we were high-handed in old days in insisting on this right of search and as we are high-handed now in resisting a right of search it certainly behoves us to see that we be just in our modes of proceeding would captain wilkes have been right according to the existing law if he had carried the trent away to new york if so we ought not to be content with having escaped from such a trouble merely through a mistake on his part lord russell says that the trent's voyage was an innocent voyage that is the fact that should be established not only that the voyage was in truth innocent but that it should not be made out to be guilty by any international law of its real innocency all thinking men must feel themselves assured but it is not only of the seizure that we complain but of the search also an honest man is not to be handled by a policeman while on his daily work lest by chance a stolen watch should be in his pocket if international law did give such power to all belligerents international law must give it no longer in the beginning of these matters as i take it the object was when two powerful nations were at war to allow the smaller fry of nations to enjoy peace and quiet and to avoid if possible the general scuffle thence arose the position of a neutral but it was clearly not fair that any such nation having proclaimed its neutrality should after that fetch and carry for either of the combatants to the prejudice of the other hence came the right of search in order that unjust falsehood might be prevented but the seas were not then bridged with ships as they are now bridged and the laws as written were perhaps then practical and capable of execution now they are impracticable and not capable of execution it will not however do for us to ignore them if they exist and therefore they should be changed it is i think manifest that our own pretensions as to the right of search must be modified after this and now i trust i may finish my book without again naming messrs slidell and mason the working of the senate bears little or no analogy to that of our house of lords in the first place the senator's tenure there is not hereditary nor is it for life they are elected and sit for six years their election is not made by the people of their states but by the state legislature the two houses for instance of the state of massachusetts meet together and elect by their joint vote to the vacant seat for their state it is so arranged that an entirely new senate is not elected every sixth year instead of this a third of the number is elected every second year it is a common thing for senators to be re-elected and thus to remain in the house for twelve and eighteen years in our parliament the house of commons has greater political strength and wider political action than the house of lords but in congress the senate counts for more than the house of representatives in general opinion money bills must originate in the house of representatives but that is i think the only special privilege attaching to the public purse which the lower house enjoys over the upper amendments to such bills can be moved in the senate 
and all such bills must pass the senate before they become law i am inclined to think that individual members of the senate work harder than individual representatives more is expected of them and any prolonged absence from duty would be more remarked in the senate than in the other house in our parliament this is reversed the payment made to the members of the senate is three thousand dollars or six hundred pounds per annum and to a representative five hundred pounds per annum to this is added certain mileage allowance for travelling backwards and forwards between their own state and the capital a senator therefore from california or oregon has not altogether a bad place but the halcyon days of mileage allowances are i believe soon to be brought to an end it is quite within rule that the senator of to-day should be the representative of to-morrow mr crittenden who was senator from kentucky is now a member of the lower house from an electoral district in that state john quincy adams went into the house of representatives after he had been president of the united states divisions in the senate do not take place as in the house of representatives the eyes and nose are called for in the same way but if a poll be demanded the clerk of the house calls out the names of the different senators and makes out lists of the votes according to the separate answers given by the members the mode is certainly more dignified than that pursued in the other house where during the ceremony of voting the members look very much like sheep being passed into their pens i heard two or three debates in the house of representatives and that one especially in which as i have said before a chapter was read out of the book of joshua the manner in which the creator's name and the authority of his word was bandied about in the house on that occasion did not strike me favourably the question originally under debate was the relative power of the civil and military authority congress had desired to declare its ascendancy over military matters but the army and the executive generally had demurred to this not with an absolute denial of the rights of congress but with those civil and almost silent generalities with which a really existing power so well knows how to treat a nominal power the ascendant wife seldom tells her husband in so many words that his opinion in the house is to go for nothing she merely resolves that such shall be the case and acts accordingly an observer could not but perceive that in those days congress was taking upon itself the part not exactly of an obedient husband but of a husband vainly attempting to assert his supremacy i have got to learn said one gentleman after another rising indignantly on the floor that the military authority of our generals is above that of this house and then one gentleman believed the difficulty of the position by branching off into an eloquent discourse against slavery and by causing a chapter to be read out of the book of joshua on that occasion the gentleman's diversion seemed to have the effect of relieving the house altogether from the embarrassment of the original question but it was becoming manifest day by day that congress was losing its ground and that the army was becoming indifferent to its thunders that the army was doing so and also that ministers were doing so in the states the president and his ministers are not in fact subject to any parliamentary responsibility the president may be impeached but the member of an opposition does not always wish to have recourse to such an extreme measure as impeachment the ministers are not in the houses and cannot therefore personally answer questions different large subjects such as foreign affairs financial affairs and army matters are referred to standing committees in both houses and these committees have relations with the ministers but they have no constitutional power over the ministers nor have they the much more valuable privilege of badgering a minister hither and thither by viva voce questions on every point of his administration the minister sits safe in his office safe there for the term of the existing presidency if he can keep well with the president and therefore even under ordinary circumstances does not care much for the printed or written messages of congress but under circumstances so little ordinary as those of eighteen sixty one to sixty two while washington was surrounded by hundreds of thousands of soldiers congress was absolutely impotent mr seward could snap his fingers at congress and he did so he could not snap his fingers at the army but then he could go with the army could keep the army on his side by remaining on the same side with the army and this as it seemed he resolved to do it must be understood that mr seward was not prime minister the president of the united states has no prime minister or hitherto has had none 
the minister for foreign affairs has usually stood highest in the cabinet and mr seward as holding that position was not inclined to lessen its authority he was gradually assuming for that position the prerogatives of a premier and men were beginning to talk of mr seward's ministry it may easily be understood that at such a time the powers of congress would be undefined and that ambitious members of congress would rise and assert on the floor with that peculiar voice of indignation so common in parliamentary debate that they had got to learn etc 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 it seemed to me that the lesson which they had yet to learn was then in the process of being taught to them they were anxious to be told all about the mischance at ball's bluff but nobody would tell them anything about it they wanted to know something of that blockade on the potomac but such knowledge was not good for them pack them up in boxes and send them home one military gentleman said to me and i began to think that something of the kind would be done if they made themselves troublesome i quote here the manner in which their questions respecting the affair at ball's bluff were answered by the secretary of war quote, the speaker laid before the house a letter from the secretary at war in which he says that he has the honour to acknowledge the receipt of the resolution adopted on the sixth instant to the effect that the answer of the department to the resolution passed on the second day of the session is not responsive and satisfactory to the house and requesting a further answer the secretary has now to state that measures have been taken to ascertain who is responsible for the disastrous movement at ball's bluff but that it is not compatible with the public interest to make known those measures at the present time End quote. in truth the days are evil for any congress of debaters when a great army is in camp on every side of them the people had called for the army and there it was it was of younger birth than congress and had thrown its elder brother considerably out of favour as has been done before by many a new-born baby if congress could amuse itself with a few set speeches and a field day or two such as those afforded by mr sumner it might all be very well provided that such speeches did not attack the army over and beyond this let them vote the supplies and have done with it was it probable that general mcclellan should have time to answer questions about ball's bluff and he with such a job of work on his hands congress could of course vote what committees of military inquiry it might please and might ask questions without end but we all know to what such questions lead when the questioner has no power to force an answer by a penalty if it might be possible to maintain the semblance of respect for congress without too much embarrassment to military secretaries such semblance should be maintained but if congress chose to make itself really disagreeable then no semblance could be kept up any longer that as far as i could judge was the position of congress in the early months of eighteen sixty two and that under existing circumstances was perhaps the only possible position that it could fill all this to me was very melancholy the streets of washington were always full of soldiers mounted sentries stood at the corners of all the streets with drawn sabres shivering in the cold and besmeared with mud a military law came out that civilians might not ride quickly through the street military riders galloped over one at every turn splashing about through the mud and reminding one not unfrequently of john gilpin why they always went so fast destroying their horses feet on the rough stones i could never learn but i as a civilian given as englishmen are to trotting and furnished for the time with a nimble trotter found myself harried from time to time by muddy men with sabres who would dash after me rattling their trappings and bid me to go at a slower pace there is a building in washington built by private munificence and devoted according to an inscription which it bears to the arts it has been turned into an army clothing establishment the streets of washington night and day were thronged with army wagons all through the city military huts and military tents were to be seen pitched out among the mud and in the desert places then there was the chosen locality of the teamsters and their mules and horses a wonderful world in itself and all within the city here horses and mules lived or died sub dio with no slightest apology for a stable over them eating their provender from off the wagons to which they were fastened here there and everywhere large houses were occupied as the headquarters of some officer or the bureau of some military official at washington and round washington the army was everything while this was so 
is it to be conceived that congress should ask questions about military matters with success all this as i say filled me with sorrow i hate military belongings and am disgusted at seeing the great affairs of a nation put out of their regular course congress to me is respectable parliamentary debates be they ever so prosy as with us are even so rowdy as sometimes they have been with our cousins across the water engage my sympathies i bow inwardly before a speaker's chair and look upon the elected representatives of any nation as the choice men of the age those muddy clattering dragoons sitting at the corners of the streets with dirty woollen comforters round their ears were to me hideous in the extreme but there at washington at the period of which i am writing i was forced to acknowledge that congress was at a discount and that the rough-shod generals were the men of the day pack them up and send them in boxes to their several states it would come to that i thought or to something like that unless congress would consent to be submissive i have yet to learn said indignant members stamping with their feet on the floor of the house one would have said that by that time the lesson might almost have been understood up to the period of this civil war congress has certainly worked well for the united states it might be easy to pick holes in it to show that some members have been corrupt others quarrelsome and others again impracticable but when we look at the circumstances under which it has been from year to year elected when we remember the position of the newly populated states from which the members have been sent and the absence throughout the country of that old traditionary class of parliament men on whom we depend in england when we think how recent has been the elevation in life of the majority of those who are and must be elected it is impossible to deny them praise for intellect patriotism good sense and diligence they began but sixty years ago and for sixty years congress has fully answered the purpose for which it was established with no antecedents of grandeur the nation with its congress has made itself one of the five great nations of the world and what living english politician will say even now with all its troubles thick upon it that it is the smallest of the five when i think of this and remember the position in europe which an american has been able to claim for himself i cannot but acknowledge that congress on the whole has been conducted with prudence wisdom and patriotism the question now to be asked is this have the powers of congress been sufficient or are they sufficient for the continued maintenance of free government in the states under the constitution i think that the powers given by the existing constitution to congress can no longer be held to be sufficient and that if the union be maintained at all it must be done by a closer assimilation of its congressional system to that of our parliament but to that matter i must allude again when speaking of the existing constitution of the states End of chapter two chapter three of north america volume two by antony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain three the causes of the war part one i have seen various essays purporting to describe the causes of this civil war between the north and south but they have generally been written with the view of vindicating either one side or the other and have spoken rather of causes which should according to the ideas of their writers have produced peace than of those which did in the course of events actually produce war this has been essentially the case with mr everett who in his lecture at new york on the fourth of july eighteen sixty recapitulated all the good things which the north has done for the south and who proved if he has proved anything that the south should have cherished the north instead of hating it and this was very much the case also with mr motley in his letter to the london times that letter is good in its way as is everything that comes from mr motley but it does not tell us why the war has existed why is it that eight millions of people have desired to separate themselves from a rich and mighty empire from an empire which was apparently on its road to unprecedented success and which had already achieved wealth consideration power and internal well-being one would be led to imagine from the essays of mr everett and of mr motley that slavery has had little or nothing to do with it i must acknowledge it to be my opinion that slavery in its various bearings has been the single and necessary cause of the war that slavery being there in the south this war was only to be avoided by a voluntary division 
secession voluntary both on the part of north and south that in the event of such voluntary secession being not asked for or if asked for not conceded revolution and civil war became necessary were not to be avoided by any wisdom or care on the part of the north the arguments used by both the gentlemen i have named prove very clearly that south carolina and her sister states had no right to secede under the constitution that is to say that it was not open to them peaceably to take their departure and to refuse further allegiance to the president and congress without a breach of the laws by which they were bound for a certain term of years namely from seventeen eighty one to seventeen eighty seven the different states endeavoured to make their way in the world simply leagued together by certain articles of confederation it was declared that each state retained its sovereignty freedom and independence and that the said states then entered severally into a firm league of friendship with each other for their common defence there was no president no congress taking the place of our parliament but simply a congress of delegates or ambassadors two or three from each state who were to act in accordance with the policy of their own individual states it is well that this should be thoroughly understood not as bearing on the question of the present war but as showing that a loose confederation not subversive of the separate independence of the states and capable of being partially dissolved at the will of each separate state was tried and was found to fail south carolina took upon herself to act as she might have acted had that confederation remained in force but that confederation was an acknowledged failure national greatness could not be achieved under it and individual enterprise could not succeed under it then in lieu of that by the united consent of the thirteen states the present constitution was drawn up and sanctioned and to that every state bound itself in allegiance in that constitution no power of secession is either named or presumed to exist the individual sovereignty of the states had in the first instance been thought desirable the young republicans hankered after the separate power and separate name which each might then have achieved but that dream had been found vain and therefore the states at the cost of some fond wishes agreed to seek together for national power rather than run the risks entailed upon separate existence i append to this volume the articles of confederation and the constitution of the united states as they who desire to look into this matter may be anxious to examine them without reference to other volumes the latter alone is clear enough on the subject but is strengthened by the former in proving that under the latter no state could possess the legal power of seceding but they who created the constitution who framed the clauses and gave to this terribly important work what wisdom they possessed did not presume to think that it could be final the mode of altering the constitution is arranged in the constitution such alterations must be proposed either by two-thirds of both the houses of the general congress or by the legislatures of two-thirds of the states and must when so proposed be ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the states article five there can i think be no doubt that any alteration so carried would be valid even though that alteration should go to the extent of excluding one or any number of states from the union any division so made would be made in accordance with the constitution south carolina and the southern states no doubt felt that they would not succeed in obtaining secession in this way and therefore they sought to obtain the separation which they wanted by revolution by revolution and rebellion as naples has lately succeeded in her attempt to change her political status as hungary is looking to do as poland has been seeking to do any time since her subjection as the revolted colonies of great britain succeeded in doing in seventeen seventy six whereby they created this great nation which is now undergoing all the sorrows of a civil war the name of secession claimed by the south for this movement is a misnomer if any part of a nationality or empire ever rebelled against the government established on behalf of the whole south carolina so rebelled when on the twentieth november eighteen sixty she put forth her ordinance of so-called secession and the other southern states joined in that rebellion when they followed her lead as to that fact there cannot i think much longer be any doubt in any mind i insist on this especially 
repeating perhaps unnecessarily opinions expressed in my first volume because i still see it stated by english writers that the secession ordinance of south carolina should have been accepted as a political act by the government of the united states it seems to me that no government can in this way accept an act of rebellion without declaring its own functions to be beyond its own power but what if such rebellion be justifiable or even reasonable what if the rebels have cause for their rebellion for no one will now deny that rebellion may be both reasonable and justifiable or that every subject in the land may be bound in duty to rebel in such case the government will be held to have brought about its own punishment by its own fault but as government is a wide affair spreading itself gradually and growing in virtue or in vice from small beginnings from seeds slow to produce their fruits it is much easier to discern the incidence of the punishment than the perpetration of the fault government goes astray by degrees or sins by the absence of that wisdom which should teach rulers how to make progress as progress is made by those whom they rule the fault may be absolutely negative and have spread itself over centuries may be and generally has been attributable to dull good men but not the less does the punishment come at a blow the rebellion exists and cannot be put down will put down all that opposes it but the government is not the less bound to make its fight that is the punishment that comes on governing men or on a governing people that govern not well or not wisely as mr motley says in the paper to which i have alluded quote, no man on either side of the atlantic with anglo-saxon blood in his veins will dispute the right of a people or of any portion of a people to rise against oppression to demand redress of grievances and in case of denial of justice to take up arms to vindicate the sacred principle of liberty few englishmen or americans will deny that the source of government is the consent of the governed or that every nation has the right to govern itself according to its will when the silent consent is changed to fierce remonstrance revolution is impending the right of revolution is indisputable it is written on the whole record of our race british and american history is made up of rebellion and revolution hampton pym and oliver cromwell washington adams and jefferson all were rebels End quote then comes the question whether south carolina and the gulf states had so suffered as to make rebellion on their behalf justifiable or reasonable or if not what cause had been strong enough to produce in them so strong a desire for secession a desire which has existed for fully half the term through which the united states has existed as a nation and so firm a resolve to rush into rebellion with the object of accomplishing that which they deemed not to be accomplished on other terms it must i think be conceded that the gulf states have not suffered at all by their connection with the northern states that in lieu of any such suffering they owe all their national greatness to the northern states that they have been lifted up by the commercial energy of the atlantic states and by the agricultural prosperity of the western states to a degree of national consideration and respect through the world at large which never could have belonged to them standing alone i will not trouble my readers with statistics which few would care to follow but let any man of ordinary everyday knowledge turn over in his own mind his present existing ideas of the wealth and commerce of new york boston philadelphia chicago pittsburgh and cincinnati and compare them with his ideas as to new orleans charleston savannah mobile richmond and memphis i do not name such towns as baltimore and st louis which stand in slave states but which have raised themselves to prosperity by northern habits if this be not sufficient let him refer to population tables and tables of shipping and tonnage and of those southern towns which i have named the commercial wealth is of northern creation the success of new orleans as a city can be no more attributed to louisianians than can that of the havana to the men of cuba or of calcutta to the natives of india it has been a repetition of the old story told over and over again through every century since commerce has flourished in the world the tropics can produce but the men from the north shall sow and reap and garner and enjoy as the creator's work has progressed this privilege has extended itself to regions further removed and still further from southern influences if we look to europe we see that this has been so in greece italy spain france and the netherlands 
in england and scotland in prussia and in russia and the western world shows us the same story where is now the glory of the antilles where the riches of mexico and the power of peru they still produce sugar guano gold cotton coffee almost whatever we may ask them and will continue to do so while held to labor under sufficient restraint but where are their men where are their books where are their learning their art their enterprise i say it with sad regret at the decadence of so vast a population but i do say that the southern states of america have not been able to keep pace with their northern brethren that they have fallen behind in the race and feeling that the struggle is too much for them have therefore resolved to part the reasons put forward by the south for secession have been trifling almost beyond conception northern tariffs have been the first and perhaps foremost then there has been a plea that the national exchequer has paid certain bounties to new england fishermen of which the south has paid its share getting no part of such bounty in return there is also a complaint as to the navigation laws meaning i believe that the laws of the states increase the cost of coast traffic by forbidding foreign vessels to engage in the trade thereby increasing also the price of goods and confining the benefit to the north which carries on the coasting trade of the country and doing only injury to the south which has none of it then last but not least comes that grievance as to the fugitive slave law the law of the land as a whole the law of the nation requires the rendition from free states of all fugitive slaves but the free states will not obey this law they even pass state laws in opposition to it catch your own slaves they say and we will not hinder you at any rate we will not hinder you officially of non-official hindrance you must take your chance but we absolutely decline to employ our officers to catch your slaves that list comprises as i take it the amount of southern official grievances southern people will tell you privately of others they will say that they cannot sleep happy in their beds fearing lest insurrection should be roused among their slaves they will tell you of domestic comfort invaded by northern falsehood they will explain to you how false has been mrs beecher stowe ladies will fill your ears and your hearts too with tales of the daily efforts they make for the comfort of their people and of the ruin to those efforts which arises from the malice of the abolitionists to all this you make some answer with your tongue that is hardly true for in such a matter courtesy forbids the plain truth but your heart within answers truly madam dear madam your sorrow is great but that sorrow is the necessary result of your position as to those official reasons in what fewest words i can use i will endeavour to show that they come to nothing the tariff and a monstrous tariff it then was was the ground put forward by south carolina for secession when general jackson was president and mr calhoun was the hero of the south calhoun bound himself and his state to take certain steps towards secession at a certain day if that tariff were not abolished the tariff was so absurd that jackson and his government were forced to abandon it would have abandoned it without any threat from calhoun but under that threat it was necessary that calhoun should be defied general jackson proposed a compromise tariff which was odious to calhoun not on its own behalf for it yielded nearly all that was asked but as being subversive of his desire for secession the president however not only insisted on his compromise but declared his purpose of preventing its passage into law unless calhoun himself as senator would vote for it and he also declared his purpose not we may presume officially of hanging calhoun if he took that step towards secession which he had bound himself to take in the event of the tariff not being repealed as a result of all this calhoun voted for the compromise and secession for the time was beaten down that was in eighteen thirty two and may be regarded as the commencement of the secession movement the tariff was then a convenient reason a ground to be assigned with a colour of justice because it was a tariff admitted to be bad but the tariff had been modified again and again since that and the tariff existing when south carolina seceded in eighteen sixty had been carried by votes from south carolina the absurd moral tariff could not have caused secession for it was passed without a struggle in the collapse of congress occasioned by secession 
the bounty to fishermen was given to create sailors so that a marine might be provided for the nation i need hardly show that the national benefit would accrue to the whole nation for whose protection such sailors were needed such a system of bounties may be bad but if so it was bad for the whole nation it did not affect south carolina otherwise than it affected illinois pennsylvania or even new york the navigation laws may also have been bad according to my thinking such protective laws are bad but they created no special hardship on the south by any such a theory of complaint all sections of all nations have ground of complaint against any other section which receives special protection under any law the drinkers of beer in england should secede because they pay a tax whereas the consumers of paper pay none the navigation laws of the states are no doubt injurious to the mercantile interests of the states i at least have no doubt on the subject but no one will think that secession is justified by the existence of a law of questionable expediency bad laws will go by the board if properly handled by those whom they pinch as the navigation laws went by the board with us in england as to that fugitive slave law it should be explained that the grievance has not arisen from the loss of slaves i have heard it stated that south carolina up to the time of the secession had never lost a slave in this way that is by northern opposition to the fugitive slave law and that the total number of slaves escaping successfully into the northern states and their remaining through the non-operation of this law did not amount to five in the year it had not been a question of property but of feeling it has been a political point and the south has conceived and probably conceived truly that this resolution on the part of northern states to defy the law with reference to slaves even though in itself it might not be immediately injurious to southern property was an insertion of the narrow end of the wedge it was an action taken against slavery an action taken by men of the north against their fellow countrymen in the south under such circumstances the sooner such countrymen should cease to be their fellows the better it would be for them that i take it was the argument of the south or at any rate that was its feeling i have said that the reasons given for secession have been trifling and among them i have so estimated this matter of the fugitive slave law i mean to assert that the ground actually put forward is trifling the loss namely of slaves to which the south has been subjected but the true reason pointed at in this the conviction namely that the north would not leave slavery alone and would not allow it to remain as a settled institution was by no means trifling it has been this conviction on the part of the south that the north would not live in amity with slavery would continue to fight it under this banner or under that would still condemn it as disgraceful to man and rebuke it as impious before god which has produced rebellion and civil war and will ultimately produce that division for which the south is fighting and against which the north is fighting and which when accomplished will give the north new wings and will leave the south without political greatness or commercial success under such circumstances i cannot think that rebellion on the part of the south was justified by wrongs endured or made reasonable by the prospect of wrongs to be inflicted it is disagreeable that having to live with a wife who is always rebuking one for some special fault but the outside world would not grant a divorce on that account especially if the outside world is well aware that the fault so rebuked is of daily occurrence if you do not choose to be called a drunkard by your wife the outside world will say it will be well that you should cease to drink ah but that habit of drinking when once acquired cannot easily be laid aside the brain will not work the organs of the body will not perform their functions the blood will not run the drunkard must drink till he dies all that may be a good ground for divorce the outside world will say but the plea should be put in by the sober wife not by the intemperate husband but what if the husband takes himself off without any divorce and takes with him also his wife's property her earnings that on which he has lived and his children it may be a good bargain still for her the outside world will say but she if she be a woman of spirit will not willingly put up with such wrongs the south has been the husband drunk with slavery and the north has been the ill-used wife rebellion as i have said is often justifiable 
but it is i think never justifiable on the part of a paid servant of that government against which it is raised we must at any rate feel that this is true of men in high places as regards those men to whom by reason of their offices it should specially belong to put down rebellion had washington been the governor of virginia had cromwell been a minister of charles had garibaldi held a marshal's baton under the emperor of austria or the king of naples those men would have been traitors as well as rebels treason and rebellion may be made one under the law but the mind will always draw the distinction i if i rebel against the crown am not on that account necessarily a traitor a betrayal of trust is i take it necessary to treason i am not aware that jefferson davis is a traitor but that buchanan was a traitor admits i think of no doubt under him and with his connivance the rebellion was allowed to make its way under him and by his officers arms and ships and men and money were sent away from those points at which it was known that they would be needed if it were intended to put down the coming rebellion and to those points at which it was known that they would be needed if it were intended to foster the coming rebellion but mr buchanan had no eager feeling in favour of secession he was not of that stuff of which are made davis and tombs and slidell but treason was easier to him than loyalty remonstrance was made to him pointing out the misfortunes which his action or want of action would bring upon the country not in my time he answered it will not be in my time so that he might escape unscathed out of the fire this chief ruler of a nation of thirty millions of men was content to allow treason and rebellion to work their way i venture to say so much here as showing how impossible it was that mr lincoln's government on its coming into office should have given to the south not what the south had asked for the south had not asked but what the south had taken what the south had tried to filch had the south waited for secession till mr lincoln had been in his chair i could understand that england should sympathize with her for myself i cannot agree to that scuttling of the ship by the captain on the day which was to see the transfer of his command to another officer the southern states were driven into rebellion by no wrongs inflicted on them but their desire for secession is not on that account matter for astonishment it would have been surprising had they not desired secession secession of one kind a very practical secession had already been forced upon them by circumstances they had become a separate people dissevered from the north by habits morals institutions pursuits and every conceivable difference in their modes of thought and action they still spoke the same language as do austria and prussia but beyond that tie of language they had no bond but that of a meagre political union in their congress at washington slavery as it had been expelled from the north and as it had come to be welcomed in the south had raised such a wall of difference that true political union was out of the question it would be juster perhaps to say that those physical characteristics of the south which had induced this welcoming of slavery and those other characteristics of the north which had induced its expulsion were the true causes of the difference for years and years this has been felt by both and the fight has been going on it has been continued for thirty years and almost always to the detriment of the south in eighteen forty five florida and texas were admitted into the union as slave states i think that no state had then been admitted as a free state since michigan in eighteen thirty six in eighteen forty six iowa was admitted as a free state and from that day to this wisconsin california minnesota oregon and kansas have been brought into the union all as free states the annexation of another slave state to the existing union had become i imagine impossible unless such object were gained by the admission of texas we all remember that fight about kansas and what sort of a fight it was kansas lies alongside missouri a slave state and is contiguous to no other state if the free soil party could in the days of pierce and buchanan carry the day in kansas it is not likely that they would be beaten on any new ground under such a president as lincoln we have all heard in europe how southern men have ruled in the white house nearly from the days of washington downwards or if not southern men northern men such as pierce and buchanan with southern politics 
and therefore we have been taught to think that the South has been politically the winning party. They have, in truth, been the losing party as regards national power. But what they have so lost, they have hitherto recovered by political address and individual statecraft. The leading men of the South have seen their position, and have gone to their work with the exercise of all their energies. They organized the Democrat Party so as to include the leaders among the Northern politicians. They never begrudged to these assistants a full share of the good things of official life. They have been aided by the fanatical abolitionism of the North, by which the Republican Party has been divided into two sections. It has been fashionable to be a Democrat, that is, to hold Southern politics, and unfashionable to be a Republican, or to hold anti-Southern politics. In that way the South has lived and struggled on against the growing will of the population. But at last that will became too strong, and when Mr. Lincoln was elected, the South knew that its day was over. End of chapter 3, part 1「The Causes of the War » Part 2 It is not surprising that the South should have desired secession. It is not surprising that it should have prepared for it. Since the days of Mr. Calhoun, its leaders have always understood its position with a fair amount of political accuracy. Its only chance of political life lay in prolonged ascendancy at Washington. The swelling crowds of Germans by whom the western states were being filled enlisted themselves to a man in the ranks of abolition. What was the acquisition of Texas against such hosts as these? An evil day was coming on the southern politicians, and it behoved them to be prepared. As a separate nation, a nation trusting to cotton, having in their hands, as they imagined, a monopoly of the staple of English manufacture with a tariff of their own, and those rabid curses on the source of all their wealth no longer ringing in their ears, what might they not do as a separate nation? But as a part of the Union, they were too weak to hold their own if once their political finesse should fail them. That day came upon them not unexpected, in 1860, and therefore they cut the cable. And all this has come from slavery. It is hard enough, for how could the South have escaped slavery? How, at least, could the South have escaped slavery any time during these last thirty years? And is it, moreover, so certain that slavery is an unmitigated evil, opposed to God's will, and producing all the sorrows which have ever been produced by tyranny and wrong? It is here, after all, that one comes to the difficult question. Here is the knot which the fingers of men cannot open, and which admits of no sudden cutting with the knife. I have likened the slave-holding states to the drunken husband, and in so doing have pronounced judgment against them. As regards the state of the drunken man, his unfitness for partnership with any decent, diligent, well-to-do wife, his ruined condition and shattered prospects, the simile, I think, holds good. But I refrain from saying that as the fault was originally with the drunkard in that he became such, so also has been the fault with the slave states. At any rate, I refrain from so saying here on this page. That the position of a slave owner is terribly prejudicial, not to the slave of whom I do not hear speak, but to the owner. Of so much, at any rate, I feel assured. That the position is therefore criminal and damnable, I am not now disposed to take upon myself to assert. The question of slavery in America cannot be handled fully and fairly by anyone who is afraid to go back upon the subject, and take its whole history since one man first claimed and exercised the right of forcing labor from another man. I certainly am afraid of any such task, but I believe that there has been no period yet since the world's work began, when such a practice has not prevailed in a large portion, probably in the largest portion, of the world's work fields. As civilization has made its progress, it has been the duty and delight, as it has also been the interest of the men at the top of affairs, not to lighten the work of the men below, but so to teach them that they should recognize the necessity of working without coercion. Emancipation of serfs and thralls, of bondsmen and slaves, has always meant this, that men having been so taught should then work without coercion. 
as men become educated and aware of the nature of the tenure on which they hold their life they learn the fact that work is a necessity for them and that it is better to work without coercion than with it when men have learned this they are fit for emancipation but they are hardly fit till they have learned so much in talking or writing of slaves we always now think of the negro slave of us englishmen it must at any rate be acknowledged that we have done what in us lay to induce him to recognize this necessity for labor at any rate we acted on the presumption that he would do so and gave him his liberty throughout all our lands at a cost which has never yet been reckoned up in pounds shillings and pence the cost never can be reckoned up nor can the gain which we achieved in purging ourselves from the degradation and demoralization of such employment we come into court with clean hands having done all that lay with us to do to put down slavery both at home and abroad but when we enfranchised the negroes we did so with the intention at least that they should work as free men their share of the bargain in that respect they have declined to keep wherever starvation has not been the result of such resolve on their part and from the date of our emancipation seeing the position which the negroes now hold with us the southern states of america have learned to regard slavery as a permanent institution and have taught themselves to regard it as a blessing and not as a curse negroes were first taken over to america because the white man could not work under the tropical heats and because the native indian would not work the latter people has been or soon will be exterminated polished off the face of creation as the americans say which fate must i should say in the long run attend all non-working people as the soil of the world is required for increasing population the non-working people must go and so the indians have gone the negroes under compulsion did work and work well and under their hands vast regions of the western tropics became fertile gardens the fact that they were carried up into northern regions which from their nature did not require such aid that slavery prevailed in new york and massachusetts does not militate against my argument the exact limits of any great movement will not be bounded by its purpose the heated wax which you draw upon your letter spreads itself beyond the necessities of your seal that these negroes would not have come to the western world without compulsion or having come would not have worked without compulsion is i imagine acknowledged by all that they have multiplied in the western world and have there become a race happier at any rate in all the circumstances of their life than their still untamed kinsmen in africa must also be acknowledged who then can dare to wish that all that has been done by the negro immigration should have remained undone the name of slave is odious to me if i know myself i would not own a negro though he could sweat gold on my behoof i glory in that bold leap in the dark which england took with regard to her own west indian slaves but i do not see the less clearly the difficulty of that position in which the southern states have been placed and i will not call them wicked impious and abominable because they now hold by slavery as other nations have held by it at some period of their career it is their misfortune that they must do so now now when so large a portion of the world has thrown off the system spurning as base and profitless all labor that is not free it is their misfortune for henceforth they must stand alone with small rank among the nations whereas their brethren of the north will still flame in the forehead of the morning sky when the present constitution of the united states was written the merit of which must probably be given mainly to madison and hamilton madison finding the french democratic element and hamilton the english conservative element this question of slavery was doubtless a great trouble the word itself is not mentioned in the constitution it speaks not of a slave but of a person held to service or labor it neither sanctions nor forbids slavery it assumes no power in the matter of slavery and under it at the present moment all congress voting together with the full consent of the legislatures of thirty-three states could not constitutionally put down slavery in the remaining thirty-fourth state in fact the constitution ignored the subject but nevertheless washington and jefferson from whom madison received his inspiration were opposed to slavery i do not know that washington ever took much action in the matter but his expressed opinion is on record but jefferson did so throughout his life before the declaration of independence he endeavored to make slavery illegal in virginia 
in this he failed but long afterwards when the united states was a nation he succeeded in carrying a law by which the further importations of slaves into any of the states was prohibited after a certain year eighteen twenty when this law was passed the framers of it considered that the gradual abolition of slavery would be secured up to that period the negro population in the states had not been self-maintained as now in cuba the numbers had been kept up by new importations and it was calculated that the race when not recruited from africa would die out that this calculation was wrong we now know and the breeding grounds of virginia have been the result at that time there were no cotton fields alabama and mississippi were outlying territories louisiana had been recently purchased but was not yet incorporated as a state florida still belonged to spain and was all but unpopulated of texas no man had yet heard of the slave states virginia the two carolinas and georgia were alone wedded to slavery then the matter might have been managed but under the constitution as it had been framed and with the existing powers of the separate states there was not even then open any way by which slavery could be abolished other than by the separate action of the states nor has there been any such way open since with slavery these southern states have grown and become fertile the planters have thriven and the cotton fields have spread themselves and then came emancipation in the british islands under such circumstances and with such a lesson could it be expected that the southern states should learn to love abolition it is vain to say that slavery has not caused secession and that slavery has not caused the war that and that only has been the real cause of this conflict though other small collateral issues may now be put forward to bear the blame those other issues have arisen from this question of slavery and are incidental to it and a part of it massachusetts as we all know is democratic in its tendencies but south carolina is essentially aristocratic this difference has come of slavery a slave country which has progressed far in slavery must be aristocratic in its nature aristocratic and patriarchal a large slave owner from georgia may call himself a democrat may think that he reveres republican institutions and may talk with american horror of the thrones of europe but he must in his heart be an aristocrat we in england are apt to speak of republican institutions and of universal suffrage which is perhaps the chief of them as belonging equally to all the states in south carolina there is not and has not been any such thing the electors for the president there are chosen not by the people but by the legislature and the votes for the legislature are limited by a high property qualification a high property qualification is required for a member of the house of representatives in south carolina four hundred freehold acres of land and ten negroes is one qualification five hundred pounds clear of debt is another qualification for where a sum of money is thus named it is given in english money russia and england are not more unlike in their political and social feelings than are the real slave states and the real free soil states the gentlemen from one and from the other side of the line have met together on neutral ground and have discussed political matters without flying frequently at each other's throats while the great question on which they differed was allowed to slumber but the awakening has been coming by degrees and now the south had felt that it was come old john brown who did his best to create a servile insurrection at harper's ferry has been canonized through the north and west to the amazement and horror of the south the decision in the dred scott case given by the chief justice of the supreme court of the united states has been received with shouts of execration through the north and west the southern gentry have been uncle tommed into madness it is no light thing to be told daily by your fellow citizens by your fellow representatives by your fellow senators that you are guilty of the one damning sin that cannot be forgiven all this they could partly moderate partly rebuke and partly bear as long as political power remained in their hands but they have gradually felt that that was going and were prepared to cut the rope and run as soon as it was gone such according to my ideas have been the causes of the war but i cannot defend the south as long as they could be successful in their schemes for holding the political power of the nation they were prepared to hold by the nation 
immediately those schemes failed they were prepared to throw the nation overboard in this there has undoubtedly been treachery as well as rebellion had these politicians been honest though the political growth of washington has hardly admitted of political honesty but had these politicians been even ordinarily respectable in their dishonesty they would have claimed secession openly before congress while yet their own president was at the white house congress would not have acceded congress itself could not have acceded under the constitution but a way would have been found had the southern states been persistent in their demand a way indeed has been found but it has lain through fire and water through blood and ruin through treason and theft and the downfall of national greatness secession will i think be accomplished and the southern confederation of states will stand something higher in the world than mexico and the republics of central america her cotton monopoly will have vanished and her wealth will have been wasted i think that history will agree with me in saying that the northern states had no alternative but war what concession could they make could they promise to hold their peace about slavery and had they so promised would the south have believed them they might have conceded secession that is they might have given all that would have been demanded but what individual chooses to yield to such demands and if not an individual then what people will do so but in truth they could not have yielded all that was demanded had secession been granted to south carolina and georgia virginia would have been coerced to join those states by the nature of her property and with virginia maryland would have gone and washington the capital what may be the future line of division between the north and the south i will not pretend to say but that line will probably be dictated by the north it may still be hoped that missouri kentucky virginia and maryland will go with the north and be rescued from slavery but had secession been yielded had the prestige of success fallen to the lot of the south those states must have become southern while on this subject of slavery for in discussing the cause of the war slavery is the subject that must be discussed i cannot forbear to say a few words about the negroes of the north american states the republican party of the north is divided into two sections of which one may be called abolitionist and the other non-abolitionist mr lincoln's government presumes itself to belong to the latter though its tendencies towards abolition are very strong the abolition party is growing in strength daily it is but a short time since wendell phillips could not lecture in boston without a guard of police now at this moment of my writing he is a popular hero the very men who five years since were accustomed to make speeches strong as words could frame them against abolition are now turning round and if not preaching abolition or patting the backs of those who do so i heard one of mr lincoln's cabinet declare old john brown to be a hero and a martyr all the protestant germans are abolitionists and they have become so strong a political element in the country that many now declare that no future president can be elected without their aid the object is declared boldly no long political scheme is asked for but instant abolition is wanted abolition to be declared while yet the war is raging let the slaves of all rebels be declared free and all slave owners in the seceding states are rebels one cannot but ask what abolition means and to what it would lead any ordinance of abolition now pronounced would not affect the emancipation of the slaves but might probably affect a servile insurrection i will not accuse those who are preaching this crusade of any desire for so fearful a scourge on the land they probably calculate that an edict of abolition once given would be so much done towards the ultimate winning of the battle they are making their hay while their sun shines but if they could emancipate those four million slaves in what way would they then treat them how would they feed them in what way would they treat the ruined owners of the slaves and the acres of land which would lie uncultivated of all subjects with which a man can be called on to deal it is the most difficult but a new england abolitionist talks of it as though no more were required than an open path for his humanitarian energies i could arrange it all to-morrow morning a gentleman said to me who is well known for his zeal in this cause arrange it all to-morrow morning 
abolition of slavery having become a fact during the night i should not envy that gentleman his morning's work it was bad enough with us but what were our numbers compared with those of the southern states we paid a price for the slaves but no price is to be paid in this case the value of the property would probably be lowly estimated at one hundred pounds apiece for men women and children or four hundred million pounds for the whole population they form the wealth of the south and if they were bought what should be done with them they are like children every slave owner in the country every man who has aught to do with slaves will tell the same story in maryland and delaware are men who hate slavery who would be only too happy to enfranchise their slaves but the negroes who have been slaves are not fit for freedom in many cases practically they cannot be enfranchised give them their liberty starting them well in the world at what expense you please and at the end of six months they will come back upon your hands for the means of support everything must be done for them they expect food and clothes and instruction as to every simple act of life as do children the negro domestic servant is handy at his own work no servant more so but he cannot go beyond that he does not comprehend the object and purport of continued industry if he have money he will play with it will amuse himself with it if he have none he will amuse himself without it his work is like a schoolboy's task he knows it must be done but never comprehends that the doing of it is the very end and essence of his life he is a child in all things and the extent of prudential wisdom to which he ever attains is to disdain emancipation and cling to the security of his bondage it is true enough that slavery has been a curse whatever may have been its effect on the negroes it has been a deadly curse upon the white masters the preaching of abolition during the war is to me either the deadliest of sins or the vainest of follies its only immediate result possible would be servile insurrection that is so manifestly atrocious a wish for it would be so hellish that i do not presume the preachers of abolition to entertain it but if that be not meant it must be intended that an act of emancipation should be carried throughout the slave states either in their separation from the north or after their subjection and consequent reunion with the north as regards the states while in secession the north cannot operate upon their slaves any more than england can operate on the slaves of cuba but if a reunion is to be a precursor of emancipation surely that reunion should be first effected a decision in the northern and western mind on such a subject cannot assist in obtaining that reunion but must militate against the practicability of such an object this is so well understood that mr lincoln and his government do not dare to call themselves abolitionists note president lincoln has proposed a plan for the emancipation of slaves in the border states and for compensation to the owners his doing so proves that he regards present emancipation in the gulf states as quite out of the question it also proves that he looks forward to the recovery of the border states for the north but that he does not look forward to the recovery of the gulf states and note abolition in truth is a political cry it is the banner of defiance opposed to secession as the differences between the north and south have grown with years and have swelled to the proportions of national antipathy southern nullification has amplified itself into secession and northern free soil principles have burst into this growth of abolition men have not calculated the results charming pictures are drawn for you of the negro in a state of utopian bliss owning his own hoe and eating his own hog in a paradise where everything is bought and sold except his wife his little ones and himself but the enfranchised negro has always thrown away his hoe has eaten any man's hog but his own and has too often sold his daughter for a dollar when any such market has been opened to him i confess that this cry of abolition has been made peculiarly displeasing to me by the fact that the northern abolitionist is by no means willing to give even to the negro who is already free that position in the world which alone might tend to raise him in the scale of human beings if anything can so raise him and make him fit for freedom the abolitionists hold that the negro is the white man's equal i do not i see or think that i see 
that the negro is the white man's inferior through laws of nature that he is not mentally fit to cope with white men i speak of the full-blooded negro and that he must fill a position simply servile but the abolitionist declares him to be the white man's equal but yet when he has him at his elbow he treats him with a scorn which even the negro can hardly endure i will give him political equality but not social equality says the abolitionist but even in this he is untrue a black man may vote in new york but he cannot vote under the same circumstances as a white man he is subjected to qualifications which in truth debar him from the poll a white man votes by manhood suffrage providing he has been for one year an inhabitant of his state but a man of colour must have been for three years a citizen of the state and must own a property qualification of fifty pounds free of debt but political equality is not what such men want nor indeed is it social equality it is social tolerance and social sympathy and these are denied to the negro an american abolitionist would not sit at table with a negro he might do so in england at the house of an english duchess but in his own country the proposal of such a companion would be an insult to him he will not sit with him in a public carriage if he can avoid it in new york i have seen special street cars for colored people the abolitionist is struck with horror when he thinks that a man and a brother should be a slave but when the man and the brother has been made free he is regarded with loathing and contempt all this i cannot see with equanimity there is falsehood in it from the beginning to the end the slave as a rule is well treated gets all he wants and almost all he desires the free negro as a rule is ill-treated and does not get that consideration which alone might put him in the worldly position for which his advocate declares him to be fit it is false throughout this preaching the negro is not the white man's equal by nature but to the free negro in the northern states this inequality is increased by the white man's hardness to him in a former book which i wrote some few years since i expressed an opinion as to the probable destiny of this race in the west indies i will not now go over that question again i then divided the inhabitants of those islands into three classes the white the black and the colored taking a nomenclature which i found there prevailing by colored men i alluded to mulattoes and all those of mixed european and african blood the word colored in the states seems to apply to the whole negro race whether full-blooded or half-blooded i allude to this now because i wish to explain that in speaking of what i conceive to be the intellectual inferiority of the negro race i allude to those of pure negro descent or of descent so nearly pure as to make the negro element manifestly predominant in the west indies where i had more opportunity of studying the subject i always believed myself able to tell a negro from a colored man indeed the classes are to a great degree distinct there the greater portion of the retail trade of the country being in the hands of the colored people but in the states i have been able to make no such distinction one sees generally neither the rich yellow of the west indian mulatto nor the deep oily black of the west indian negro the prevailing hue is a dry dingy brown almost dusty in its dryness i have observed but little difference made between the negro and the half caste and no difference in the actual treatment i have never met in american society any man or woman in whose veins there can have been presumed to be any taint of african blood in jamaica they are daily to be found in society every englishman probably looks forward to the accomplishment of abolition of slavery at some future day i feel as sure of it as i do of the final judgment when or how it shall come i will not attempt to foretell the mode which seems to promise the surest success and the least present or future inconvenience would be an edict enfranchising all female children born after a certain date and all their children under such an arrangement the negro population would probably die out slowly very slowly what might then be the fate of the cotton fields of the gulf states who shall dare to say it may be that coolies from india and from china will then have taken the place of the negro there as they probably will have done also in guiana and the west indies End of chapter three
Chapter Four of North America, Volume Two by Antony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Four, Washington to Saint Louis, Part One. Though I had felt Washington to be disagreeable as a city, yet I was almost sorry to leave it when the day of my departure came. I had allowed myself a month for my sojourn in the capital, and I had stayed a month to the day. Then came the trouble of packing up the necessity of calling on a long list of acquaintances one after another the feeling that bad as washington might be i might be going to places that were worse a conviction that i should get beyond the reach of my letters and a sort of affection which i had acquired for my rooms my landlord being a coloured man told me that he was sorry i was going would i not remain would i come back to him had i been comfortable only for so-and-so or so-and-so he would have done better for me no white american citizen occupying the position of landlord would have condescended to such comfortable words i knew the man did not in truth want me to stay as a lady and gentleman were waiting to go in the moment i went out but i did not the less value the assurance one hungers and thirsts after such civil words among american citizens of this class the clerks and managers at hotels the officials at railway stations, the cashiers at banks, the women in the shops. Ah, they are the worst of all. An American woman who is bound by her position to serve you, who is paid in some shape to supply your wants, whether to sell you a bit of soap or bring you a towel in your bedroom at an hotel, is, I think, of all human creatures the most insolent. I certainly had a feeling of regret at parting with my colored friend, and some regret also as regards a few that were white as i drove down pennsylvania avenue through the slush and mud and saw perhaps for the last time those wretchedly dirty horse sentries who had refused to allow me to trot through the streets i almost wished that i could see more of them how absurd they looked with the whole kit of rattle-traps strapped on their horses backs behind them blankets coats canteens coils of rope and always at the top of everything else a tin pot no doubt these things are all necessary to a mounted sentry or they would not have been there but it always seemed as though the horse had been loaded gypsy fashion in a manner that i may perhaps best describe as higgledy-piggledy and that there was a want of military precision in the packing the man would have looked more graceful and the soldier more warlike had the pannikin been made to assume some rigidly fixed position instead of dangling among the ropes the drawn sabre too never consorted well with the dirty outside woollen wrapper which generally hung loose from the man's neck heaven knows i did not begrudge him his comforter in that cold weather or even his long uncombed shock of hair but i think he might have been made more spruce and i am sure that he could not have looked more uncomfortable as i went however i felt for him a sort of affection and wished in my heart of hearts that he might soon be enabled to return to some more congenial employment i went out by the capital and saw that also as i then believed for the last time with all its faults it is a great building and though unfinished is effective its very size and pretension give it a certain majesty what will be the fate of that vast pile and of those other costly public edifices at washington should the south succeed wholly in their present enterprise if virginia should ever become a part of the southern republic washington cannot remain the capital of the northern republic in such case it would be almost better to let maryland go also so that the future destiny of that unfortunate city may not be a source of trouble and a stumbling-block of opprobrium even if virginia be saved its position will be most unfortunate i fancy that the railroads in those days must have been doing a very prosperous business from new york to philadelphia thence on to baltimore and again to washington i had found the cars full so full that sundry passengers could not find seats now on my return to baltimore they were again crowded the stations were all crowded luggage trains were going in and out as fast as the rails could carry them among the passengers almost half were soldiers i presumed that these were men going on furlough or on special occasions for the regiments were of course not received by ordinary passenger trains about this time a return was called for by congress of all the monies paid by the government on account of the army to the lines between new york and washington whether or no it was ever furnished i did not hear 
but it was openly stated that the colonels of regiments received large gratuities from certain railway companies for the regiments passing over their lines charges of a similar nature were made against officers contractors quartermasters paymasters generals and cabinet ministers i am not prepared to say that any of these men had dirty hands it was not for me to make inquiries on such matters but the continuance and universality of the accusations were dreadful when everybody is suspected of being dishonest dishonesty almost ceases to be regarded as disgraceful i will allude to a charge made against one member of the cabinet because the circumstances of the case were all acknowledged and proved this gentleman employed his wife's brother-in-law to buy ships and the agent so employed pocketed about twenty thousand pounds by the transaction in six months the excuse made was that this profit was in accordance with the usual practice of the ship-dealing trade and that it was paid by the owners who sold and not by the government which bought but in so vast an agency the ordinary rate of profit on such business became an enormous sum and the gentleman who made the plea must surely have understood that the twenty thousand pounds was in fact paid by the government it is the purchaser and not the seller who in fact pays all such fees the question is this should the government have paid so vast a sum for one man's work for six months and if so was it well that the sum should go into the pocket of a near relative of the minister whose special business it was to protect the government american private soldiers are not pleasant fellow travellers they are loud and noisy and swear quite as much as the army could possibly have sworn in flanders they are moreover very dirty and each man with his long thick greatcoat takes up more space than is intended to be allotted to him of course i felt that if i chose to travel in a country while it had such a piece of business on its hands i could not expect that everything should be found in exact order the matter for wonder perhaps was that the ordinary affairs of life were so little disarranged and that any travelling at all was practicable nevertheless the fact remains that american private soldiers are not agreeable fellow travellers it was my present intention to go due west across the country into missouri skirting as it were the line of the war which had now extended itself from the atlantic across into kansas there were at this time three main armies that of the potomac as the army of virginia was called of which mcclellan held the command that of kentucky under general buell who was stationed at louisville on the ohio and the army on the mississippi which had been under fremont and of which general halleck now held the command to these were opposed the three rebel armies of beauregard in virginia of johnston on the borders of kentucky and tennessee and of price in missouri there was also a fourth army in kansas west of missouri under general hunter and while i was in washington another general supposed by some to be the coming man was sent down to kansas to participate in general hunter's command this was general jim lane who resigned a seat in the senate in order that he might undertake this military duty when he reached kansas having on his route made sundry violent abolition speeches and proclaimed his intention of sweeping slavery out of the southwestern states he came to loggerheads with his superior officer respecting their relative positions on my arrival at baltimore i found the place knee-deep in mud and slush and half-melted snow it was then raining hard raining dirt not water as it sometimes does worse weather for soldiers out in tents could not be imagined nor for men who were not soldiers but who nevertheless were compelled to leave their houses i only remained at baltimore one day and then started again leaving there the greater part of my baggage i had a vague hope a hope which i hardly hoped to realize that i might be able to get through to the south at any rate i made myself ready for the chance by making my travelling impediments as light as possible and started from baltimore prepared to endure all the discomfort which lightness of baggage entails my route lay over the alleghanies by pittsburgh and cincinnati and my first stopping-place was at harrisburg the political capital of pennsylvania there is nothing special at harrisburg to arrest any traveller but the local legislature of the state was then sitting and i was desirous of seeing the senate and representatives of at any rate one state during its period of vitality 
in pennsylvania the general assembly as the joint legislature is called sits every year commencing their work early in january and continuing till it be finished the usual period of sitting seems to be about ten weeks in the majority of states the legislature only sits every other year in this state it sits every year and the representatives are elected annually the senators are elected for three years a third of the body being chosen each year the two chambers were ugly convenient rooms arranged very much after the fashion of the halls of congress at washington each member has his own desk and his own chair they were placed in the shape of a horseshoe facing the chairman before whom sat three clerks in neither house did i hear any set speech the voices of the speaker and of the clerks of the houses were heard more frequently than those of the members and the business seemed to be done in a dull serviceable methodical manner likely to be useful to the country and very uninteresting to the gentlemen engaged indeed at washington also in congress it seemed to me that there was much less of set speeches than in our house of commons with us there are certain men whom it seems impossible to put down and by whom the time of parliament is occupied from night to night with advantage to no one and with satisfaction to none but themselves i do not think that the evil prevails to the same extent in america either in congress or in the state legislatures as regards washington this good result may be assisted by a salutary practice which as i was assured prevails there a member gets his speech printed at the government cost and sends it down free by post to his constituents without troubling either the house with hearing it or himself with speaking it i cannot but think that the practice might be copied with success on our side of the water the appearance of the members of the legislature of pennsylvania did not impress me very favorably i do not know why we should wish a legislator to be neat in his dress and comely in some degree in his personal appearance there is no good reason perhaps why they should have cleaner shirts than their outside brethren or have been more particular in the use of soap and water and brush and comb but i have an idea that if ever our own parliament becomes dirty it will lose its prestige and i cannot but think that the parliament of pennsylvania would gain an accession of dignity by some slightly increased devotion to the graces i saw in the two houses but one gentleman a senator who looked like a quaker but even he was a very untidy quaker i paid my respects to the governor and found him briskly employed in arranging the appointments of officers all the regimental appointments to the volunteer regiments and that is practically the whole body of the army are made by the state in which the regiments are mustered note the army at this time consisted nominally of six hundred sixty thousand men of whom only twenty thousand were regulars End note. when the affair commenced the captains and lieutenants were chosen by the men but it was found that this would not do when the skeleton of a state militia only was required such an arrangement was popular and not essentially injurious but now that the war had become a reality and that volunteers were required to obey discipline some other mode of promotion was found necessary as far as i could understand the appointments were in the hands of the state governor who however was expected in the selection of the superior officers to be guided by the expressed wishes of the regiment when no objection existed to such a choice in the present instance the governor's course was very thorny certain unfinished regiments were in the act of being amalgamated two perfect regiments being made up from perhaps five imperfect regiments and so on but though the privates had not been forthcoming to the full number for each expected regiment there had been no such dearth of officers and consequently the present operations consisted in reducing their number nothing can be much uglier than the state house at harrisburg but it commands a magnificent view of one of the valleys into which the allegheny mountains is broken harrisburg is immediately under the range probably at its finest point and the railway running west from the town to pittsburgh cincinnati and chicago passes right over the chain the line has been magnificently engineered and the scenery is very grand i went over the alleghanies in midwinter when they were covered with snow but even when so seen they were very fine the view down the valley from altoona a point near the summit must in summer be excessively lovely 
i stopped at altoona one night with the object of getting about among the hills and making the best of the winter view but i found it impossible to walk the snow had become frozen and was like glass i could not progress a mile in any way with infinite labour i climbed to the top of one little hill and when there became aware that the descent would be very much more difficult i did get down but should not choose to describe the manner in which i accomplished the descent in running down the mountains to pittsburgh an accident occurred which in any other country would have thrown the engine off the line and have reduced the carriages behind the engine to a heap of ruins but here it had no other effect than that of delaying us for three or four hours the tire of one of the heavy driving wheels flew off and in the shock the body of the wheel itself was broken one spoke and a portion of the circumference of the wheel was carried away and the steam chamber was ripped open nevertheless the train was pulled up neither the engine nor any of the carriages got off the line and the men in charge of the train seemed to think very lightly of the matter i was amused to see how little was made of the affair by any of the passengers in england a delay of three hours would in itself produce a great amount of grumbling or at least many signs of discomfort and temporary unhappiness but here no one said a word some of the younger men got out and looked at the ruined wheel but most of the passengers kept their seats chewed their tobacco and went to sleep in all such matters an american is much more patient than an englishman to sit quiet without speech and ruminate in some contorted position of body comes to him by nature on this occasion i did not hear a word of complaint nor yet a word of surprise or thankfulness that the accident had been attended with no serious result i have got a furlough for ten days one soldier said to me and i have missed every connection all through from washington here i shall just have time to turn round and go back when i get home but he did not seem to be in any way dissatisfied he had not referred to his relatives when he spoke of missing his connections but to his want of good fortune as regarded railway travelling he had reached baltimore too late for the train on to harrisburg and harrisburg too late for the train on to pittsburgh now he must again reach pittsburgh too late for his further journey but nevertheless he seemed to be well pleased with his position Pittsburgh is the mirth or tidville of Pennsylvania, or perhaps I should better describe it as an amalgamation of Swansea, mirth or tidville, and South Shields. It is, without exception, the blackest place which I ever saw. The three English towns which I have named are very dirty, but all their combined soot and grease and dinginess do not equal that of Pittsburgh. As regards scenery, it is beautifully situated, being at the foot of the Allegheny Mountains, and at the juncture of the two rivers Monongahela and Allegheny. Here, at the town, they come together and form the river Ohio. Nothing can be more picturesque than the site, for the spurs of the mountains come down close round the town, and the rivers are broad and swift, and can be seen for miles from heights which may be reached in a short walk even the filth and wondrous blackness of the place are picturesque when looked down upon from above the tops of the churches are visible and some of the larger buildings may be partially traced through the thick brown settled smoke but the city itself is buried in a dense cloud the atmosphere was especially heavy when i was there and the effect was probably increased by the general darkness of the weather the monongahela is crossed by a fine bridge and on the other side the ground rises at once almost with the rapidity of a precipice so that a commanding view is obtained down upon the town and the two rivers and the different bridges from a height immediately above them i was never more in love with smoke and dirt than when i stood there and watched the darkness of the night close in upon the floating soot which hovered over the housetops of the city i cannot say that i saw the sun set for there was no sun i should say that the sun never shone at pittsburgh as foreigners who visit london in november declare that the sun never shines there walking along the riverside i counted thirty-two steamers all beached upon the shore with their bows towards the land large boats capable probably of carrying from one to two hundred passengers each and about three hundred tons of merchandise on inquiry i found that many of these were not now at work they were resting idle 
the trade down the mississippi below st louis having been cut off by the war many of them however were still running the passage down the river being open to wheeling in virginia to portsmouth cincinnati and the whole of south ohio to Louisville in kentucky and to cairo in illinois where the ohio joins the mississippi the amount of traffic carried on by these boats while the country was at peace within itself was very great and conclusive as to the increasing prosperity of the people it seems that everybody travels in america and that nothing is thought of distance a young man will step into a car and sit beside you with that easy careless air which is common to a railway passenger in england who is passing from one station to the next and on conversing with him you will find that he is going seven or eight hundred miles he is supplied with fresh newspapers three or four times a day as he passes by the towns at which they are published he eats a large assortment of gumdrops and apples and is quite as much at home as in his own house on board the river boats it is the same with him with this exception that when there he can get whisky when he wants it he knows nothing of the ennui of travelling and never seems to long for the end of his journey as travellers do with us should his boat come to grief upon the river and lie by for a day or a night it does not in the least disconcert him he seats himself upon three chairs takes a bite of tobacco thrusts his hands into his trousers pockets and revels in an elysium of his own i was told that the stockholders in these boats were in a bad way at the present time there were no dividends going the same story was repeated as to many and many an investment where the war created business as it had done on some of the main lines of railroad and in some special towns money was passing very freely but away from this ruin seemed to have fallen on the enterprise of the country men were not broken-hearted nor were they even melancholy but they were simply ruined that is nothing in the states so long as the ruined man has the means left to him of supplying his daily wants till he can start himself again in life it is almost the normal condition of the american man in business and therefore i am inclined to think that when this war is over and things begin to settle themselves into new grooves commerce will recover herself more quickly there than she would do among any other people it is so common a thing to hear of an enterprise that has never paid a dollar of interest on the original outlay of hotels canals railroads banks blocks of houses etc that never paid even in the happy days of peace that one is tempted to disregard the absence of dividends and to believe that such a trifling accident will not act as any check on future speculation in no country has pecuniary ruin been so common as in the states but then in no country is pecuniary ruin so little ruinous we are a recuperative people a west country gentleman once said to me i doubted the propriety of his word but i acknowledged the truth of his assertion pittsburgh and allegheny which latter is a town similar in its nature to pittsburgh on the other side of the river of the same name regard themselves as places apart but they are in effect one and the same city they live under the same blanket of soot which is woven by the joint efforts of the two places their united population is one hundred thirty five thousand of which allegheny owns about fifty thousand the industry of the towns is of that sort which arises from a union of coal and iron in the vicinity the pennsylvanian coal fields are the most prolific in the union and pittsburgh is therefore great exactly as merthyr tidwell and birmingham are great but the foundry work at pittsburgh is more nearly allied to the heavy rough works of the welsh coal metropolis than to the finish and polish of birmingham why cannot you consume your own smoke i asked a gentleman there fuel is so cheap that it would not pay he answered his idea of the advantage of consuming smoke was confined to the question of its paying as a simple operation in itself the consequent cleanliness and improvement in the atmosphere had not entered into his calculations any such result might be a fortuitous benefit but was not of sufficient importance to make any effort in that direction expedient on its own account coal was burned he said in the foundries at something less than two dollars a ton while that was the case it could not answer the purpose of any iron founder to put up an apparatus for the consumption of smoke 
I did not pursue the argument any further, as I perceived that we were looking at the matter from two different points of view. Everything in the hotel was black. Not black to the eye, for the eye teaches itself to discriminate colors even when loaded with dirt, but black to the touch. On coming out of a tub of water, my foot took an impress from the carpet exactly as it would have done had I trod barefooted on a path laid with soot. I thought I was turning negro upwards till I put my wet hand upon the carpet and found that the result was the same. And yet the carpet was green to the eye, a dull, dingy green, but still green. You shouldn't damp your feet, a man said to me to whom I mentioned the catastrophe. Certainly, Pittsburgh is the dirtiest place I ever saw, but it is, as I said before, very picturesque in its dirt when looked at from above the blanket. End of chapter 4, part 1「Four Part Two of North America, Volume Two by Anthony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Four, Washington to St. Louis, Part Two. From Pittsburgh, I went on by train to Cincinnati and was soon in the state of Ohio. I confess that I have never felt any great regard for Pennsylvania. It has always had, in my estimation, a low character for commercial honesty and a certain flavor of pretentious hypocrisy. This probably has been much owing to the acerbity and pungency of Sidney Smith's witty denunciations against the drab colored state. It is noted for repudiation of its own debts and for sharpness in exaction of its own bargains. It has been always smart in banking. It has given Buchanan as a president to the country and Cameron as a secretary of war to the government. When the Battle of Bull's Run was to be fought, Pennsylvanian soldiers were the men who, on that day, threw down their arms because the three months' term for which they had been enlisted was then expired. Pennsylvania does not in my mind stand on a par with Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, Illinois, or Virginia. We are apt to connect the name of Benjamin Franklin with Pennsylvania, but Franklin was a Boston man. Nevertheless, Pennsylvania is rich and prosperous. Indeed, it bears all those marks which Quakers generally leave behind them. I had some little personal feeling in visiting Cincinnati, because my mother had lived there for some time, and had there been concerned in a commercial enterprise by which no one, I believe, made any great sum of money. Between thirty and forty years ago, she built a bazaar in Cincinnati, which I was assured by the present owner of the house, was at the time of its erection considered to be the great building of the town. It has been sadly eclipsed now and by no means rears its head proudly among the great blocks around it. It had become a physical medical institute when I was there, and was under the dominion of a quack doctor on one side, and of a college of rights of women female medical professors on the other. I believe, sir, no man or woman ever yet made a dollar in that building, and as for rent, I don't even expect it. Such was the account given of the unfortunate bazaar by the present proprietor. Cincinnati has long been known as a great town, conspicuous among all towns for the number of hogs which are there killed, salted, and packed. It is the great hog metropolis of the western states, but Cincinnati has not grown with the rapidity of other towns. It has now 170,000 inhabitants, but then it got an early start. St. Louis, which is west of it again, near the confluence of the Missouri and Mississippi, has gone ahead of it. Cincinnati stands on the Ohio River, separated by a ferry from Kentucky, which is a slave state. Ohio itself is a free-soil state. When the time comes for arranging the line of division, if such time shall ever come, it will be very hard to say where northern feeling ends and where southern wishes commence. Newport and Covington, which are in Kentucky, are suburbs of Cincinnati, and yet in these places slavery is rife. The domestic servants are mostly slaves, though it is essential that those so kept should be known as slaves who will not run away. It is understood that a slave who escapes into Ohio will not be caught and given up by the intervention of the Ohio police, and from Covington or Newport any slave can escape into Ohio with ease. But when that division takes place, no river like the Ohio can form the boundary between the divided nations. 
such rivers are the highways round which in this country people have clustered themselves a river is not a natural barrier but a connecting street it would be as well to make a railway a division or the center line of a city a national boundary kentucky and ohio states are joined together by the ohio river with cincinnati on the one side and louisville on the other and i do not think that man's act can upset these ties of nature but between kentucky and tennessee there is no such bond of union there a mathematical line has been simply drawn a continuation of that line which divides virginia from north carolina to which two latter states kentucky and tennessee belonged when the thirteen original states first formed themselves into a union but that mathematical line has offered no peculiar advantages to population no great towns cluster there and no strong social interests would be dissevered should kentucky throw in her lot with the north and tennessee with the south but kentucky owns a quarter of a million of slaves and those slaves must either be emancipated or removed before such a junction can be firmly settled the great business of cincinnati is hog killing now as it used to be in the old days of which i have so often heard it seems to be an established fact that in this portion of the world the porcine genus are all hogs one never hears of a pig with us the trade in hogs and pigs is subject to some little contumely there is a feeling which has perhaps never been expressed in words but which certainly exists that these animals are not so honourable in their bearings as sheep and oxen it is a prejudice which by no means exists in cincinnati there hog killing and salting and packing are very honourable and the great men in the trade are the merchant princes of the city i went to see the performance feeling it to be a duty to inspect everywhere that which i found to be of most importance but i will not describe it there were a crowd of men operating and i was told that the point of honour was to put through a hog in a minute it must be understood that the animal enters upon the ceremony alive and comes out in that cleanly disembowelled guise in which it may sometimes be seen hanging up previous to the operation of the pork butcher's knife to one special man was appointed a performance which seemed to be specially disagreeable so that he appeared despicable in my eyes but when on inquiry i learned that he earned five dollars or a pound sterling a day my judgment as to his position was reversed and after all what matters the ugly nature of such an occupation when a man is used to it cincinnati is like all other american towns with second third and fourth streets seventh eighth and ninth streets and so on then the cross streets are named chiefly from trees chestnut walnut locust etc i do not know whence has come this fancy for naming streets after trees in the states but it is very general the town is well built with good fronts to many of the houses with large shops and larger stores of course also with an enormous hotel which has never paid anything like a proper dividend to the speculator who built it it is always the same story but these towns shame our provincial towns by their breadth and grandeur i am afraid that speculators with us are trammelled by an ignorant impatience of ruin i should not myself like to live in cincinnati or in any of these towns they are slow dingy and uninteresting but they all possess an air of substantial civic dignity it must however be remembered that the americans live much more in towns than we do all with us that are rich and aristocratic and luxurious live in the country frequenting the metropolis for only a portion of the year but all that are rich and aristocratic and luxurious in the states live in the towns our provincial towns are not generally chosen as the residences of our higher classes cincinnati has one hundred seventy thousand inhabitants and there are fourteen thousand children at the free schools which is about one in twelve of the whole population this number gives the average of scholars throughout the year ended thirtieth of june eighteen sixty one but there are other schools in cincinnati parish schools and private schools and it is stated to me that there were in all thirty two thousand children attending school in the city throughout the year the education of the state schools is very good thirty four teachers are employed at an average salary of ninety two pounds each ranging from two hundred sixty to sixty pounds per annum it is in this matter of education that the cities of the free states of america have done so much for the civilization and welfare of their population 
this fact cannot be repeated in their praise too often those who have the management of affairs who are at the top of the tree are desirous of giving to all an opportunity of raising themselves in the scale of human beings i dislike universal suffrage i dislike vote by ballot i dislike above all things the tyranny of democracy but i do like the political feeling for it is a political feeling which induces every educated american to lend a hand to the education of his fellow-citizens it shows if nothing else does so a germ of truth in that doctrine of equality it is a doctrine to be forgiven when he who preaches it is in truth striving to raise others to his own level though utterly unpardonable when the preacher would pull down others to his level leaving cincinnati i again entered a slave state namely kentucky when the war broke out kentucky took upon itself to say that it would be neutral as if neutrality in such a position could by any means have been possible neutrality on the borders of a secession on the battlefield of the coming contest was of course impossible tennessee to the south had joined the south by a regular secession ordinance ohio illinois and indiana to the north were of course true to the union under these circumstances it became necessary that kentucky should choose her side with the exception of the little state of delaware in which from her position secession would have been impossible kentucky was i think less inclined to rebellion more desirous of standing by the north than any other of the slave states she did all she could however to put off the evil day of so evil a choice abolition within her borders was held to be abominable as strongly as it was so held in georgia she had no sympathy and could have none with the teachings and preachings of massachusetts but she did not wish to belong to a confederacy of which the northern states were to be the declared enemy and to be the border state of the south under such circumstances she did all she could for personal neutrality she made that effort for general reconciliation of which i have spoken as the crittenden compromise but compromises and reconciliation were not as yet possible and therefore it was necessary that she should choose her part her governor declared for secession and at first also her legislature was inclined to follow the governor but no overt act of secession by the state was committed and at last it was decided that kentucky should be declared to be loyal it was in fact divided those on the southern border joined the secessionists whereas the greater portion of the state containing frankfort the capital and the would-be secessionist governor who lived there joined the north men in fact became unionists or secessionists not by their own conviction but through the necessity of their positions and kentucky through the necessity of her position became one of the scenes of civil war i must confess that the difficulty of the position of the whole country seems to me to have been underestimated in england in common life it is not easy to arrange the circumstances of a divorce between man and wife all whose belongings and associations have for many years been in common their children their money their house their friends their secrets have been joint property and have formed bonds of union but yet such quarrels may arise such mutual antipathy such acerbity and even ill-usage that all who know them admit that a separation is needed so it is here in the states free soil and slave soil could while both were young and unused to power go on together not without many jars and unhappy bickerings but they did go on together but now they must part and how shall the parting be made with which side shall go this child and who shall remain in possession of that pleasant homestead putting secession aside there were in the united states two distinct political doctrines of which the extremes were opposed to each other as pole is opposed to pole we have no such variance of creed no such radical difference as to the essential rules of life between parties in our country we have no such cause for personal rancor in our parliament as has existed for some years past in both houses of congress these two extreme parties were the slave owners of the south and the abolitionists of the north and west fifty years ago the former regarded the institution of slavery as a necessity of their position generally as an evil necessity and generally also as a custom to be removed in the course of years gradually they have learned to look upon slavery as good in itself 
and to believe that it has been the source of their wealth and the strength of their position they have declared it to be a blessing inalienable that should remain among them for ever as an inheritance not to be touched and not to be spoken of with hard words fifty years ago the abolitionists of the north differed only in opinion from the slave owners of the south in hoping for a speedier end to this stain upon the nation and in thinking that some action should be taken towards the final emancipation of the bondsmen but they also have progressed and as the southern masters have called the institution blessed they have called it accursed their numbers have increased and with their numbers their power and their violence in this way two parties have been formed who could not look on each other without hatred an intermediate doctrine has been held by men who were nearer in their sympathies to the slave owners than to the abolitionists but who were not disposed to justify slavery as a thing apart these men have been aware that slavery has existed in accordance with the constitution of their country and have been willing to attach the stain which accompanies the institution to the individual state which entertains it and not to the national government by which the question has been constitutionally ignored the men who have participated in the government have naturally been inclined towards the middle doctrine but as the two extremes have retreated further from each other the power of this middle class of politicians has decreased mr lincoln though he does not now declare himself an abolitionist was elected by the abolitionists and when as a consequence of that election secession was threatened no step which he could have taken would have satisfied the south which had opposed him and been at the same time true to the north which had chosen him but it was possible that his government might save maryland virginia kentucky and missouri as radicals in england become simple whigs when they are admitted into public offices so did mr lincoln with his government become anti-abolitionist when he entered on his functions had he combated secession with emancipation of the slaves no slave state would or could have held by the union abolition for a lecturer may be a telling subject it is easy to bring down rounds of applause by tales of the wrongs of bondage but to men in office abolition was too stern a reality it signified servile insurrection absolute ruin to all southern slave owners and the absolute enmity of every slave state but that task of steering between the two has been very difficult i fear that the task of so steering with success is almost impossible in england it is thought that mr lincoln might have maintained the union by compromising matters with the south or if not so that he might have maintained peace by yielding to the south but no such power was in his hands while we were blaming him for opposition to all southern terms his own friends in the north were saying that all principle and truth was abandoned for the sake of such states as kentucky and missouri virginia is gone maryland cannot go and slavery is endured and the new virtue of washington is made to tamper with the evil one in order that a show of loyalty may be preserved in one or two states which after all are not truly loyal that is the accusation made against the government by the abolitionists and that made by us on the other side is the reverse i believe that mr lincoln had no alternative but to fight and that he was right also not to fight with abolition as his battle cry that he may be forced by his own friends into that cry is i fear still possible kentucky at any rate did not secede in bulk she still sent her senators to congress and allowed herself to be reckoned among the stars in the american firmament but she could not escape the presence of the war did she remain loyal or did she secede that was equally her fate the day before i entered kentucky a battle was fought in that state which gave to the northern arms their first actual victory it was at a place called mill spring near somerset towards the south of the state general zollicoffer with a confederate army numbering it was supposed some eight thousand men had advanced upon a smaller federal force commanded by general thomas and had been himself killed while his army was cut to pieces and dispersed the cannon of the confederates were taken and their camp seized and destroyed their route was complete but in this instance again the advancing party had been beaten as had i believe been the case in all the actions hitherto fought throughout the war 
here however had been an actual victory and it was not surprising that in kentucky loyal men should rejoice greatly and begin to hope that the confederates would be beaten out of the state unfortunately however general zollicoffer's army had only been an offshoot from the main rebel army in kentucky buell commanding the federal troops at louisville and sidney johnston the confederate general at bowling green as yet remained opposite to each other and the work was still to be done i visited the little towns of lexington and frankfort in kentucky at the former i found in the hotel to which i went seventy-five teamsters belonging to the army they were hanging about the great hall when i entered and clustering round the stove in the middle of the chamber a dirty rough quaint set of men clothed in a wonderful variety of garbs but not disorderly or loud the landlord apologized for their presence alleging that other accommodation could not be found for them in the town he received he said a dollar a day for feeding them and for supplying them with a space in which they could lie down it did not pay him but what could he do such an apology from an american landlord was in itself a surprising fact such high functionaries are as a rule men inclined to tell a traveller that if he does not like the guest among whom he finds himself he may go elsewhere but this landlord had as yet filled the place for not more than two or three weeks and was unused to the dignity of his position while i was at supper the seventy-five teamsters were summoned into the common eating-room by a loud gong and sat down to their meal at the public table they were very dirty i doubt whether i ever saw dirtier men but they were orderly and well behaved and but for their extreme dirt might have passed as the ordinary occupants of a well-filled hotel in the west such men in the states are less clumsy with their knives and forks less astray in an unused position more intelligent in adapting themselves to a new life than are englishmen of the same rank it is always the same story with us there is no level of society men stand on a long staircase but the crowd congregates near the bottom and the lower steps are very broad in america men stand on a common platform but the platform is raised above the ground though it does not approach in height the top of our staircase if we take the average altitude in the two countries we shall find that the american heads are the more elevated of the two i conceived rather an affection for those dirty teamsters they answered me civilly when i spoke to them and sat in quietness smoking their pipes with a dull and dirty but orderly demeanour the country about lexington is called the bluegrass region and boasts itself as of peculiar fecundity in the matter of pasturage why the grass is called blue and or in what way or at what period it becomes blue i did not learn but the country is very lovely and very fertile between lexington and frankfort a large stock farm extending over three thousand acres is kept by a gentleman who is very well known as a breeder of horses cattle and sheep he has spent much money on it and is making for himself a kentucky elysium he was kind enough to entertain me for a while and showed me something of country life in kentucky a farm in that part of the state depends and must depend chiefly on slave labor the slaves are a material part of the estate and as they are regarded by the law as real property being actually ad stricti glebae, an inheritor of land has no alternative but to keep them a gentleman in kentucky does not sell his slaves to do so is considered to be low and mean and is opposed to the aristocratic traditions of the country a man who does so willingly puts himself beyond the pale of good fellowship with his neighbours a sale of slaves is regarded as a sign almost of bankruptcy if a man cannot pay his debts his creditors can step in and sell his slaves but he does not himself make the sale when a man owns more slaves than he needs he hires them out by the year and when he requires more than he owns he takes them on hire by the year care is taken in such hirings not to remove a married man away from his home the price paid for a negro's labor at the time of my visit was about a hundred dollars or twenty pounds for the year but this price was then extremely low in consequence of the war disturbances the usual price had been about fifty or sixty per cent above this the man who takes the negro on hire feeds him clothes him provides him with a bed and supplies him with medical attendance 
i went into some of their cottages on the estate which i visited and was not in the least surprised to find them preferable in size furniture and all material comforts to the dwellings of most of our own agricultural labourers any comparison between the material comfort of a kentucky slave and an english ditcher and delver would be preposterous the kentucky slave never wants for clothing fitted to the weather he eats meat twice a day and has three good meals he knows no limit but his own appetite his work is light he has many varieties of amusement he has instant medical assistance at all periods of necessity for himself his wife and his children of course he pays no rent fears no baker and knows no hunger i would not have it supposed that i conceive slavery with all these comforts to be equal to freedom without them nor do i conceive that the negro can be made equal to the white man but in discussing the condition of the negro it is necessary that we should understand what are the advantages of which abolition would deprive him and in what condition he has been placed by the daily receipt of such advantages if a negro slave wants new shoes he asks for them and receives them with the undoubting simplicity of a child such a state of things has its picturesquely patriarchal side but what would be the state of such a man if he were emancipated to-morrow the natural beauty of the place which i was visiting was very great the trees were fine and well scattered over the large park-like pastures and the ground was broken on every side into hills there was perhaps too much timber but my friend seemed to think that that fault would find a natural remedy only too quickly i do not like to cut down trees if i can help it he said after that i need not say that my host was quite as much an englishman as an american to the purely american farmer a tree is simply an enemy to be trodden under foot and buried underground or reduced to ashes and thrown to the winds with what most economical dispatch may be possible if water had been added to the landscape here it would have been perfect regarding it as ordinary english park scenery but the little rivers at this place have a dirty trick of burying themselves under the ground they go down suddenly into holes disappearing from the upper air and then come up again at the distance of perhaps half a mile unfortunately their periods of seclusion are more prolonged than those of their upper air distance there were three or four such ascents and descents about the place my host was a breeder of race-horses and had imported sires from england of sheep also and had imported famous rams of cattle too and was great in bulls he was very loud in praise of kentucky and its attractions if only this war could be brought to an end but i could not obtain from him an assurance that the speculation in which he was engaged had been profitable ornamental farming in england is a very pretty amusement for a wealthy man but i fancy without intending any slight on mr Meachie, that the amusement is expensive i believe that the same thing may be said of it in a slave state frankfort is the capital of kentucky and is as quietly dull a little town as i ever entered it is on the river kentucky and as the grounds about it on every side rise in wooded hills it is a very pretty place in january it was very pretty but in summer it must be lovely i was taken up to the cemetery there by a path along the river and i am inclined to say that it is the sweetest resting place for the dead that i have ever visited daniel boone lies there he was the first white man who settled in kentucky or rather perhaps the first who entered kentucky with a view to a white man's settlement such frontier men as was daniel boone never remained long contented with the spots they opened as soon as he had left his mark in that territory he went again further west over the big rivers into missouri and there he died but the men of kentucky are proud of daniel boone and so they have buried him in the loveliest spot they could select immediately over the river frankfort is worth a visit if only that this grave and graveyard may be seen the legislature of the state was not sitting when i was there and the grass was growing in the streets louisville is the commercial city of the state and stands on the ohio it is another great town like all the others built with high stores and great houses and stone-faced blocks i have no doubt that all the building speculations have been failures and that the men engaged in them were all ruined but there as the result of their labor stands a fair great city on the southern banks of the ohio here general buell held his headquarters 
but his army lay at a distance. On my return from the West I visited one of the camps of this army, and will speak of it as I speak of my backward journey. I had already at this time begun to conceive an opinion that the armies in Kentucky and Missouri would do at any rate as much for the northern cause as that of the Potomac, of which so much more had been heard in England. While I was at Louisville the Ohio was flooded it had begun to rise when i was at cincinnati and since then had gone on increasing hourly rising inch by inch up into the towns upon its bank i visited two suburbs of louisville both of which were submerged as to the streets and ground floors of the houses at shippingport one of these suburbs i saw the women and children clustering in the upstairs room while the men were going about in punts and wherries collecting driftwood from the river for their winter's firing in some places bedding and furniture had been brought over to the high ground, and the women were sitting guarding their little property. That village amidst the waters was a sad sight to see, but I heard no complaints. There was no tearing of hair and no gnashing of teeth, no bitter tears or moans of sorrow. The men who were not at work in the boat stood loafing about in clusters, looking at the still rising river, but each seemed to be personally indifferent to the matter. When the house of an American is carried down the river, he builds himself another, as he would get himself a new coat when his old coat became unserviceable. But he never laments or moans for such a loss. Surely there is no other people so passive under personal misfortune. Going from Louisville up to St. Louis, I crossed the Ohio River and passed through parts of Indiana and of Illinois and striking the Mississippi opposite St. Louis, crossed that river also, and then entered the state of Missouri. The Ohio, as I have said, flooded, and we went over it at night. The boat had been moored at some unaccustomed place. There was no light. The road was deep in mud up to the axle-tree, and was crowded with wagons and carts, which in the darkness of the night seemed to have stuck there. But the man drove his four horses through it all, and into the ferry-boat over its side. There were three or four such omnibuses, and as many wagons, as to each of which I predicted in my own mind some fatal catastrophe. But they were all driven on to the boat in the dark, the horses mixing in through each other in a chaos which would have altogether incapacitated any english coachman and then the vessel laboured across the flood going sideways and hardly keeping her own against the stream but we did get over and were all driven out again up to the railway station in safety on reaching the mississippi about the middle of the next day we found it frozen over or rather covered from side to side with blocks of ice which had forced its way down the river so that the steam ferry could not reach its proper landing i do not think that we in england would have attempted the feat of carrying over horses and carriages under stress of such circumstances but it was done here huge plankings were laid down over the ice and omnibuses and wagons were driven on in getting out again these vehicles each with four horses had to be twisted about and driven in and across the vessel and turned in spaces to look at which would have broken the heart of an english coachman and then with a spring they were driven up a bank as steep as a ladder ah me under what mistaken illusions have i not laboured all the days of my youth in supposing that no man could drive four horses well but an english stage coachman i have seen performances in america and in italy and france also but above all in america which would have made the hair of any english professional driver stand on end and in this way i entered st louis end of chapter four chapter five part one of north america volume two by anthony trollope this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 5. Missouri, Part 1 Missouri is a slave state lying to the west of the Mississippi and to the north of Arkansas. It forms a portion of the territory ceded by France to the United States in 1803. Indeed, it is difficult to say how large a portion of the continent of North America is supposed to be included in that territory. It contains the states of Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, and Kansas, as also the present Indian Territory. But it also is said to have contained all the land lying back from them to the Rocky Mountains, Utah, Nebraska, and Dakota, 
and forms no doubt the widest dominion ever ceded by one nationality to another missouri lies exactly north of the old missouri compromise line that is thirty six degrees thirty north latitude when the missouri compromise was made it was arranged that missouri should be a slave state but that no other state north of the thirty six thirty line should ever become slave soil kentucky and virginia as also of course maryland and delaware four of the old slave states were already north of that line but the compromise was intended to prevent the advance of slavery in the northwest the compromise has since been annulled on the ground i believe that congress had not constitutionally the power to declare that any soil should be free or that any should be slave soil that is a question to be decided by the states themselves as each individual state may please so the compromise was repealed but slavery has not on that account advanced the battle has been fought in kansas and after a long and terrible struggle kansas has come out of the fight as a free state kansas is in the same parallel of latitude as virginia and stretches west as far as the rocky mountains when the census of the population of missouri was taken in eighteen sixty the slaves amounted to ten per cent of the whole number in the gulf states the slave population is about forty five per cent of the whole in the three border states of kentucky virginia and maryland the slaves amount to thirty per cent of the whole population from these figures it will be seen that missouri which is comparatively a new slave state has not gone ahead with slavery as the old slave states have done although from its position and climate lying as far south as virginia it might seem to have had the same reasons for doing so i think there is every reason to believe that slavery will die out in missouri the institution is not popular with the people generally and as white labor becomes abundant and before the war it was becoming abundant men recognize the fact that the white man's labor is the more profitable the heat in this state in midsummer is very great especially in the valleys of the rivers at st louis on the mississippi it reaches commonly to ninety degrees and very frequently goes above that the nights moreover are nearly as hot as the days but this great heat does not last for any very long period and it seems that white men are able to work throughout the year if correspondingly severe weather in winter affords any compensation to the white man for what of heat he endures during the summer i can testify that such compensation is to be found in missouri when i was there we were afflicted with a combination of snow sleet frost and wind with a mixture of ice and mud that makes me regard missouri as the most inclement land into which i ever penetrated st louis on the mississippi is the great town of missouri and is considered by the missourians to be the star of the west it is not to be beaten in population wealth or natural advantages by any other city so far west but it has not increased with such rapidity as chicago which is considerably to the north of it on lake michigan of the great western cities i regard chicago as the most remarkable seeing that st louis was a large town before chicago had been founded the population of st louis is one hundred seventy thousand of this number only two thousand are slaves i was told that a large proportion of the slaves of missouri are employed near the missouri river in breaking hemp the growth of hemp is very profitably carried on in that valley and the labor attached to it is one which white men do not like to encounter slaves are not generally employed in st louis for domestic service as is done almost universally in the towns of kentucky the work is chiefly in the hands of irish and germans considerably above one-third of the population of the whole city is made up of these two nationalities so much is confessed but if i were to form an opinion from the language i heard in the streets of the town i should say that nearly every man was either an irishman or a german st louis has none of the aspects of a slave city i cannot say that i found it an attractive place but then i did not visit it at an attractive time the war had disturbed everything given a special colour of its own to men's thoughts and words and destroyed all interest except that which might proceed from itself the town is well built with good shops straight streets never-ending rows of excellent houses and every sign of commercial wealth and domestic comfort of commercial wealth and domestic comfort in the past for there was no present appearance either of comfort or of wealth the new hotel here was to be bigger than all the hotels of all the other towns 
it is built and is an enormous pile and would be handsome but for a terribly ambitious grecian doorway it is built as far as the walls and roof are concerned but in all other respects is unfinished i was told that the shares of the original stockholders were now worth nothing a shareholder who so told me seemed to regard this as the ordinary course of business the great glory of the town is the levee as it is called or the long river beach up to which the steamers are brought with their bows to the shore it is an esplanade looking on to the river not built with quays or wharves as would be the case with us but with a sloping bank running down to the water in the good days of peace a hundred vessels were to be seen here each with its double funnels the line of them seemed to be never-ending even when i was there but then a very large proportion of them were lying idle they resemble huge wooden houses apparently of frail architecture floating upon the water each has its double row of balconies running round it and the lower or ground floor is open throughout the upper stories are propped and supported on ugly sticks and rickety-looking beams so that the first appearance does not convey any great idea of security to a stranger they are always painted white and the paint is always very dirty when they begin to move they moan and groan in melancholy tones which are subversive of all comfort and as they continue on their courses they puff and bluster and are for ever threatening to burst and shatter themselves to pieces there they lie in a continuous line nearly a mile in length along the levee of st louis dirty dingy and now alas mute they have ceased to groan and puff and if this war be continued for six months longer will become rotten and useless as they lie they boast at st louis that they command forty-six thousand miles of navigable river water counting the great rivers up and down from that place these rivers are chiefly the mississippi the missouri and ohio which fall into the mississippi near st louis the platte and kansas rivers tributaries of the missouri the illinois and the wisconsin all these are open to steamers and all of them traverse regions rich in corn in coal in metals or in timber these ready-made highways of the world's centre as it were at st louis and make it the depot of the carrying trade of all that vast country minnesota is fifteen hundred miles above new orleans but the wheat of minnesota can be brought down the whole distance without change of the vessel in which it is first deposited it would seem to be impossible that a country so blessed should not become rich it must be remembered that these rivers flow through lands that have never yet been surpassed in natural fertility of all countries in the world one would say that the states of america should have been the last to curse themselves with a war but now the curse has fallen upon them with a double vengeance it would seem that they could never be great in war their very institutions forbid it their enormous distances forbid it the price of labor forbids it and it is forbidden also by the career of industry and expansion which has been given to them but the curse of fighting has come upon them and they are showing themselves to be as eager in the works of war as they have shown themselves capable in the works of peace men and angels must weep as they behold the things that are being done as they watch the ruin that has come and is still coming as they look on commerce killed and agriculture suspended no sight so sad has come upon the earth in our days they were a great people feeding the world adding daily to the mechanical appliances of mankind increasing in population beyond all measures of such increase hitherto known and extending education as fast as they extended their numbers poverty had as yet found no place among them and hunger was an evil of which they had read but were themselves ignorant each man among their crowds had a right to be proud of his manhood to read and write i am speaking here of the north was as common as to eat and drink to work was no disgrace and the wages of work were plentiful to live without work was the lot of none what blessing above these blessings was needed to make a people great and happy and now a stranger visiting them would declare that they are wallowing in a very slough of despond the only trade open is the trade of war the axe of the woodsman is at rest the plough is idle the artificer has closed his shop the roar of the foundry is still heard because cannon are needed and the river of molten iron comes out as an implement of death 
the stone-cutter's hammer and the mason's trowel are never heard the gold of the country is hiding itself as though it had returned to its mother earth and the infancy of a paper currency has been commenced six soldiers who have never seen a battlefield are dying by hundreds in the squalid dirt of their unaccustomed camps men and women talk of war and of war only newspapers full of the war are alone read a contract for war stores too often a dishonest contract is the one path open for commercial enterprise the young man must go to the war or he is disgraced the war swallows everything and as yet has failed to produce even such bitter fruits as victory or glory must it not be said that a curse has fallen upon the land and yet i still hope that it may ultimately be for good through water and fire must a nation be cleansed of its faults it has been so with all nations though the phases of their trials have been different it did not seem to be well with us in cromwell's early days nor was it well with us afterwards in those disgraceful years of the later stuarts we know how france was bathed in blood in her effort to rid herself of her painted sepulchre of an ancient throne how germany was made desolate in order that prussia might become a nation ireland was poor and wretched till her famine came men said it was a curse but that curse has been her greatest blessing and so it will be here in the west i could not but weep in spirit as i saw the wretchedness around me the squalid misery of the soldiers the inefficiency of their officers the bickerings of their rulers the noise and threats the dirt and ruin the terrible dishonesty of those who were trusted these are things which made a man wish that he were anywhere but there but i do believe that god is still over all and that everything is working for good these things are the fire and water through which this nation must pass the course of this people had been too straight and their ways had been too pleasant that which to others had been ever difficult had been made easy for them bread and meat had come to them as things of course and they hardly remembered to be thankful we ourselves have done it they declared aloud we are not as other men we are gods upon the earth whose arm shall be long enough to stay us or whose bolt shall be strong enough to strike us now they are stricken sore and the bolt is from their own bow their own hands have raised the barrier that has stayed them they have stumbled in their running and are lying hurt upon the ground while they who have heard their boastings turn upon them with ridicule and laugh at them in their discomfiture they are rolling in the mire and cannot take the hand of any man to help them though the hand of the bystander may be stretched to them his face is scornful and his voice full of reproaches who has not known that hour of misery when in the sullenness of the heart all help has been refused and misfortune has been made welcome to do her worst so it is now with those once united states the man who can see without inward tears the self-inflicted wounds of that american people can hardly have within his bosom the tenderness of an englishman's heart but the strong runner will rise again to his feet even though he be stunned by his fall he will rise again and he will have learned something by his sorrow his anger will pass away and he will again brace himself for his work what great race has ever been won by any man or by any nation without some such fall during its course have we not all declared that some check to that career was necessary men in their pursuit of intelligence had forgotten to be honest in struggling for greatness they had discarded purity the nation has been great but the statesmen of the nation have been little men have hardly been ambitious to govern but they have coveted the wages of governors corruption has crept into high places into places that should have been high till of all holes and corners in the land they have become the lowest no public man has been trusted for ordinary honesty it is not by foreign voices by english newspapers or in french pamphlets that the corruption of american politicians has been exposed but by american voices and by the american press it is to be heard on every side ministers of the cabinet senators representatives state legislatures officers of the army officials of the navy contractors of every grade 
all who are presumed to touch or to have the power of touching public money are thus accused for years it has been so the word politician has stunk in men's nostrils when i first visited new york some three years since i was warned not to know a man because he was a politician we in england define a man of a certain class as a blackleg how has it come about that in american ears the word politician has come to bear a similar signification the material growth of the states has been so quick that the political growth has not been able to keep pace with it in commerce in education in all municipal arrangements in mechanical skill and also in professional ability the country has stalked on with amazing rapidity but in the art of governing in all political management and detail it has made no advance the merchants of our country and of that country have for many years met on terms of perfect equality but it has never been so with their statesmen and our statesmen with their diplomatists and our diplomatists lombard street and wall street can do business with each other on equal footing but it is not so between downing street and the state office at washington the science of statesmanship has yet to be learned in the states and certainly the highest lesson of that science which teaches that honesty is the best policy i trust that the war will have left such a lesson behind it if it do so let the cost and money be what it may that money will not have been wasted if the american people can learn the necessity of employing their best men for their highest work if they can recognize these honest men and trust them when they are so recognized then they may become as great in politics as they have become great in commerce and in social institutions st louis and indeed the whole state of missouri was at the time of my visit under martial law general halleck was in command holding his headquarters at st louis and carrying out at any rate as far as the city was concerned what orders he chose to issue i am disposed to think that situated as missouri then was martial law was the best law no other law could have had force in a town surrounded by soldiers and in which half of the inhabitants were loyal to the existing government and half of them were in favor of rebellion the necessity for such power is terrible and the power itself in the hands of one man must be full of danger but even that is better than anarchy i will not accuse general halleck of abusing his power seeing that it is hard to determine what is the abuse of such power and what its proper use when we were at st louis a tax was being gathered of one hundred pounds a head for certain men presumed to be secessionists and as the money was not of course very readily paid the furniture of these suspected secessionists was being sold by auction no doubt such a measure was by them regarded as a great abuse one gentleman informed me that in addition to this certain houses of his had been taken by the government at a fixed rent and that the payment of the rent was now refused unless he would take the oath of allegiance he no doubt thought that an abuse of power but the worst abuse of such power comes not at first but with long usage up to the time however at which i was at st louis martial law had chiefly been used in closing grog shops and administering the oath of allegiance to suspected secessionists something also had been done in the way of raising money by selling the property of convicted secessionists and while i was there eight men were condemned to be shot for destroying railway bridges but will they be shot i asked one of the officers oh yes it will be done quietly and no one will know anything about it we shall get used to that kind of thing presently and the inhabitants of missouri were becoming used to martial law it is surprising how quickly a people can reconcile themselves to altered circumstances when the change comes upon them without the necessity of any expressed opinion on their own part personal freedom has been considered as necessary to the american of the states as the air he breathes had any suggestion been made to him of a suspension of the privilege of habeas corpus of a censorship of the press or of martial law the american would have declared his willingness to die on the floor of the house of representatives and have proclaimed with ten million voices his inability to live under circumstances so subversive of his rights as a man and he would have thoroughly believed the truth of his own assertions had a chance been given of an argument on the matter of stump speeches and caucus meetings these things could never have been done but as it is americans are i think rather proud of the suspension of the habeas corpus 
they point with gratification to the uniformly loyal tone of the newspapers remarking that any editor who should dare to give even a secession squeak would immediately find himself shut up and now nothing but good is spoken of martial law i thought it a nuisance when i was prevented by soldiers from trotting my horse down pennsylvania avenue in washington but i was assured by americans that such restrictions were very serviceable in a community at st louis martial law was quite popular why should not general halleck be as well able to say what was good for the people as any law or any lawyer he had no interest in the injury of the state but every interest in its preservation but what i asked would be the effect were he to tell you to put out all your fires at eight o'clock if he were to so order we should do it but we know that he will not but who does know to what general halleck or other generals may come or how soon a curfew bell may be ringing in american towns the winning of liberty is long and tedious but the losing it is a downhill easy journey it was here in st louis that general fremont had held his military court he was a great man here during those hundred days through which his command lasted he lived in a great house had a bodyguard was inaccessible as a great man should be and fared sumptuously every day he fortified the city or rather he began to do so he constructed barracks here and instituted military prisons the fortifications have been discontinued as useless but the barracks and the prisons remain in the latter there were twelve hundred secessionist soldiers who had been taken in the state of missouri why are they not exchanged i asked because they are not exactly soldiers i was informed the secessionists do not acknowledge them then would it not be cheaper to let them go no said my informant because in that case we should have to catch them again and so the twelve hundred remain in their wretched prison thinned from week to week and from day to day by prison disease and prison death i went out twice to benton barracks as the camp of wooden huts was called which general fremont had erected near the fair ground of the city this fair ground i was told had been a pleasant place it had been constructed for the recreation of the city and for the purpose of periodical agricultural exhibitions there is still in it a pretty ornamented cottage and in the little garden a solitary cupid stood dismayed by the dirt and ruin around him in the fair green are the round buildings intended for show cattle and agricultural implements but now given up to cavalry horses and parrot guns but benton barracks are outside the fair green here on an open space some half mile in length two long rows of wooden sheds have been built opposite to each other and behind them are other sheds used for stabling and cooking places those in front are divided not into separate huts but into chambers capable of containing nearly two hundred men each they were surrounded on the inside by great wooden trays in three tiers and on each tray four men were supposed to sleep i went into one or two while the crowd of soldiers was in them but found it inexpedient to stay there long the stench of those places was foul beyond description never in my life before had i been in a place so horrid to the eyes and nose as benton barracks the path along the front outside was deep in mud the whole space between the two rows of sheds was one field of mud so slippery that the foot could not stand inside and outside every spot was deep in mud the soldiers were mud-stained from foot to sole these volunteer soldiers are in their nature dirty as must be all men brought together in numerous bodies without special appliances for cleanliness or control and discipline as to their personal habits but the dirt of the men in the benton barracks surpassed any dirt that i had hitherto seen nor could it have been otherwise with them they were surrounded by a sea of mud and the foul hovels in which they were made to sleep and live were fetid with stench and reeking with filth i had at this time been joined by another englishman and we went through this place together when we inquired as to the health of the men we heard the saddest tales of three hundred men gone out of one regiment of whole companies that had perished of hospitals crowded with fevered patients measles had been the great scourge of the soldiers here as it had also been in the army of the potomac i shall not soon forget my visits to benton barracks 
it may be that our own soldiers were as badly treated in the crimea or that french soldiers were treated worse on their march into russia it may be that dirt and wretchedness disease and listless idleness a descent from manhood to habits lower than those of the beasts are necessary in warfare i have sometimes thought that it is so but i am no military critic and will not say this i say that the degradation of men to the state in which i saw the american soldiers in benton barracks is disgraceful to humanity end of chapter five part one chapter five part two of north america volume two by antony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain five missouri part two general halleck was at this time commanding in missouri and was himself stationed at st louis but his active measures against the rebels were going on to the right and to the left on the left shore of the mississippi at cairo in illinois a fleet of gunboats was being prepared to go down the river and on the right an army was advancing against springfield in the southwestern district of missouri with the object of dislodging price the rebel guerrilla leader there and if possible of catching him price had been the opponent of poor general lyon who was killed at wilson's creek near springfield and of general fremont who during his hundred days had failed to drive him out of the state this duty had now been entrusted to general curtis who had for some time been holding his headquarters at rolla half way between st louis and springfield fremont had built a fort at rolla and it had become a military station over ten thousand men had been there at one time and now general curtis was to advance from rolla against price with something above that number of men many of them however had already gone on and others were daily being sent up from st louis under these circumstances my friend and i fortified with a letter of introduction to general curtis resolved to go and see the army at rolla on our way down by the railway we encountered a young german officer an aide-de-camp of the federals and under his auspices we saw rolla to advantage our companions in the railway were chiefly soldiers and teamsters the car was crowded and filled with tobacco smoke apple peel and foul air in these cars during the winter there is always a large lighted stove a stove that might cook all the dinners for a french hotel and no window is ever opened among our fellow travellers there was here and there a west country missouri farmer going down under the protection of the advancing army to look after the remains of his chattels wild dark uncouth savage-looking men one such hero i specially remember as to whom the only natural remark would be that one would not like to meet him alone on a dark night he was burly and big unwashed and rough with a black beard shorn some two months since he had sharp angry eyes and sat silent picking his teeth with a bowie knife i met him afterwards at the rolla hotel and found that he was a gentleman of property near springfield he was mild and meek as a sucking dove asked my advice as to the state of his affairs and merely guessed that things had been pretty rough with him things had been pretty rough with him the rebels had come upon his land houses fences stock and crop were all gone his homestead had been made a ruin and his farm had been turned into a wilderness everything was gone he had carried his wife and children off to illinois and had now returned hoping that he might get on in the wake of the army till he could see the debris of his property but even he did not seem disturbed he did not bemoan himself or curse his fate things were pretty rough he said and that was all he did say it was dark when we got into rolla everything had been covered with snow and everywhere the snow was frozen we had heard that there was an hotel and that possibly we might get a bedroom there we were first taken to a wooden building which we were told was the headquarters of the army and in one room we found a colonel with a lot of soldiers loafing about and in another a provost marshal attended by a newspaper correspondent we were received with open arms and a suggestion was at once made that we were no doubt picking up news for european newspapers are you a son of the mrs trollope said the correspondent then sir you are an accession to rolla upon which i was made to sit down and invited to loaf about at the headquarters as long as i might remain at rolla 
shortly however there came on a violent discussion about wagons a general had come in and wanted all the colonel's wagons but the colonel swore that he had none declared how bitterly he was impeded with sick men and became indignant and reproachful it was brutus and cassius again and as we felt ourselves in the way and anxious moreover to ascertain what might be the nature of the rolla hotel we took up our heavy portmanteau for they were heavy and with a guide to show us the way started off through the dark and over the hill up to our inn i shall never forget that walk it was uphill and downhill with an occasional half-frozen stream across it my friend was impeded with an enormous cloak lined with fur which in itself was a burden for a coal-heaver our guide who was a clerk out of the colonel's office carried an umbrella and a small dressing-bag but we ourselves manfully shouldered our portmanteau sidney smith declared that an englishman only wasted his time in training himself for gymnastic aptitudes seeing that for a shilling he could always hire a porter had sidney smith ever been at rolla he would have written differently i could tell at great length how i fell on my face in the icy snow how my friend stuck in the frozen mud when he essayed to jump the stream and how our guide walked on easily in advance encouraging us with his voice from a distance why is it that a stout englishman bordering on fifty finds himself in such a predicament as that no frenchman no italian no german would so place himself unless under the stress of insurmountable circumstances no american would do so under any circumstances as i slipped about on the ice and groaned with that terrible fardel on my back burdened with a dozen shirts and a suit of dress clothes and three pair of boots and four or five thick volumes and a set of maps and a box of cigars and a washing-tub i confessed to myself that i was a fool what was i doing in such a galley as that why had i brought all that useless lumber down to rolla why had i come to rolla with no certain hope even of shelter for a night but we did reach the hotel we did get a room between us with two bedsteads and pondering over the matter in my mind since that evening i have been inclined to think that the stout englishman is in the right of it no american of my age and weight will ever go through what i went through then but i am not sure that he does not in his accustomed career go through worse things even than that however if i go to rolla again during the war i will at any rate leave the books behind me what a night we spent in that inn they who know america will be aware that in all hotels there is a free admixture of different classes the traveller in europe may sit down to dinner with his tailor and shoemaker but if so his tailor and shoemaker have dressed themselves as he dresses and are prepared to carry themselves according to a certain standard which in exterior does not differ from his own in the large eastern cities of the states such as boston new york and washington a similar practice of life is gradually becoming prevalent there are various hotels for various classes and the ordinary traveller does not find himself at the same table with a butcher fresh from the shambles but in the west there are no distinctions whatever a man's a man for a that in the west let the a uh, that comprise what it may of coarse attire and unsophisticated manners one soon gets used to it in that inn at rolla was a public room heated in the middle by a stove and round that we soon found ourselves seated in a company of soldiers farmers labourers and teamsters but there was among them a general not a fighting or would-be fighting general of the present time but one of the old-fashioned local generals men who held or had once held some fabulous generalship in the state militia there we sat cheek by jowl with our new friends till nearly twelve o'clock talking politics and discussing the war the general was a stanch unionist having according to his own showing suffered dreadful things from secessionist persecutors since the rebellion commenced as a matter of course everybody present was for the union in such a place one rarely encounters any difference of opinion the general was very eager about the war advocating the immediate abolition of slavery not as a means of improving the condition of the southern slaves but on the ground that it would ruin the southern masters we all sat by edging in a word now and then but the general was the talker of the evening he was very wrathy and swore at every word it was pretty well time he said 
to crush out this rebellion and by blank it must and should be crushed out general jim lane was the man to do it and by blank general jim lane would do it and so on in all such conversations the time for action has always just come and also the expected man but the time passes by as other weeks and months have passed before it and the new general is found to be no more successful than his brethren our friend was very angry against england when we've polished off these accursed rebels i guess we'll take a turn at you you had your turn when you made us give up mason and slidell and we'll have our turn by and by but in spite of his dislike to our nation he invited us warmly to come and see him at his home on the missouri river it was according to his showing a new eden a paradise upon earth he seemed to think that we might perhaps desire to buy a location and explain to us how readily we could make our fortunes but he admitted in the course of his eulogiums that it would be as much as his life was worth for him to ride out five miles from his own house in the meantime the teamsters greased their boots the soldiers snored those who were wet took off their shoes and stockings hanging them to dry round the stove and the western farmers chewed tobacco in silence and ruminated at such a house all the guests go in to their meals together a gong is sounded on a sudden close behind your ears accustomed as you may probably be to the sound you jump up from your chair in the agony of the crash and by the time that you have collected your thoughts the whole crowd is off in a general stampede into the eating-room you may as well join them if you hesitate as to feeding with so rough a lot of men you will have to sit down afterwards with the women and children of the family and your lot will then be worse among such classes in the western states the men are always better than the women the men are dirty and civil the women are dirty and uncivil on the following day we visited the camp going out in an ambulance and returning on horseback we were accompanied by the general's aide-de-camp and also to our great gratification by the general's daughter there had been a hard frost for some nights but though the cold was very great there was always heat enough in the middle of the day to turn the surface of the ground into glutinous mud consequently we had all the roughness induced by frost but none of the usually attendant cleanliness indeed it seemed that in these parts nothing was so dirty as frost the mud stuck like paste and encompassed everything we heard that morning that from sixty to seventy baggage wagons had broken through as they called it and stuck fast near a river in their endeavour to make their way on to lebanon we encountered two generals of brigade general siegel a german general ashbeth a hungarian both of whom were waiting till the weather should allow them to advance they were extremely courteous and warmly invited us to go on with them to lebanon and springfield promising to us such accommodation as they might be able to obtain for themselves i was much tempted to accept the offer but i found that day after day might pass before any forward movement was commenced and that it might be weeks before springfield or even lebanon could be reached it was my wish moreover to see what i could of the people rather than scrutinize the ways of the army we dined at the tent of general ashbeth and afterwards rode his horses through the camp back to rolla i was greatly taken with this hungarian gentleman he was a tall thin gaunt man of fifty a pure-blooded magyar as i was told who had come from his own country with kossuth to america his camp circumstances were not very luxurious nor was his table very richly spread but he received us with the ease and courtesy of a gentleman he showed us his sword his rifle his pistols his chargers and a daguerreotype of a friend he had loved in his own country they were all the treasures that he carried with him over and above a chessboard and a set of chessmen which sorely tempted me to accompany him on his march in my next chapter which will i trust be very short i purport to say a few words as to what i saw of the american army and therefore i will not now describe the regiments which we visited the tents were all encompassed by snow and the ground on which they stood was a bed of mud but yet the soldiers out here were not so wretchedly forlorn or apparently so miserably uncomfortable as those at benton barracks i did not encounter that horrid sickly stench nor were the men so pale and woe-begone on the following day we returned to st louis bringing back with us our friend the german aide-de-camp 
i stayed two days longer in that city and then i thought that i had seen enough of missouri enough of missouri at any rate under the present circumstances of frost and secession as regards the people of the west i must say that they were not such as i expected to find them with the northerns we are all more or less intimately acquainted those americans whom we meet in our own country or on the continent are generally from the north or if not so they have that type of american manners which has become familiar to us they are talkative intelligent inclined to be social though frequently not sympathetically social with ourselves somewhat soi-disant but almost invariably companionable as the traveller goes southward into maryland and washington the type is not altered to any great extent the hard intelligence of the yankee gives place gradually to the softer and perhaps more polished manner of the southern but the change thus experienced is not so great as is that between the american of the western and the american of the atlantic states in the west i found the men gloomy and silent i might almost say sullen a dozen of them will sit for hours round a stove speechless they chew tobacco and ruminate they are not offended if you speak to them but they are not pleased they answer with monosyllables or if it be practicable with a gesture of the head they care nothing for the graces or shall i say for the decencies of life they are essentially a dirty people dirt untidiness and noise seem in no wise to afflict them things are constantly done before your eyes which should be done and might be done behind your back no doubt we daily come into the closest contact with matters which if we saw all that appertains to them would cause us to shake and shudder in other countries we do not see all this but in the western states we do i have eaten in bedouin tents and have been ministered to by turks and arabs i have sojourned in the hotels of old spain and of spanish america i have lived in connaught and have taken up my quarters with monks of different nations i have as it were been educated to dirt and taken out my degree in outward abominations but my education had not reached a point which would enable me to live at my ease in the western states a man or a woman who can do that may be said to have graduated in the highest honours and to have become absolutely invulnerable either through the sense of touch or by the eye or by the nose indifference to appearances is there a matter of pride a foul shirt is a flag of triumph a craving for soap and water is as the wail of the weak and the confession of cowardice this indifference is carried into all their affairs or rather this manifestation of indifference a few pages back i spoke of a man whose furniture had been sold to pay a heavy tax raised on him specially as a secessionist the same man had also been refused the payment of rent due to him by the government unless he would take a false oath i may presume that he was ruined in his circumstances by the strong hand of the northern army but he seemed in no wise to be unhappy about his ruin he spoke with some scorn of the martial law in missouri but i felt that it was esteemed a small matter by him that his furniture was seized and sold no men love money with more eager love than these western men but they bear the loss of it as an indian bears his torture at the stake they are energetic in trade speculating deeply whenever the speculation is possible but nevertheless they are slow in motion loving to loaf about they are slow in speech preferring to sit in silence with the tobacco between their teeth they drink but are seldom drunk to the eye they begin at it early in the morning and take it in a solemn sullen ugly manner standing always at a bar swallowing their spirits and saying nothing as they swallow it they drink often and to great excess but they carry it off without noise sitting down and ruminating over it with the everlasting cud within their jaws i believe that a stranger might go into the west and passing from hotel to hotel through a dozen of them might sit for hours at each in the large everlasting public hall and never have a word addressed to him no stranger should travel in the western states or indeed in any of the states without letters of introduction it is the custom of the country and they are easily procured without them everything is barren for men do not travel in the states of america as they do in europe to see scenery and visit the marvels of old cities which are open to all the world the social and political life of the americans must constitute the interest of the traveller 
and to these he can hardly make his way without introductions i cannot part with the west without saying in its favour that there is a certain manliness about its men which gives them a dignity of their own it is shown in that very indifference of which i have spoken whatever turns up the man is still there still unsophisticated and still unbroken it has seemed to me that no race of men requires less outward assistance than these pioneers of civilization they rarely amuse themselves food newspapers and brandy smashes suffice for life and while these last whatever may occur the man is still there in his manhood the fury of the mob does not shake him nor the stern countenance of his present martial tyrant alas i cannot stick to my text by calling him a just man intelligence energy and endurance are his virtues dirt dishonesty and morning drinks are his vices all native american women are intelligent it seems to be their birthright in the eastern cities they have in their upper classes superadded womanly grace to this intelligence and consequently they are charming as companions they are beautiful also and as i believe lack nothing that a lover can desire in his love but i cannot fancy myself much in love with a western lady or rather with a lady in the west they are as sharp as nails but then they are also as hard they know doubtless all that they ought to know but then they know so much more than they ought to know they are tyrants to their parents and never practise the virtue of obedience till they have half grown up daughters of their own they have faith in the destiny of their country if in nothing else but they believe that that destiny is to be worked out by the spirit and talent of the young women i confess that for me eve would have had no charms had she not recognized adam as her lord i can forgive her in that she tempted him to eat the apple had she come from the west country she would have ordered him to make his meal and then i could not have forgiven her st louis should be and still will be a town of great wealth to no city can have been given more means of riches i have spoken of the enormous mileage of water communication of which she is the centre the country around her produces indian corn wheat grasses hemp and tobacco coal is dug even within the boundaries of the city and iron mines are worked at a distance from it of a hundred miles the iron is so pure that it is broken off in solid blocks almost free from alloy and as the metal stands up on the earth's surface in the guise almost of a gigantic metal pillar instead of lying low within its bowels it is worked at a cheap rate and with great certainty nevertheless at the present moment the iron works of pilot knob as the place is called do not pay as far as i could learn nothing did pay except government contracts End of chapter 5chapter six part one of north america volume two by antony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain six cairo and camp wood part one to whatever period of life my days may be prolonged i do not think that i shall ever forget cairo i do not mean grand cairo which is also memorable in its way and a place not to be forgotten but cairo in the state of illinois which by native americans is always called caro an idea is prevalent in the states and i think i have heard the same broached in england that a popular british author had cairo state of illinois in his eye when under the name of eden he depicted a chosen happy spot on the mississippi river and told us how certain english immigrants fixed themselves in that locality and there made light of those little ills of life which are incident to humanity even in the garden of the valley of the mississippi but i doubt whether that author ever visited cairo in midwinter and i am sure that he never visited cairo when cairo was the seat of an american army had he done so his love of truth would have forbidden him to presume that even mark tapley could have enjoyed himself in such an eden i had no wish myself to go to cairo having heard it but indifferently spoken of by all men but my friend with whom i was travelling was peremptory in the matter he had heard of gunboats and mortar-boats of forts built upon the river of columbiads dahlgrens and parrots of all the pomps and circumstance of glorious war 
and entertained an idea that cairo was the nucleus or pivot of all really strategic movements in this terrible national struggle under such circumstances i was as it were forced to go to cairo and bore myself under the circumstances as much like mark tapley as my nature would permit i was not jolly while i was there certainly but i did not absolutely break down and perish in its mud cairo is the southern terminus of the illinois central railway there is but one daily arrival there namely at half-past four in the morning and but one dispatch which is at half-past three in the morning everything is thus done to assist that view of life which mark tapley took when he resolved to ascertain under what possible worst circumstances of existence he could still maintain his jovial character why anybody should ever arrive at cairo at half-past four a m i cannot understand the departure at any hour is easy of comprehension the place is situated exactly at the point at which the ohio and mississippi meet and is i should say merely guessing on the matter some ten or twelve feet lower than the winter level of the two rivers this gives it naturally a depressed appearance which must have much aided mark tapley in his endeavours who were the founders of cairo i have never ascertained they are probably buried fathoms deep in the mud and their names will no doubt remain a mystery to the latest ages they were brought thither i presume by the apparent water privileges of the place but the water privileges have been too much for them and by the excess of their powers have succeeded in drowning all the capital of the early cairovians and in throwing a wet blanket of thick moist glutinous dirt over all their energies the free state of illinois runs down far south between the slave states of kentucky to the east and of missouri to the west and is the most southern point of the continuous free soil territory of the northern states this point of it is a part of a district called egypt which is as fertile as the old country from whence it has borrowed a name but it suffers under those afflictions which are common to all newly settled lands which owe their fertility to the vicinity of great rivers fever and ague universally prevail men and women grow up with their lantern faces like spectres the children are prematurely old and the earth which is so fruitful is hideous in its fertility cairo and its immediate neighbourhood must i suppose have been subject to yearly inundation before it was settled up at present it is guarded on the shores of each river by high mud banks built so as to protect the point of land these are called the levees and do perform their duty by keeping out the body of the waters the shore between the banks is i believe never above breast deep with the inundation and from the circumstances of the place and the soft half liquid nature of the soil this inundation generally takes the shape of mud instead of water here at the very point has been built a town whether the town existed during mr tapley's time i have not been able to learn at the period of my visit it was falling quickly into ruin indeed i think i may pronounce it to have been on its last legs at that moment a galvanic motion had been pumped into it by the war movements of general halleck but the true bearings of the town as a town were not less plainly to be read on that account every street was absolutely impassable from mud i mean that in walking down the middle of any street in cairo a moderately framed man would soon stick fast and not be able to move the houses are generally built at considerable intervals and rarely face each other and along one side of each street a plank boarding was laid on which the mud had accumulated only up to one's ankles i walked all over cairo with big boots and with my trousers tucked up to my knees but at the crossings i found considerable danger and occasionally had my doubts as to the possibility of progress i was alone in my work and saw no one else making any such attempt a few only were moving about and they moved in wretched carts each drawn by two miserable floundering horses these carts were always empty but were presumed to be engaged in some way on military service no faces looked out at the windows of the houses no forms stood in the doorways a few shops were open but only in the drinking shops did i see customers in these silent muddy men were sitting not with drink before them as men sit with us but with the cud within their jaws ruminating their drinking is always done on foot they stand silent at a bar with two small glasses before them 
out of one they swallow the whiskey and from the other they take a gulp of water as though to rinse their mouths after that they again sit down and ruminate it was thus that men enjoyed themselves at cairo i cannot tell what was the existing population of cairo i asked one resident but he only shook his head and said that the place was about played out and a miserable play it must have been i tried to walk round the point on the levees but i found that the mud was so deep and slippery on that which protected the town from the mississippi that i could not move on it on the other which forms the bank of the ohio the railway runs and here was gathered all the life and movement of the place but the life was galvanic in its nature created by a war galvanism of which the shocks were almost neutralized by mud as cairo is of all towns in america the most desolate so is its hotel the most forlorn and wretched not that it lacked custom it was so full that no room was to be had on our first entry from the railway cars at five a m and we were reduced to the necessity of washing our hands and faces in the public washroom when i entered it the barber and his assistants were asleep there and four or five citizens from the railway were busy at the basins there is a fixed resolution in these places that you shall be drenched with dirt and drowned in abominations which is overpowering to a mind less strong than mark tapley's the filth is paraded and made to go as far as possible the stranger is spared none of the elements of nastiness i remember how an old woman once stood over me in my youth forcing me to swallow the gritty dregs of her terrible medicine cup the treatment i received in the hotel at cairo reminded me of that old woman in that room i did not dare to brush my teeth lest i should give offence and i saw at once that i was regarded with suspicion when i used my own comb instead of that provided for the public at length we got a room one room for the two i had become so depressed in spirits that i did not dare to object to this arrangement my friend could not complain much even to me feeling that these miseries had been produced by his own obstinacy it is a new phase of life he said that at any rate was true if nothing more be necessary for pleasurable excitement than a new phase of life i would recommend all who require pleasurable excitement to go to cairo they will certainly find a new phase of life but do not let them remain too long or they may find something beyond a new phase of life within a week of that time my friend was taking quinine looking hollow about the eyes and whispering to me of fever and ague to say that there was nothing eatable or drinkable in that hotel would be to tell that which will be understood without telling my friend however was a cautious man carrying with him comfortable tin pots hermetically sealed from fortnum and masons and on the second day of our sojourn we were invited by two officers to join their dinner at a cairo eating-house we ploughed our way gallantly through the mud to a little shanty at the door of which we were peremptorily demanded by the landlord to scrub ourselves before we entered with the stump of an old broom this we did producing on our nether persons the appearance of bread which has been carefully spread with treacle by an economic housekeeper and the proprietor was right for had we not done so the treacle would have run off through the whole house but after this we fared royally squirrel soup and prairie chickens regaled us one of our new friends had laid in his pockets with champagne and brandy the other with glasses and a corkscrew and as the bottle went round i began to feel something of the spirit of mark tapley in my soul but our visit to cairo had been made rather with reference to its present warlike character than with any eye to the natural beauties of the place a large force of men had been collected there and also a fleet of gunboats we had come there fortified with letters to generals and commodores and were prepared to go through a large amount of military inspection but the bird had flown before our arrival or rather the body and wings of the bird leaving behind only a draggled tail and a few of its feathers there were only a thousand soldiers at cairo when we were there that is a thousand stationed in the cairo sheds two regiments passed through the place during the time getting out of one steamer on to another or passing from the railway into boats one of these regiments passed before me down the slope of the river bank and the men as a body seemed to be healthy very many were drunk 
and all were mud-clogged up to their shoulders and very caps in other respects they appeared to be in good order it must be understood that these soldiers the volunteers had never been made subject to any discipline as to cleanliness they wore their hair long their hats or caps though all made in some military form and with some military appendants were various and ill-assorted they all were covered with loose thick blue-gray greatcoats which no doubt were warm and wholesome but which from their looseness and colour seemed to be peculiarly susceptible of receiving and showing a very large amount of mud their boots were always good but each man was shod as he liked many wore heavy overboots coming up the leg boots of excellent manufacture and from their cost if for no other reason quite out of reach of an english soldier boots in which a man would not be at all unfortunate to find himself hunting but from these or from their high lows shoes or whatever they might wear the mud had never been even scraped these men were all warmly clothed but clothed apparently with an endeavour to contract as much mud as might be possible the generals and commodores were gone up the ohio river and up the tennessee in an expedition with gunboats which turned out to be successful and of which we have all read in the daily history of this war they had departed the day before our arrival and though we still found at cairo a squadron of gunboats if gunboats go in squadrons the bulk of the army had been moved there was left there one regiment and one colonel who kindly described to us the battles he had fought and gave us permission to see everything that was to be seen four of these gunboats were still lying in the ohio close under the terminus of the railway with their flat ugly noses against the muddy bank and we were shown over two of them they certainly seemed to be formidable weapons for river warfare and to have been got up quite irrespective of expense so much indeed may be said for the americans throughout the war they cannot be accused of parsimony the largest of these vessels called the benton had cost thirty six thousand pounds these boats are made with sides sloping inwards at an angle of forty five degrees the iron is two and a half inches thick and it has not i believe been calculated that this will resist cannon shot of great weight should it be struck in a direct line but the angle of the size of the boat makes it improbable that any such shot should strike them and the iron bedded as it is upon oak is supposed to be sufficient to turn a shot that does not hit it in a direct line the boats are also roofed in with iron and the pilots who steer the vessel stand encased as it were under an iron cupola i imagine that these boats are well calculated for the river service for which they have been built six or seven of them had gone up the tennessee river the day before we reached cairo and while we were there they succeeded in knocking down fort henry and in carrying off the soldiers stationed there and the officer in command one of the boats however had been penetrated by a shot which made its way into the boiler and the men on deck six i think in number were scalded to death by the escaping steam the two pilots up in the cupola were destroyed in this terrible manner as they were altogether closed in by the iron roof and sides there was no escape for the steam the boats however were well made and very powerfully armed and will probably succeed in driving the secessionist armies away from the great river banks by what machinery the secessionist armies are to be followed into the interior is altogether another question but there was also another fleet at cairo and we were informed that we were just in time to see the first essay made attesting the utility of this armada it consisted of no less than thirty-eight mortar-boats each of which had cost seventeen hundred pounds these mortar-boats were broad flat-bottomed rafts each constructed with a deck raised three feet above the bottom they were protected by high iron sides supposed to be proof against rifle balls and when supplied had been furnished each with a little boat a rope and four rough sweeps or oars they had no other furniture or belongings and were to be moved either by steam tugs or by the use of the long oars which were sent with them it was intended that one thirteen-inch mortar of enormous weight should be put upon each that these mortars should be fired with twenty-three pounds of powder and that the shell thrown should at a distance of three miles fall with absolute precision into any devoted town which the rebels might hold on the river banks the grandeur of the idea is almost sublime so large an amount of powder had i imagine never then been used for the single charge in any instrument of war 
and when we were told that thirty-eight of them were to play at once on a city and that they could be used with absolute precision it seemed as though the fate of sodom and gomorrah could not be worse than the fate of that city could any city be safe when such implements of war were about upon the waters but when we came to inspect the motor-boats our misgivings as to any future destination for this fleet were relieved and our admiration was given to the smartness of the contractor who had secured to himself the job of building them in the first place they had all leaked till the spaces between the bottoms and the decks were filled with water this space had been intended for ammunition but now seemed hardly to be fitted for that purpose the officer who was about to test them by putting a mortar into one and by firing it off with twenty-three pounds of powder had the water pumped out of a selected raft and we were towed by a steam-tug from their moorings a mile up the river down to the spot where the mortar lay ready to be lifted in by a derrick but as we turned on the river the tug-boat which had brought us down was unable to hold us up against the force of the stream a second tug-boat was at hand and with one on each side we were just able in half an hour to recover the one hundred yards which we had lost down the river the pressure against the stream was so great owing partly to the weight of the raft and partly to the fact that its flat head buried itself in the water that it was almost immovable against the stream although the mortar was not yet on it it soon became manifest that no trial could be made on that day and so we were obliged to leave cairo without having witnessed the firing of the great gun my belief is that very little evil to the enemy will result from those mortar-boats and that they cannot be used with much effect since that time they have been used on the mississippi but as yet we do not know with what result island number ten has been taken but i do not know that the mortar-boats contributed much to that success the enormous cost of moving them against the stream of the river is in itself a barrier to their use when we saw them and then they were quite new many of the rivets were already gone the small boats had been stolen from some of them and the ropes and oars from others there they lay thirty-eight in number up against the mud banks of the ohio under the boughs of the half-clad melancholy forest trees as sad a spectacle of reckless prodigality as the eye ever beheld but the contractor who made them no doubt was a smart man this armada was moored on the ohio against the low reedy bank a mile above the levee where the old unchanged forest of nature came down to the very edge of the river and mixed itself with the shallow overflowing waters i am wrong in saying that it lay under the boughs of the trees for such trees do not spread themselves out with broad branches they stand thickly together broken stunted spongy with rot straight and ugly with ragged tops and shattered arms seemingly decayed but still ever renewing themselves with the rapid moist life of luxuriant forest vegetation nothing to my eyes is sadder than the monotonous desolation of such scenery we in england when we read and speak of the primeval forests of america are apt to form pictures in our minds of woodland glades with spreading oaks and green mossy turf beneath of scenes than which nothing that god has given us is more charming but these forests are not after that fashion they offer no allurement to the lover no solace to the melancholy man of thought the ground is deep with mud or overflown with water the soil and the river have no defined margins each tree though full of the forms of life has all the appearance of death even to the outward eye they seem to be laden with ague fever sudden chills and pestilential malaria when we first visited the spot we were alone and we walked across from the railway line to the place at which the boats were moored they lay in treble rank along the shore and immediately above them an old steamboat was fastened against the bank her back was broken and she was given up to ruin placed there that she might rot quietly into her watery grave it was midwinter and every tree was covered with frozen sleet and small particles of snow which had drizzled through the air for the snow had not fallen in hearty honest flakes the ground beneath our feet was crisp with frost but traitorous in its crispness not frozen manfully so as to bear a man's weight but ready at every point to let him through into the fat glutinous mud below i never saw a sadder picture or one which did more to awaken pity for those whose fate had fixed their abodes in such a locality and yet there was a beauty about it too a melancholy death-like beauty 
the disordered ruin and confused decay of the forest was all gemmed with particles of ice the eye reaching through the thin underwood could form for itself picturesque shapes and solitary bowers of broken wood which were bright with the opaque brightness of the hoar-frost the great river ran noiselessly along rapid but still with an apparent lethargy in its waters the ground beneath our feet was fertile beyond compare but as yet fertile to death rather than to life where we then trod man had not yet come with his axe and his plough but the railroad was close to us and within a mile of the spot thousands of dollars had been spent in raising a city which was to have been rich with the united wealth of the rivers and the land hitherto fever and ague mud and malaria had been too strong for man and the dollars had been spent in vain the day however will come when this promontory between the two great rivers will be a fit abode for industry men will settle there wandering down from the north and east and toil sadly and leave their bones among the mud thin pale-faced joyless mothers will come there and grow old before their time and sickly children will be born struggling up with wan faces to their sad life's labour but the work will go on for it is god's work and the earth will be prepared for the people and the fat rottenness of the still living forest will be made to give forth its riches we found that two days at cairo were quite enough for us we had seen the gunboats and the mortar-boats and had gone through the sheds of the soldiers the latter were bad comfortless damp and cold and certain quarters of the officers into which we were hospitably taken were wretched abodes enough but the sheds of cairo did not stink like those of benton barracks at st louis nor had illness been prevalent there to the same degree i do not know why this should have been so but such was the result of my observation the locality of benton barracks must from its nature have been more healthy but it had become by art the foulest place i ever visited throughout the army it seemed to be the fact that the men under canvas were more comfortable in better spirits and also in better health than those who were lodged in sheds we had inspected the cairo army and the cairo navy and had also seen all that cairo had to show us of its own we were thoroughly disgusted with the hotel and retired on the second night to bed giving positive orders that we might be called at half-past two with reference to that terrible start to be made at half-past three as a matter of course we kept dozing and waking till past one in our fear lest neglect on the part of the watcher should entail on us another day at this place of course we went fast to sleep about the time at which we should have roused ourselves and of course we were called just fifteen minutes before the train started everybody knows how these things always go and then the pair of us jumping out of bed in that wretched chamber went through the mockery of washing and packing which always takes place on such occasions a mockery indeed of washing for there was but one basin between us and a mockery also of packing for i left my hair-brushes behind me cairo was avenged in that i had declined to avail myself of the privileges of free citizenship which had been offered to me in that barber's shop and then while we were in our agony pulling at the straps of our portmanteau and swearing at the faithlessness of the boots up came the clerk of the hotel the great man from behind the bar and scolded us prodigiously for our delay called we had been called an hour ago which statement however was decidedly untrue as we remarked not with extreme patience we should certainly be late he said it would take us five minutes to reach the train and the cars would be off in four nobody who has not experienced them can understand the agonies of such moments of such moments as regards travelling in general but none who have not been at cairo can understand the extreme agony produced by the threat of a prolonged sojourn in that city at last we were out of the house rushing through the mud slush and half-melted snow along the wooden track to the railway laden with bags and coats and deafened by that melancholy wailing sound as though of a huge polar she-bear in the pangs of travel upon an iceberg which proceeds from an american railway engine before it commences its work how we slipped and stumbled and splashed and swore rushing along in the dark night with buttons loose and our clothes half on and how pitilessly we were treated we gained our cars and even succeeded in bringing with us our luggage but we did not do so with the sympathy but amidst the derision of the bystanders 
and then the seats were all full and we found that there was a lower depth even in the terrible deep of a railway train in a western state there was a second-class carriage prepared i presume for those who esteemed themselves too dirty for association with the aristocracy of cairo and into this we flung ourselves even this was a joy to us for we were being carried away from eden we had acknowledged ourselves to be no fitting colleagues for mark tapley and would have been glad to escape from cairo even had we worked our way out of the place as assisted stokers to the engine driver poor cairo unfortunate cairo it is about played out said its citizen to me but in truth the play was commenced a little too soon those players have played out but another set will yet have their innings and make a score that shall perhaps be talked of far and wide in the western world End of chapter 6 part 1chapter six part two of north america volume two by antony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain six cairo and camp wood part two we were still bent upon army inspection and with this purpose went back from cairo to louisville in kentucky i had passed through louisville before as i told in my last chapter but had not gone south from louisville towards the green river and had seen nothing of general buell's soldiers i should have mentioned before that when we were at st louis we asked general halleck the officer in command of the northern army of missouri whether he could allow us to pass through his lines to the south this he assured us he was forbidden to do at the same time offering us every facility in his power for such an expedition if we could obtain the consent of mr seward who at that time had apparently succeeded in engrossing into his own hands for the moment supreme authority in all matters of government before leaving washington we had determined not to ask mr seward having but little hope of obtaining his permission and being unwilling to encounter his refusal before going to general halleck we had considered the question of visiting the land of dixie without permission from any of the men in authority i ascertained that this might easily have been done from kentucky to tennessee but that it could only be done on foot there are very few available roads running north and south through these states the railways came before roads and even where the railways are far asunder almost all the traffic of the country takes itself to them preferring a long circuitous conveyance with steam to short distances without consequently such roads as there are run laterally to the railways meeting them at this point or that and thus maintaining the communication of the country now the railways were of course in the hands of the armies the few direct roads leading from north to south were in the same condition and the by-roads were impassable from mud the frontier of the north therefore though very extended was not very easily to be passed unless as i have said before by men on foot for myself i confess that i was anxious to go south but not to do so without my coats and trousers or shirts and pocket handkerchiefs the readiest way of getting across the line and the way which was i believe the most frequently used was from below baltimore and maryland by boat across the potomac but in this there was a considerable danger of being taken and i had no desire to become a state prisoner in the hands of mr seward under circumstances which would have justified our minister in asking for my release only as a matter of favour therefore when at st louis i gave up all hopes of seeing dixie during my present stay in america i presume it to be generally known that dixie is the negro's heaven and that the southern slave states in which it is presumed that they have found a paradise have since the beginning of the war been so named we remained a few days at louisville and were greatly struck with the natural beauty of the country around it indeed as far as i was enabled to see kentucky has superior attractions as a place of rural residence for an english gentleman to any other state in the union there is nothing of the landscape there equal to the banks of the upper mississippi or to some parts of the hudson river it has none of the wild grandeur of the white mountains of new hampshire nor does it break itself into valleys equal to those of the alleghanies in pennsylvania but all those are beauties for the tourist rather than for the resident in kentucky the land lies in knolls and soft sloping hills 
the trees stand apart forming forest openings the herbage is rich and the soil though not fertile like the prairies of illinois or the river bottoms of the mississippi and its tributaries is good steadfast wholesome farming ground it is a fine country for a resident gentleman farmer and in its outward aspect reminds me more of england in its rural aspects than any other state which i visited round louisville there are beautiful sites for houses of which advantage in some instances has been taken but nevertheless louisville though a well-built handsome city is not now a thriving city i liked it because the hotel was above par and because the country round it was good for walking but it has not advanced as cincinnati and st louis have advanced and yet its position on the ohio is favorable and it is well circumstanced as regards the wants of its own state but it is not a free soil city nor indeed is st louis but st louis is tending that way and has but little to do with the domestic institution at the hotels in cincinnati and st louis you are served by white men and are very badly served at louisville the ministration is by black men bound to labor the difference in the comfort is very great the white servants are noisy dirty forgetful indifferent and sometimes impudent the negroes are the very reverse of all this you cannot hurry them but in all other respects and perhaps even in that respect also they are good servants this is the work for which they seem to have been intended but nevertheless where they are life and energy seem to languish and prosperity cannot make any true advance they are symbols of the luxury of the white men who employ them and as such are signs of decay and emblems of decreasing power they are good laborers themselves but their very presence makes labor dishonorable that kentucky will speedily rid herself of the institution i believe firmly when she has done so the commercial city of that state may perhaps go ahead again like her sisters at this very time the federal army was commencing that series of active movements in kentucky and through tennessee which led to such important results and gave to the north the first solid victories which they had gained since the contest began on the nineteenth of january one wing of general buell's army under general thomas had defeated the secessionists near somerset in the southeastern district of kentucky under general zollicoffer who was there killed but in that action the attack was made by zollicoffer and the secessionists when we were at louisville we heard of the success of the gunboat expedition up the tennessee river by which fort henry was taken fort henry had been built by the confederates on the tennessee exactly on the confines of the states of tennessee and kentucky they had also another fort fort donelson on the cumberland river which at that point runs parallel to the tennessee and is there distant from it but a very few miles both these rivers run into the ohio nashville which is the capital of tennessee is higher up on the cumberland and it was now intended to send the gunboats down the tennessee back into the ohio and thence up the cumberland there to attack fort donelson and afterwards to assist general buell's army in making its way down to nashville the gunboats were attached to general halleck's army and received their directions from st louis general buell's headquarters were at louisville and his advanced position was on the green river on the line of the railway from louisville to nashville the secessionists had destroyed the railway bridge over the green river and were now lying at bowling green between the green river and nashville this place it was understood that they had fortified matters were in this position when we got a military pass to go down by the railway to the army on the green river for the railway was open to no one without a military pass and we started trusting that providence would supply us with rations and quarters an officer attached to general buell's staff with whom however our acquaintance was of the very slightest had telegraphed down to say that we were coming i cannot say that i expected much from the message seeing that it simply amounted to a very thin introduction to a general officer to whom we were strangers even by name from a gentleman to whom we had brought a note from another gentleman whose acquaintance we had chanced to pick up on the road we manifestly had no right to expect much but to us expecting very little very much was given general johnson was the officer to whose care we were confided he being a brigadier under general mccook who commanded the advance 
we were met by an aide-de-camp and saddle-horses and soon found ourselves in the general's tent or rather in a shanty formed of solid upright wooden logs driven into the ground with the bark still on and having the insturtices filled in with clay this was roofed with canvas and altogether made a very eligible military residence the general slept in a big box about nine feet long and four broad which occupied one end of the shanty and he seemed in all his fixings to be as comfortably put up as any gentleman might be when out on such a picnic as this we arrived in time for dinner which was brought in table and all by two negroes the party was made up by a doctor who carved and two of the staff and a very nice dinner we had in half an hour we were intimate with the whole party and as familiar with the things around us as though we had been living in tents all our lives indeed i had by this time been so often in the tents of the northern army that i almost felt entitled to make myself at home it has seemed to me that an englishman has always been made welcome in these camps there has been and is at this moment a terribly bitter feeling among americans against england and i have heard this expressed quite as loudly by men in the army as by civilians but i think i may say that this has never been brought to bear upon individual intercourse certainly we have said some very sharp things of them words which whether true or false whether deserved or undeserved must have been offensive to them i have known this feeling of offence to amount almost to an agony of anger but nevertheless i have never seen any falling off in the hospitality and courtesy generally shown by a civilized people to passing visitors i have argued the matter of england's course throughout the war till i have been hoarse with asseverating the rectitude of her conduct and her national unselfishness i have met very strong opponents on the subject and have been coerced into loud strains of voice but i never yet met one american who was personally uncivil to me as an englishman or who seemed to be made personally angry by my remarks i found no coldness in that hospitality to which as a stranger i was entitled because of the national ill-feeling which circumstances have engendered and while on this subject i will remark that when travelling i have found it expedient to let those with whom i might chance to talk know at once that i was an englishman in fault of such knowledge things would be said which could not but be disagreeable to me but not even from any rough western enthusiast in a railway carriage have i ever heard a word spoken insolently to england after i had made my nationality known i have learned that wellington was beaten at waterloo that lord palmerston was so unpopular that he could not walk alone in the streets that the house of commons was an acknowledged failure that starvation was the normal condition of the british people and that the queen was a bloodthirsty tyrant but these assertions were not made with the intention that they should be heard by an englishman to us as a nation they are at the present moment unjust almost beyond belief but i do not think that the feeling has ever taken the guise of personal discourtesy we spent two days in the camp close upon the green river and i do not know that i enjoyed any days of my trip more thoroughly than i did these in truth for the last month since i had left washington my life had not been one of enjoyment i had been rolling in mud and had been damp with filth camp wood as they called this military settlement on the green river was also muddy but we were excellently well mounted the weather was very cold but peculiarly fine and the soldiers around us as far as we could judge seemed to be better off in all respects than those we had visited at st louis at rolla or at cairo they were all intense and seemed to be light-spirited and happy their rations were excellent but so much may i think be said of the whole northern army from alexandria on the potomac to springfield in the west of missouri there was very little illness at that time in the camp in kentucky and the reports made to us led us to think that on the whole this had been the most healthy division of the army the men moreover were less muddy than their brethren either east or west of them at any rate this may be said of them as regards the infantry but perhaps the greatest charm of the place to me was the beauty of the scenery the green river at this spot is as picturesque a stream as i ever remember to have seen in such a country it lies low down between high banks and curves hither and thither never keeping a straight line its banks are wooded but not as is so common in america by continuous stunted uninteresting forest 
but by large single trees standing on small patches of meadow by the waterside, with the high banks rising over them with glades through them open for the horsemen. The rides here in summer must be very lovely. Even in winter they were so, and made me in love with the place in spite of that brown, dull, barren aspect which the presence of an army always creates. I have said that the railway bridge which crossed the Green River at this spot had been destroyed by the secessionists. This had been done effectually as regarded the passage of trains, but only in part as regarded the absolute fabric of the bridge. It had been, and still was, when I saw it, a beautifully light construction, made of iron and supported over a valley rather than over a river on tall stone piers. One of these piers had been blown up, but when we were there the bridge had been repaired with beams and wooden shafts. This had just been completed, and an engine had passed over it. I must confess that it looked to me most perilously insecure, but the eye uneducated in such mysteries is a bad judge of engineering work. I passed with a horse backwards and forwards on it, and it did not tumble down then. But I confess that on the first attempt I was glad enough to lead the horse by the bridle. The bridge was certainly a beautiful fabric, and built in a most lovely spot. Immediately under it there was also a pontoon bridge. The tents of General McCook's division were immediately at the northern end of it, and the whole place was alive with soldiers, nailing down planks, pulling up temporary rails at each side, carrying over straw for the horses, and preparing for the general advance of the troops. It was a glorious day. There had been heavy frost at night, but the air was dry, and the sun, though cold, was bright. I do not know when I saw a prettier picture. It would perhaps have been nothing without the loveliness of the river scenery, but the winding of the stream at the spot, the sharp wooded hills on each side, the forest openings, and the busy, eager, strange life together filled the place with no common interest. The officers of the army at the spot spoke with bitterest condemnation of the vandalism of their enemy in destroying the bridge. The justice of the indignation I ventured very strongly to question— "'Surely you would have destroyed their bridge,' I said. "'But they are rebels,' was the answer. "'It had been so throughout the contest, "'and the same argument has been held by soldiers and by non-soldiers, "'by women and by men. "'Grant that they are rebels,' I have answered. "'But when rebels fight, they cannot be expected to be more scrupulous "'in their mode of doing so than their enemies who are not rebels.' The whole population of the North has, from the beginning of this war, considered themselves entitled to all the privileges of belligerence, but have called their enemies Goths and Vandals for even claiming those privileges for themselves. The same feeling was at the bottom of their animosity against England. Because the South was in rebellion, England should have consented to allow the North to assume all the rights of a belligerent, and should have denied all those rights to the South. Nobody has seemed to understand that any privilege which a belligerent can claim must depend on the very fact of his being in an encounter with some other party having the same privilege. Our press has animadverted very strongly on the state's government for the apparent untruthfulness of their arguments on this matter. But I profess that I believe that Mr. Seward and his colleagues, and not they only but the whole nation, have so thoroughly deceived themselves on this subject have so talked and speechified themselves into a misunderstanding of the matter, that they have taught themselves to think that the men of the South could be entitled to no consideration from any quarter. To have rebelled against the stars and stripes seems to a northern man to be a crime putting the criminal altogether out of all courts, a crime which should have armed the hands of all men against him, as the hands of all men are armed at a dog that is mad, or a tiger that has escaped from its keeper. It is singular that such a people, a people that has founded itself on rebellion, should have such a horror of rebellion. But, as far as my observation may have enabled me to read their feelings rightly, I do believe that it has been as sincere as it is irrational. We were out riding early on the morning of the second day of our sojourn in the camp, and met the division of General Mitchell, a detachment of General Buell's army, which had been in camp between the Green River and Louisville, going forward to the bridge which was then being prepared for their passage. This division consisted of about 12,000 men, and the road was crowded throughout the whole day with them and their wagons. We first passed a regiment of cavalry which appeared to be endless. 
their cavalry regiments are in general more numerous than those of the infantry and on this occasion we saw i believe about twelve hundred men pass by us their horses were strong and serviceable and the men were stout and in good health but the general appearance of everything about them was rough and dirty the american cavalry have always looked to me like brigands a party of them would i think make a better picture than an equal number of our dragoons but if they are to be regarded in any other view than that of the picturesque it does not seem to me that they have been got up successfully on this occasion they were forming themselves into a picture for my behoof and as the picture was as a picture very good i at least have no reason to complain we were taken to see one german regiment a regiment of which all the privates were german and all the officers save one i think the surgeon we saw the men in their tents and the food which they eat and were disposed to think that hitherto things were going well with them in the evening the colonel and lieutenant colonel both of whom had been in the prussian service if i remember rightly came up to the general's quarters and we spent the evening together in smoking cigars and discussing slavery around the stove i shall never forget that night or the vehement abolition enthusiasm of the two german colonels our host had told us that he was a slave owner and as our wants were supplied by two sable ministers i concluded that he had brought with him a portion of his domestic institution under such circumstances i myself should have avoided such a subject having been taught to believe that southern gentlemen did not generally take delight in open discussions on the subject but had we been arguing the question of the population of the planet jupiter or the final possibility of the transmutation of metals the matter could not have been handled with less personal feeling the germans however spoke the sentiments of all the germans of the western states that is of all the protestant germans and to them is confined the political influence held by the german immigrants they all regard slavery as an evil holding on the matter opinions quite as strong as ours have ever been and they argue that as slavery is an evil it should therefore be abolished at once their opinions are as strong as ours have ever been and they have not had our west indian experience any one desiring to understand the present political position of the states should realize the fact of the present german influence on the political questions many say that the present president was returned by german voters in one sense this is true for he certainly could not have been returned without them but for them or for their assistance mr breckinridge would have been president and this civil war would not have come to pass as abolitionists they are much more powerful than the republicans of new england and also more in earnest in new england the matter is discussed politically in the great western towns where the germans congregate by thousands they profess to view it philosophically a man as a man is entitled to freedom that is their argument and it is a very old one when you ask them what they would propose to do with four million of enfranchised slaves and with their ruined masters how they would manage the affairs of those twelve million of people all whose wealth and work and very life have hitherto been hinged and hung upon slavery they again ask you whether slavery is not in itself bad and whether anything acknowledged to be bad should be allowed to remain but the american germans are in earnest and i am strongly of opinion that they will so far have their way that the country which for the future will be their country will exist without the taint of slavery in the northern nationality which will reform itself after this war is over there will i think be no slave state that final battle of abolition will have to be fought among a people apart and i must fear that while it lasts their national prosperity will not be great End of chapter six chapter seven part one of north america volume two by antony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain seven the army of the north part one i trust that it may not be thought that in this chapter i am going to take upon myself the duties of a military critic i am well aware that i have no capacity for such a task and that my opinion on such matters would be worth nothing but it is impossible to write of the american states as they were when i visited them and to leave that subject of the american army untouched 
it was all but impossible to remain for some months in the northern states without visiting the army it was impossible to join in any conversation in the states without talking about the army it was impossible to make inquiry as to the present and future condition of the people without basing such inquiries more or less upon the doings of the army if a stranger visit manchester with the object of seeing what sort of place manchester is he must visit the cotton mills and printing establishments though he may have no taste for cotton and no knowledge on the subject of calicoes under pressure of this kind i have gone about from one army to another looking at the drilling of regiments of the manoeuvres of cavalry at the practice of artillery and at the inner life of the camps i do not feel that i am in any more degree fitted to take the command of a campaign than i was before i began or even more fitted to say who can and who cannot do so but i have obtained on my own mind's eye a tolerably clear impression of the outward appearance of the northern army i have endeavoured to learn something of the manner in which it was brought together and of its cost as it now stands and i have learned as any man in the states may learn without much trouble or personal investigation how terrible has been the peculation of the contractors and officers by whom that army has been supplied of these things writing of the states at this moment i must say something in what i shall say as to that matter of peculation i trust that i may be believed to have spoken without personal ill-feeling or individual malice while i was travelling in the states of new england and in the northwest i came across various camps at which young regiments were being drilled and new regiments were being formed these lay in our way as we made our journeys and therefore we visited them but they were not objects of any very great interest the men had not acquired even any pretense of soldier-like bearing the officers for the most part had only just been selected having hardly as yet left their civil occupations and anything like criticism was disarmed by the very nature of the movement which had called the men together i then thought as i still think that the men themselves were actuated by proper motives and often by very high motives in joining the regiments no doubt they looked to the pay offered it is not often that men are able to devote themselves to patriotism without any reference to their personal circumstances a man has got before him the necessity of earning his bread and very frequently the necessity of earning the bread of others besides himself this comes before him not only as his first duty but as the very law of his existence his wages are his life and when he proposes to himself to serve his country that subject of payment comes uppermost as it does when he proposes to serve any other master but the wages given though very high in comparison with those of any other army have not been of a nature to draw together from their distant homes at so short a notice so vast a cloud of men had no other influence been at work as far as i can learn the average rate of wages in the country since the war began has been about sixty-five cents a day over and beyond the workman's diet i feel convinced that i am putting this somewhat too low taking the average of all the markets from which the labor has been withdrawn in the large cities labor has been higher than this and a considerable portion of the army has been taken from large cities but taking sixty-five cents a day as the average labor has been worth about seventeen dollars a month over and above the laborer's diet in the army a soldier receives thirteen dollars a month and also receives his diet and clothes in addition to this in many states six dollars a month have been paid by the state to the wives and families of those soldiers who have left wives and families in the states behind them thus for the married men the wages given by the army have been two dollars a month or less than five pounds a year more than his earnings at home and for the unmarried man they have been four dollars a month or less than ten pounds a year below his earnings at home but the army also gives clothing to the extent of three dollars a month this would place the unmarried soldier in a pecuniary point of view worse off by one dollar a month or two pounds ten shillings a year than he would have been at home and would give the married man five dollars a month or twelve pounds a year more than his ordinary wages for absenting himself from his family i cannot think therefore that the pecuniary attractions have been very great our soldiers in england enlist at wages which are about one-half that paid in the ordinary labor market to the class from whence they come but labor in england is uncertain whereas in the states it is certain in england the soldier with his shillings gets better food than the laborer with his two shillings 
and the Englishman has no objection to the rigidity of that discipline which is so distasteful to an American. Moreover, who in England ever dreamed of raising six hundred thousand new troops in six months out of a population of thirty million? But this has been done in the northern states out of a population of eighteen million. If England were invaded, Englishmen would come forward in the same way, actuated, as I believe, by the same high motives. My object here is simply to show that the American soldiers have not been drawn together by the prospect of high wages, as has been often said since the war began. They who inquire closely into the matter will find that hundreds and thousands have joined the army as privates, who in doing so have abandoned all their best worldly prospects, and have consented to begin the game of life again, believing that their duty to their country has now required their services. The fact has been that in the different states a spirit of rivalry has been excited. Indiana has endeavored to show that she was as forward as Illinois. Pennsylvania has been unwilling to lag behind New York. Massachusetts, who has always struggled to be foremost in peace, has desired to boast that she was first in war also. The smaller states have resolved to make their names heard, and those which at first were backward in sending troops have been shamed into greater earnestness by the public voice. There has been a general feeling throughout the people that the thing should be done, that the rebellion must be put down, and that it must be put down by arms. Young men have been ashamed to remain behind, and their elders, acting under that glow of patriotism which so often warms the hearts of free men, but which perhaps does not often remain there long in all its heat, have left their wives and have gone also. It may be true that the voice of the majority has been coercive on many, that men have enlisted partly because the public voice required it of them, and not entirely through the promptings of individual spirit. Such public voice in America is very potent, but it is not, I think, true that the army has been gathered together by the hope of high wages. Such was my opinion of the men when I saw them from state to state clustering into their new regiments. They did not look like soldiers. But I regarded them as men earnestly intent on a work which they believed to be right. Afterwards, when I saw them in their camps, amidst all the pomps and circumstances of glorious war, positively converted into troops, armed with real rifles and doing actual military service, I believed the same of them, but cannot say that I liked them so well. Good motives had brought them there. They were the same men, or men of the same class that I had seen before. They were doing just that which I knew they would have to do but still I found that the more I saw of them, the more I lost of that respect for them which I had once felt. I think it was their dirt that chiefly operated upon me. Then, too, they had hitherto done nothing, and they seemed to be so terribly intent upon their rations. The great boast of this army was that they eat meat twice a day, and that their daily supply of bread was more than they could consume. When I had been two or three weeks in Washington, I went over to the Army of the Potomac and spent a few days with some of the officers. I had on previous occasions ridden about the camps and had seen a review at which General McClellan trotted up and down the lines with all his numerous staff at his heels. I have always believed reviews to be absurdly useless as regards the purpose for which they are avowedly got up, that, namely, of military inspection, and I believed this especially of this review— I do not believe that any commander-in-chief ever learns much as to the excellence or deficiencies of his troops by watching their maneuvers on a vast open space. But I felt sure that General McClellan had learned nothing on this occasion. If before his review he did not know whether his men were good as soldiers, he did not possess any such knowledge after the review. If the matter may be regarded as a review of the general— if the object was to show him off to the men that they might know how well he rode and how grand he looked with his staff of forty or fifty officers at his heels, then this review must be considered as satisfactory. General McClellan does ride very well. So much I learned, and no more. It was necessary to have a pass for crossing the Potomac either from one side or from the other, and such a pass I procured from a friend in the war office, good for the whole period of my sojourn in Washington. The wording of the pass was more than ordinarily long, as it recommended me to the special courtesy of all whom I might encounter, but in this respect it was injurious to me rather than otherwise, as every picket by whom I was stopped found it necessary to read it to the end. 
the paper was almost invariably returned to me without a word but the musket which was not unfrequently kept extended across my horse's nose by the reader's comrade would be withdrawn and then i would ride on to the next barrier it seemed to me that these passes were so numerous and were signed by so many officers that there could have been no risk in forging them the army of the potomac into which they admitted the bearer lay in quarters which were extended over a length of twenty miles up and down on the virginian side of the river and the river could be traversed at five different places crowds of men and women were going over daily and no doubt all the visitors who so went with innocent purposes were provided with proper passports but any whose purposes were not innocent and who were not so provided could have passed the pickets with counterfeited orders this i have little doubt was done daily washington was full of secessionists and every movement of the federal army was communicated to the confederates at richmond at which city was now established the congress and headquarters of the confederacy but no such tidings of the confederate army reached those in command at washington there were many circumstances in the contest which led to this result and i do not think that general mcclellan had any power to prevent it his system of passes certainly did not do so i never could learn from any one what was the true number of this army on the potomac i have been informed by those who profess to know that it contained over two hundred thousand men and by others who also profess to know that it did not contain one hundred thousand to me the soldiers seemed to be innumerable hanging like locusts over the whole country a swarm desolating everything around them those pomps and circumstances are not glorious in my eyes they affect me with a melancholy which i cannot avoid soldiers gathered together in a camp are uncouth and ugly when they are idle and when they are at work their work is worse than idleness when i have seen a thousand men together moving their feet hither at one sound and thither at another throwing their muskets about awkwardly prodding at the air with their bayonets trotting twenty paces here and backing ten paces there wheeling round in uneven lines and looking as they did so miserably conscious of the absurdity of their own performances i have always been inclined to think how little the world can have advanced in civilization while grown-up men are still forced to spend their days in such grotesque performances those to whom the pomps and circumstances are dear nay those by whom they are considered simply necessary will be able to confute me by a thousand arguments i readily own myself confuted there must be soldiers and soldiers must be taught but not the less pitiful is it to see men of thirty undergoing the goose step and tortured by orders as to the proper mode of handling a long instrument which is half gun and half spear in the days of hector and ajax the thing was done in a more picturesque manner and the songs of battle should i think be confined to those ages the ground occupied by the divisions on the further or southwestern side of the potomac was as i have said about twenty miles in length and perhaps seven in breadth through the whole of this district the soldiers were everywhere the tents of the various brigades were clustered together in streets the regiments being divided and the divisions combining the brigades lay apart at some distance from each other but everywhere at all points there were some signs of military life the roads were continually thronged with wagons and tracks were opened for horses wherever a shorter way might thus be made available on every side the trees were falling or had fallen in some places whole woods had been felled with the express purpose of rendering the ground impracticable for troops and firs and pines lay one over the other still covered with their dark rough foliage as though a mighty forest had grown there along the ground without any power to raise itself towards the heavens in other places the trees had been chopped off from their trunks about a yard from the ground so that the soldier who cut it should have no trouble in stooping and the tops had been dragged away for firewood or for the erection of screens against the wind here and there in solitary places there were outlying tents looking as though each belonged to some military recluse and in the neighborhood of every division was to be found a photographing establishment upon wheels in order that the men might send home to their sweethearts pictures of themselves in their martial costumes i wandered about through these camps both on foot and on horseback day after day and every now and then i would come upon a farmhouse that was still occupied by its old inhabitants many of such houses had been deserted and were now held by the senior officers of the army 
but some of the old families remained living in the midst of this scene of war in a condition most forlorn as for any tillage of their land that under such circumstances might be pronounced as hopeless nor could there exist encouragement for farm work of any kind fences had been taken down and burned the ground had been overrun in every direction the stock had of course disappeared it had not been stolen but had been sold in a hurry for what under such circumstances it might fetch what farmer could work or have any hope for his land in the middle of such a crowd of soldiers but yet there were the families the women were in their houses and the children playing at their doors and the men with whom i sometimes spoke would stand around with their hands in their pockets they knew that they were ruined they expected no redress in nine cases out of ten they were inimical in spirit to the soldiers around them and yet it seemed that their equanimity was never disturbed in a former chapter i have spoken of a certain general not a fighting general of the army but a local farming general who spoke loudly and with many curses of the injury inflicted on him by the secessionists with that exception i heard no loud complaint of personal suffering these virginian farmers must have been deprived of everything of the very means of earning bread they still hold by their houses though they were in the very thick of the war because there they had shelter for their families and elsewhere they might seek it in vain a man cannot move his wife and children if he have no place to which to move them even though his house be in the midst of disease of pestilence or of battle so it was with them then but it seemed as though they were already used to it but there was a class of inhabitants in that same country to whom fate had been even more unkind than to those whom i saw the lines of the northern army extended perhaps seven or eight miles from the potomac and the lines of the confederate army were distant some four miles from those of their enemies there was therefore an intervening space or strip of ground about four miles broad which might be said to be no man's land it was no man's land as to military possession but it was still occupied by many of its old inhabitants these people were not allowed to pass the lines either of one army or of the other or if they did so pass they were not allowed to return to their homes to these homes they were forced to cling and there they remained they had no market no shops at which to make purchases even if they had money to buy no customers with whom to deal even if they had produce to sell they had their cows if they could keep them from the confederate soldiers their pigs and their poultry and on them they were living a most forlorn life any advance made by either party must be over their homesteads in the event of battle they would be in the midst of it and in the meantime they could see no one hear of nothing go no whither beyond the limits of that miserable strip of ground the earth was hard with frost when i paid my visit to the camp and the general appearance of things around my friend's quarters was on that account cheerful enough it was the mud which made things sad and wretched when the frost came it seemed as though the army had overcome one of its worst enemies unfortunately cold weather did not last long i have been told in washington that they rarely have had so open a season soon after my departure that terrible enemy the mud came back upon them but during my stay the ground was hard and the weather very sharp i slept in a tent and managed to keep my body warm by an enormous overstructure of blankets and coats but i could not keep my head warm throughout the night i had to go down like a fish beneath the water for protection and come up for air at intervals half smothered i had a stove in my tent but the heat of that when lighted was more terrible than the severity of the frost the tents of the brigade with which i was staying had been pitched not without an eye to appearances they were placed in streets as it were each street having its name and between them screens had been erected of fir poles and fir branches so as to keep off the wind the outside boundaries of the nearest regiment were ornamented with arches crosses and columns constructed in the same way so that the quarters of the men were reached as it were through gateways the whole thing was pretty enough and while the ground was hard the camp was picturesque and a visit to it was not unpleasant but unfortunately the ground was in its nature soft and deep and composed of red clay and as the frost went and the wet weather came mud became omnipotent and destroyed all prettiness 
and I found that the cold weather, let it be ever so cold, was not severe upon the men. It was wet which they feared and had cause to fear, both for themselves and for their horses. As to the horses, but few of them were protected by any shelter or covering whatsoever. Through both frost and wet they remained out, tied to the wheel of a wagon or to some temporary rack at which they were fed. In England we should imagine that any horse so treated must perish, but here the animals seemed to stand it. Many of them were miserable enough in appearance, but nevertheless they did the work required of them. I have observed that horses throughout the States are treated in a hardier manner than is usually the case with us. At the period of which I am speaking, January 1862, the health of the Army of the Potomac was not as good as it had been and was beginning to give way under the effects of the winter. Measles had become very prevalent and also smallpox, though not of a virulent description, and men in many instances were sinking under fatigue. I was informed by various officers that the Irish regiments were on the whole the most satisfactory. Not that they made the best soldiers, for it was asserted that they were the worse as soldiers than the Americans or Germans. Not that they became more easily subject to rule, for it was asserted that they were unruly, but because they were rarely ill. Diseases which seized the American troops on all sides seemed to spare them. The mortality was not excessive, but the men became sick and ailing and fell under the doctor's hands. Mr. Olmsted, whose name is well known in England as a writer on the southern states, was at this time secretary to a sanitary commission on the army, and published an abstract of the results of the inquiries made, on which I believe perfect reliance may be placed. This inquiry was extended to two hundred regiments which were presumed to be included in the Army of the Potomac. But these regiments were not all located on the Virginian side of the river, and must not therefore be taken as belonging exclusively to the divisions of which I have been speaking. Mr. Olmsted says, The health of our armies is evidently not above the average of armies in the field. The mortality of the Army of the Potomac, during the summer months, averaged three and a half percent, and for the whole army it is stated at five percent. Of the camps inspected, five percent he says, were in admirable order, 44%, fairly clean and well policed. The condition of 26% was negligent and slovenly, and of 24%, decidedly bad, filthy, and dangerous. Thus, 50% were either negligent and slovenly or filthy and dangerous. I wonder what the report would have been had Camp Benton at St. Louis been surveyed. In about 80% of the regiments the officers claimed to give systematic attention to the cleanliness of the men, but it is remarked that they rarely enforced the washing of the feet and not always of the head and neck. I wish Mr. Olmsted had added that they never enforced the cutting of the hair. No single trait has been so decidedly disadvantageous to the appearance of the American army as the long, uncombed, rough locks of hair which the men have appeared so loath to abandon. In reading the above, one cannot but think of the condition of those other twenty regiments. According to Mr. Olmsted, two-thirds of the men were native-born, and one-third was composed of foreigners. These foreigners are either Irish or German. Had a similar report been made of the armies in the West, I think it would have been seen that the proportion of foreigners was still greater. The average age of the privates was something under twenty-five, and that of the officers thirty-four. I may here add, from my own observation, that an officer's rank could in no degree be predicated from his age. Generals, colonels, majors, captains, and lieutenants had been all appointed at the same time and without reference to age or qualification. Political influence or the power of raising recruits had been the standard by which military rank was distributed. The old West Point officers had generally been chosen for high commands, but beyond this everything was necessarily new. Young colonels and ancient captains abounded without any harsh feelings as to the matter on either side. Indeed, in this respect, the practice of the country generally was simply carried out. Fathers and mothers in America seem to obey their sons and daughters naturally, and as they grow old become the slaves of their grandchildren. Mr. Olmsted says that food was found to be universally good and abundant. On this matter Mr. Olmsted might have spoken in stronger language without exaggeration, 
the food supplied to the american armies has been extravagantly good and certainly has been wastefully abundant very much has been said of the cost of the american army and it has been made a matter of boasting that no army so costly has ever been put into the field by any other nation the assertion is i believe at any rate true i have found it impossible to ascertain what has hitherto been expended on the army i much doubt whether even mr chase the secretary of the treasury or mr stanton the secretary at war know themselves and i do not suppose that mr stanton's predecessor much cared some approach however may be reached to the amount actually paid in wages and for clothes and diet and i give below a statement which i have seen of the actual annual sum proposed to be expended on these heads presuming the army to consist of five hundred thousand men the army is stated to contain six hundred sixty thousand men but the former numbers given would probably be found to be nearer the mark wages of privates including sergeants and corporals in dollars eighty six million six hundred forty thousand salaries of regimental officers twenty three million seven hundred eighty four thousand extra wages of privates extra pay to mounted officers and salary of officers above the rank of colonel seventeen million for a total of one hundred twenty seven million four hundred twenty four thousand dollars or twenty five million four hundred eighty four pounds sterling to this must be added the cost of diet and clothing the food of the men i was informed was supplied at an average cost of seventeen cents a day which for an army of five hundred thousand men would amount to six million two hundred thousand pounds per annum the clothing of the men is shown by the printed statement of their war department to amount to three dollars a month for a period of five years that at least is the amount allowed to a private of infantry or artillery the cost of the cavalry uniforms and of the dress of the non-commissioned officers is something higher but not sufficiently so to make it necessary to make special provision for the difference in a statement so rough as this at three dollars a month the clothing of the army would amount to three million six hundred thousand pounds the actual annual cost would therefore be as follows salaries and wages twenty five million four hundred eighty four thousand four hundred pounds diet of the soldiers six million two hundred thousand pounds and clothing for the soldiers three million six hundred thousand pounds for a total of thirty five million two hundred eighty four thousand four hundred pounds i believe that these figures may be trusted unless it be with reference to that sum of seventeen million dollars or three million four hundred thousand pounds which is presumed to include the salaries of all general officers with their staffs and also the extra wages paid to soldiers in certain cases this is given as an estimate and may be over or under the mark the sum named as the cost of clothing would be correct or nearly so if the army remained in its present force for five years if it so remained for only one year the cost would be one-fifth higher it must of course be remembered that the sum above named includes simply the wages clothes and food of the men it does not comprise the purchase of arms horses ammunition or wagons the forage of horses the transport of troops or any of those incidental expenses of warfare which are always i presume heavier than the absolute cost of the men and which in this war have been probably heavier than in any war ever waged on the face of god's earth nor does it include that terrible item of peculation as to which i will say a word or two before i finish this chapter the yearly total payment of the officers and soldiers of the armies is as follows as regards the officers it must be understood that this includes all the allowances made to them except as regards those on the staff the sums named apply only to the infantry and artillery the pay of the cavalry is about ten per cent higher lieutenant general general scott alone holds that rank in the state's army one thousand eight hundred fifty pounds major general one thousand one hundred fifty pounds brigadier general eight hundred pounds colonel five hundred thirty pounds lieutenant colonel four hundred seventy five pounds note a colonel and lieutenant colonel are attached to each regiment and note major four hundred thirty pounds captain three hundred pounds first lieutenant two hundred sixty five pounds second lieutenant two hundred forty five pounds first sergeant forty eight pounds 
sergeant forty pounds corporal thirty four pounds private thirty one pounds in every grade named the pay is i believe higher than that given by us or as i imagine by any other nation it is however probable that the extra allowances paid to some of our higher officers when on duty may give to their positions for a time a higher pecuniary remuneration it will of course be understood that there is nothing in the american army answering to our colonel of a regiment with us the officer so designated holds a nominal command of high dignity and emolument as a reward for past services i have already spoken of my visits to the camps of the other armies in the field that of general halleck who held his headquarters at st louis in missouri and that of general buell who was at louisville in kentucky there was also a fourth army under general hunter in kansas but i did not make my way as far west as that i do not pretend to any military knowledge and should be foolish to attempt military criticism but as far as i could judge by appearance i should say that the men in buell's army were of the three in the best order they seemed to me to be cleaner than the others and as far as i could learn were in better health want of discipline and dirt have no doubt been the great faults of the regiments generally and the latter drawback may probably be included in the former these men have not yet been accustomed to act under the orders of superiors and when they entered on the service hardly recognized the fact that they would have to do so in aught else than in their actual drill and fighting it is impossible to conceive any class of men to whom the necessary discipline of a soldier would come with more difficulty than to an american citizen the whole training of his life has been against it he has never known respect for a master or reverence for men of a higher rank than himself he has probably been made to work hard for his wages harder than an englishman works but he has been his employer's equal the language between them has been the language of equals and their arrangement as to labor and wages has been a contract between equals if he did not work he would not get his money and perhaps not if he did under these circumstances he has made his fight with the world but those circumstances have never taught him that special deference to a superior which is the first essential of a soldier's duty but probably in no respect would that difficulty be so severely felt as in all matters appertaining to personal habits here at any rate the man would expect to be still his own master acting for himself and independent of all outer control our english hodge when taken from the plough to the camp would probably submit without a murmur to soap and water and a barber's shears he would have received none of that education which would prompt him to rebel against such ordinances but the american citizen who for a while expects to shake hands with his captain whenever he sees him and is astonished when he learns that he must not offer him drinks cannot at once be brought to understand that he is to be treated like a child in the nursery that he must change his shirt so often wash himself at such and such intervals and go through a certain process of cleansing his outward garments daily i met while travelling a sergeant of an old regular american regiment and he spoke of the want of discipline among the volunteers as hopeless but even he instanced it chiefly by their want of cleanliness they wear their shirts till they drop off their backs said he and what can you expect from such men as that i liked that sergeant for his zeal and intelligence and also for his courtesy when he found that i was an englishman for previous to his so finding he had begun to abuse the english roundly but i did not quite agree with him about the volunteers it is very bad that soldiers should be dirty but also that they should treat their captains with familiarity and desire to exchange drinks with the majors but even discipline is not everything and discipline will come at last even to the american soldiers distasteful as it may be when the necessity for it is made apparent but these volunteers have great military virtues they are intelligent zealous in their cause handy with arms willing enough to work at all military duties and personally brave on the other hand they are sickly and there has been a considerable amount of drunkenness among them no man who has looked on the subject can i think doubt that a native american has a lower physical development than an irishman a german or an englishman they become old sooner and die at an earlier age as to that matter of drink 
I do not think that much need be said against them. English soldiers get drunk when they have the means of doing so, and American soldiers would not get drunk if the means were taken away from them. A little drunkenness goes a long way in a camp, and ten drunkards will give a bad name to a company of a hundred. Let any man travel with twenty men of whom four are tipsy, and on leaving them he will tell you that every man of them was a drunkard. End of chapter 7, part 2"'Chapter 7, Part 2 of North America, Volume 2, by Antony Trollope. "'This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Seven, "'The Army of the North, Part 2. "'I have said that these men are brave, and I have no doubt that they are so. "'How should it be otherwise with men of such a race? "'But it must be remembered that there are two kinds of courage, "'one of which is very common, and the other very uncommon.' of the latter description of courage it cannot be expected that much should be found among the privates of any army and perhaps not very many examples among the officers it is a courage self-sustained based on a knowledge of the right and on a lifelong calculation that any results coming from adherence to the right will be preferable to any that can be produced by a departure from it this is the courage which will enable a man to stand his ground in battle or elsewhere though broken worlds should fall around him the other courage which is mainly an affair of the heart or blood and not of the brain always requires some outward support the man who finds himself prominent in danger bears himself gallantly because the eyes of many will see him whether as an old man he leads an army or as a young man goes on a forlorn hope or as a private carries his officer on his back out of the fire he is sustained by the love of praise and the men who are not individually prominent in danger who stand their ground shoulder to shoulder bear themselves gallantly also each trusting in the combined strength of his comrades when such combined strength has been acquired that useful courage is engendered which we may rather call confidence and which of all courage is the most serviceable in the army at the battle of bull's run the army of the north became panic-stricken and fled from this fact many have been led to believe that the american soldiers would not fight well and that they could not be brought to stand their ground under fire this i think has been an unfair conclusion in the first place the history of the battle of bull's run has yet to be written as yet the history of the flight only has been given to us as far as i can learn the northern soldiers did at first fight well so well that the army of the south believed itself to be beaten but a panic was created at first as it seems among the teamsters and wagons a cry was raised and a rush was made by hundreds of drivers with their carts and horses and then men who had never seen war before who had not yet had three months drilling as soldiers to whom the turmoil of that day must have seemed as though hell were opening upon them joined themselves to the general clamour and fled to washington believing that all was lost but at the same time the regiments of the enemy were going through the same farce in the other direction it was a battle between troops who knew nothing of battles of soldiers who were not yet soldiers that individual high-minded courage which would have given to each individual recruit the self-sustained power against a panic which is to be looked for in a general was not to be looked for in them of the other courage of which i have spoken there was as much as the circumstances of the battle would allow on subsequent occasions the men have fought well we should i think admit that they have fought very well when we consider how short has been their practice at such work at somerset at fort henry at fort donelson at corinth the men behaved with courage standing well to their arms though at each place the slaughter among them was great they have always gone well into fire and have generally borne themselves well under fire i am convinced that we in england can make no greater mistake than to suppose that the americans as soldiers are deficient in courage but now i must come to a matter in which a terrible deficiency has been shown not by the soldiers but by those whose duty it has been to provide for the soldiers it is impossible to speak of the army of the north and to leave untouched that hideous subject of army contracts 
and I think myself the more specially bound to allude to it, because I feel that the iniquities which have prevailed prove with terrible earnestness the demoralizing power of that dishonesty among men in high places, which is the one great evil of the American states. It is there that the deficiency exists, which must be supplied before the public men of the nation can take a high rank among other public men. There is the gangrene, which must be cut out before the government as a government can be great to make money is the one thing needful and men have been anxious to meddle with the affairs of government because there might money be made with the greatest ease make money the roman satirist said make it honestly if you can but at any rate make money that first counsel would be considered futile and altogether vain by those who have lately dealt with the public wants of the american states this is bad in a most fatal degree not mainly because men in high places have been dishonest or because the government has been badly served by its own paid officers that men in high places should be dishonest and that the people should be cheated by their rulers is very bad but there is worse than this the thing becomes so common and so notorious that the american world at large is taught to believe that dishonesty is in itself good it behoves a man to be smart sir till the opposite doctrine to that be learned till men in america ay and in europe asia and africa can learn that it specially behoves a man not to be smart they will have learned little of their duty towards god and nothing of their duty towards their neighbour in the instances of fraud against the state's government to which i am about to allude i shall take all my facts from the report made to the house of representatives at washington by a committee of that house in december eighteen sixty one mr washburn from the select committee to inquire into the contracts of the government made the following report that is the heading of the pamphlet the committee was known as the van wick committee a gentleman of that name having acted as chairman the committee first went to new york and began their inquiries with reference to the purchase of a steamboat called the catalin in this case a certain captain comstock had been designated from washington as the agent to be trusted in the charter or purchase of the vessel he agreed on behalf of the government to hire that special boat for two thousand pounds a month for three months having given information to friends of his on the matter which enabled them to purchase it out and out for less than four thousand pounds these friends were not connected with shipping matters but were lawyers and hotel proprietors the committee conclude that the vessel was chartered to the government at an unconscionable price and that captain comstock by whom this was effected while enjoying the peculiar confidence of the government was acting for and in concert with the parties who chartered the vessel and was in fact their agent but the report does not explain why captain comstock was selected for this work by authority from washington nor does it recommend that he be punished it does not appear that captain comstock had ever been in the regular service of the government but that he had been master of a steamer in the next place one starbuck is employed to buy ships as a government agent he buys two for thirteen hundred pounds and sells them to the government for twenty nine hundred pounds the vessels themselves when delivered at the navy yard were found to be totally unfit for the service for which they had been purchased but why was starbuck employed when as appears over and over again in the report new york was full of paid government servants ready and fit to do the work starbuck was merely an agent and who will believe that he was allowed to pocket the whole difference of sixteen hundred pounds the greater part of the plunder was however in this case refunded then we come to the case of mr george d morgan brother-in-law of mr wells the secretary of the navy i have spoken of this gentleman before and of his singular prosperity he amassed a large fortune in five months as a government agent for the purchase of vessels he having been a wholesale grocer by trade this gentleman had had no experience whatsoever with reference to ships it is shown by the evidence that he had none of the requisite knowledge and that there were special servants of the government in new york at that time sent there specially for such services as these who were in every way trustworthy and who had the requisite knowledge yet mr morgan was placed in this position by his brother-in-law the secretary of the navy and in that capacity made about twenty thousand pounds in five months all of which was paid by the government as is well shown to have been the fact in the report before me 
one result of such a mode of agency is given one other result i mean besides the twenty thousand pounds put into the pocket of the brother of the secretary of the navy a ship called the stars and stripes was bought by mr morgan for eleven thousand pounds which had been built some months before for seven thousand this vessel was bought from a company which was blessed with a president the president made the bargain with the government agent but insisted on keeping back from his own company two thousand pounds out of the eleven thousand for expenses incident to the purchase the company did not like being mulcted of its prey and growled heavily but their president declared that such bargains were not got at washington for nothing members of congress had to be paid to assist in such things at least he could not reduce his little private bill for such assistance below sixteen hundred pounds he had he said positively paid out so much to those venal members of congress and had made nothing for himself to compensate him for his own exertions when this president came to be examined he admitted that he had really made no payments to members of congress his own capacity had been so great that no such assistance had been found necessary but he justified his charge on the ground that the sum taken by him was no more than the company might have expected him to lay out on members of congress or on ex-members who are specially mentioned had he not himself carried on the business with such consummate discretion it seems to me that the members or ex-members of congress were shamefully robbed in this matter the report deals manfully with mr morgan showing that for five months work which work he did not do and did not know how to do he received as large a sum as the president's salary for the whole presidential term of four years so much better is it to be an agent of government than simply an officer and the committee adds that they do not find in this transaction the less to censure in the fact that this arrangement between the secretary of the navy and mr morgan was one between brothers-in-law after that who will believe that mr morgan had the whole of that twenty thousand pounds for himself and yet mr wells still remains secretary of the navy and has justified the whole transaction in an explanation admitting everything and which is considered by his friends to be an able state paper it behoves a man to be smart sir mr morgan and secretary wells will no doubt be considered by their own party to have done their duty well as high trading public functionaries the faults of mr morgan and of secretary wells are nothing to us in england but the light in which such faults may be regarded by the american people is much to us i will now go on to the case of a mr cummings mr cummings it appears had been for many years the editor of a newspaper in philadelphia and had been an intimate political friend and ally of mr cameron now at the time of which i am writing april eighteen sixty one mr cameron was secretary at war and could be very useful to an old political ally living in his own state the upshot of the present case will teach us to think well of mr cameron's gratitude in april eighteen sixty one stores were wanted for the army at washington and mr cameron gave an order to his old friend cummings to expend two million dollars pretty much according to his fancy in buying stores governor morgan the governor of new york state and a relative of our other friend morgan was joined with mr cummings in this commission mr cameron no doubt having felt himself bound to give the friends of his colleague at the navy a chance governor morgan at once made over his right to his relative but better things soon came in morgan's way and he relinquished his share in this partnership at an early date in this transaction he did not himself handle above twenty five thousand dollars then the whole job fell into the hands of mr cameron's old political friend the two millions of dollars or four hundred thousand pounds were paid into the hands of certain government treasurers at new york but they had orders to honor the draft of the political friend of the secretary at war and consequently fifty thousand pounds was immediately withdrawn by mr cummings and with this he went to work it is shown that he knew nothing of the business that he employed a clerk from albany whom he did not know and confided to this clerk the duty of buying such stores as were bought that this clerk was recommended to him by mr weed the editor of the newspaper at albany who was known in the states as a special political friend of mr seward the secretary of state and that in this way he spent thirty two thousand pounds he bought linen pantaloons and straw hats to the amount of forty two hundred pounds because he thought the soldiers looked hot in the warm weather but he afterwards learned that they were of no use 
he bought groceries of a hardware dealer named davidson at albany that town whence came mr weed's clerk he did not know what was davidson's trade nor did he know exactly what he was going to buy but davidson proposed to sell him something which mr cummings believed to be some kind of provisions and he bought it he did not know for how much whether over two thousand pounds or not he never saw the articles and had no knowledge of their quality it was out of the question that he should have such knowledge as he naively remarks his clerk humphreys saw the articles he presumed they were brought from albany but did not know he afterwards bought a ship or two or three ships he inspected one ship by a mere casual visit that is to say he did not examine her boilers he did not know her tonnage but he took the word of the seller for everything he could not state the terms of the charter or give the substance of it he had had no former experience in buying or chartering ships he also bought seventy five thousand pairs of shoes at only twenty five cents or one shilling a pair more than their proper price he bought them of a Mr. Hall, who declares that he paid Mr. Cummings nothing for the job, but regarded it as a return for certain precious favors conferred by him on Mr. Cummings in the occasional loans of one hundred or two hundred pounds. At the end of the examination it appears that Mr. Cummings still held in his hand a slight balance of twenty-eight thousand pounds, of which he had forgotten to make mention in the body of his own evidence. This item seems to have been overlooked by him in his testimony says the report and when the report was made nothing had yet been learned of the destiny of this small balance then the report gives a list of the army supplies miscellaneously purchased by mr cummings two hundred eighty dozen pints of ale at nine shillings sixpence a dozen a lot of codfish and herrings two hundred boxes of cheeses and a large assortment of butter some tongues straw hats and linen pants twenty-three barrels of pickles twenty-five casks of scotch ale price not stated a lot of london porter price not stated and some hall carbines of which i must say a word more further on it should be remembered that no requisition had come from the army for any of the articles named that the purchase of herrings and straw hats was dictated solely by the discretion of cummings and his man humphreys or as is more probable by the fact that some other person had such articles by him for sale and that the government had its own established officers for the supply of things properly ordered by military requisition these very same articles also were apparently procured in the first place as a private speculation and were made over to the government on the failure of that speculation some of the above articles says the report were shipped by the catalin which were probably loaded on private account and not being able to obtain a clearance was in some way through Mr. Cummings, transferred over to the government, Scotch ale, London porter, selected herrings, and all. The italics as well as the words are taken from the report. This was the confidential political friend of the Secretary at War, by whom he was entrusted with four hundred thousand pounds of public money. Twenty-eight thousand pounds had not been accounted for when the report was made, and the army supplies were bought after the fashion above named that secretary at war mr cameron has since left the cabinet but he has not been turned out in disgrace he has been nominated as minister to russia and the world has been told that there was some difference of opinion between him and his colleagues respecting slavery mr cameron in some speech or paper declared on his leaving the cabinet that he had not intended to remain long as secretary at war this assertion i should think must have been true and now about the hall carbines as to which the gentlemen on this committee tell their tale with an evident delight in the richness of its incidents which at once puts all their readers in accord with them there were altogether some five thousand of these all of which the government sold to a mr eastman in june eighteen sixty one for fourteen shillings each as perfectly useless and afterwards bought in august for four pounds eight shillings each about four shillings a carbine having been expended in their repair in the meantime but as regards seven hundred ninety of these now famous weapons it must be explained that they had been sold by the government as perfectly useless and at a nominal price previously to this second sale made by the government to mr eastman they had been so sold and then in april eighteen sixty one 
they had been bought again for the government by the indefatigable cummings for three pounds each then they were again sold as useless for fourteen shillings each to eastman and instantly rebought on behalf of the government for four pounds eight shillings each useless for war purposes they may have been but as articles of commerce it must be confessed that they were very serviceable this last purchase was made by a man named stevens on behalf of general fremont who at that time commanded the army of the united states in missouri stevens had been employed by general fremont as an agent on the behalf of the government as is shown with clearness in the report and on hearing of these muskets telegraphed to the general at once i have five thousand halls rifled cast steel muskets breech loading new at twenty two dollars general fremont telegraphed back instantly i will take the whole five thousand carbines i will pay all extra charges and so the purchase was made the muskets it seems were not absolutely useless even as weapons of war considering the emergency of the times a competent witness considered them to be worth ten or twelve dollars the government had been as much cheated in selling them as it had in buying them but the nature of the latter transaction is shown by the facts that stevens was employed though irresponsibly employed as a government agent by general fremont that he bought the muskets in that character himself making on the transaction one pound eighteen shillings on each musket and that the same man afterwards appeared as an aide-de-camp on general fremont's staff general fremont had no authority himself to make such a purchase and when the money was paid for the first instalment of the arms it was so paid by the special order of general fremont himself out of monies intended to be applied to other purposes the money was actually paid to a gentleman known at fremont's headquarters as his special friend and was then paid in that irregular way because this friend desired that that special bill should receive immediate payment after that who can believe that stevens was himself allowed to pocket the whole amount of the plunder there is a nice little story of a clergyman in new york who sold for forty pounds and certain further contingencies the right to furnish two hundred cavalry horses but i should make this too long if i told all the nice little stories as the frauds at st louis were if not in fact the most monstrous at any rate the most monstrous which have as yet been brought to the light i cannot finish this account without explaining something of what was going on at that western paradise in those halcyon days of general fremont general fremont soon after reaching st louis undertook to build ten forts for the protection of that city these forts have since been pronounced as useless and the whole measure has been treated with derision by officers of his own army but the judgment displayed in the matter is a military question with which i do not presume to meddle even if a general be wrong in such a matter his character as a man is not disgraced by such error but the manner of building them was the affair with which mr van wick's committee had to deal it seems that five of the forts the five largest were made under the orders of a certain major capner at a cost of twelve thousand pounds and that the other five could have been built at least for the same sum major capner seems to have been a good and honest public servant and therefore quite unfit for the superintendence of such work at st louis the other five smaller forts were also in progress the works on them having been continued from first september to twenty fifth september eighteen sixty one but on the twenty fifth september general fremont himself gave special orders that a contract should be made with a man named beard a californian who had followed him from california to st louis this contract is dated the twenty fifth of september but nevertheless the work specified in that contract was done previous to that date and most of the money paid was paid previous to that date the contract did not specify any lump sum but agreed that the work should be paid for by the yard and by the square foot no less a sum was paid to beard for this work the cormorant beard as the report calls him then twenty four thousand two hundred pounds the last payment only amounting to four thousand pounds having been made subsequent to the date of the contract twenty thousand two hundred pounds was paid to beard before the date of the contract the amounts were paid at five times and the last four payments were made on the personal order of general fremont this beard was under no bond and none of the officers of the government knew anything of the terms under which he was working on the fourteenth of october 
general fremont was ordered to discontinue these works and to abstain from making any further payments on their account but disobeying this order he directed his quartermaster to pay a further sum of four thousand pounds to beard out of the first sums he should receive from washington he then being out of money this however was not paid it must be understood says the report that every dollar ordered to be paid by general fremont on account of these works was diverted from a fund specially appropriated for another purpose and then again the money appropriated by congress to subsist and clothe and transport our armies was then in utter contempt of all law and of the army regulations as well as in defiance of superior authority ordered to be diverted from its lawful purpose and turned over to the cormorant beard while he had received one hundred seventy thousand dollars twenty four thousand two hundred pounds from the government it will be seen from the testimony of major kapner that there had only been paid to the honest german labourers who did the work on the first five forts built under his directions the sum of fifteen thousand five hundred dollars thirty one hundred pounds leaving from forty thousand to fifty thousand dollars eight thousand to ten thousand pounds still due and while these labourers whose families were clamouring for bread were besieging the quartermaster's department for their pay this infamous contractor beard is found following up the army and in the confidence of the major-general who gives him orders for large purchases which could only have been legally made through the quartermaster's department after that who will believe that all the money went into beard's pocket why should general fremont have committed every conceivable breach of order against his government merely with the view of favouring such a man as beard the collusion of the quartermaster minstry with fraudulent knaves in the purchase of horses is then proved minstry was at this time fremont's quartermaster at st louis i cannot go through all these a man of the name of jim neal comes out in beautiful preeminence no dealer in horses could get to the quartermaster except through jim neal or some such go-between the quartermaster contracted with neal and neal with the owners of the horses neal at the time being also military inspector of horses for the quartermaster he bought horses as cavalry horses for twenty-four pounds or less and passed them himself as artillery horses for thirty pounds in other cases the military inspectors were paid by the sellers to pass horses all this was done under quartermaster minstry who would himself deal with none but such as neil in one instance one ellard got a contract from minstry the profit of which was eight thousand pounds but there was a man named brady now brady was a friend of minstry's who scenting the carrion afar off had come from detroit in michigan to st louis minstry himself had also come from detroit in this case ellard was simply directed by minstry to share his profits with brady and consequently paid to brady four thousand pounds although brady gave to the business neither capital nor labour he simply took the four thousand pounds as the quartermaster's friend this ellard it seems also gave a carriage and horses to mrs fremont indeed ellard seems to have been a civil and a generous fellow then there is a man named thompson whose case is very amusing of him the committee thus speaks it must be said that thompson was not forgetful of the obligations of gratitude for after he got through with the contract he presented the son of major minstry with a riding pony that was the only mark of respect to use his own words that he showed to the family of major minstry general fremont himself desired that a contract should be made with one augustus sackey for a thousand canadian horses it turned out that sackey was nobody a man of straw living in a garret in new york whom nobody knew a man who was brought out there to st louis as a good person through whom to work it will hardly be believed says the report that the name of this man sackey appears in the newspapers as being on the staff of general fremont at springfield with the rank of captain i do not know that any good would result from my pursuing further the details of this wonderful report the remaining portion of it refers solely to the command held by general fremont in missouri and adds proof upon proof of the gross robberies inflicted upon the government of the states by the very person set in high authority to protect the government we learn how all utensils for the camp kettles blankets shoes mess pans etc were supplied by one firm without a contract at an enormous price 
and of a quality so bad as to be almost useless because the quartermaster was under obligations to the partners we learn that one partner in that firm gave forty pounds towards a service of plate for the quartermaster and sixty pounds towards a carriage for mrs fremont we learn how futile were the efforts of any honest tradesman to supply good shoes to soldiers who were shoeless and the history of one special pair of shoes which was thrust under the nose of the quartermaster is very amusing we learn that a certain paymaster properly refused to settle an account for matters with which he had no concern and that general fremont at once sent down soldiers to arrest him unless he made the illegal payment in october one thousand pounds was expended in ice all which ice was wasted regiments were sent hither and thither with no military purpose merely because certain officers calling themselves generals desired to make up brigades for themselves indeed every description of fraud was perpetrated and this was done not through the negligence of those in high command but by their connivance and often with their express authority it will be said that the conduct of general fremont during the days of his command in missouri is not a matter of much moment to us in england that it has been properly handled by the committee of representatives appointed by the american congress to inquire into the matter and that after the publication of such a report by them it is ungenerous in a writer from another nation to speak upon the subject this would be so if the inquiries made by that committee and their report had resulted in any general condemnation of the men whose misdeeds and peculations have been exposed this however is by no means the case those who were heretofore opposed to general fremont on political principles are opposed to him still but those who heretofore supported him are ready to support him again note since this was written general fremont has been restored to high military command and now holds equal rank and equal authority with mcclellan and halleck in fact the charges made against him by the committee of the house of representatives have not been allowed to stand in his way he is politically popular with a large section of the nation and therefore it has been thought well to promote him to high place whether he be fit for such place either as regards capability or integrity seems to be considered of no moment and note he has not been placed beyond the pale of public favour by the record which has been made of his public misdeeds he is decried by the democrats because he is a republican and by the anti-abolitionists because he is an abolitionist but he is not decried because he has shown himself to be dishonest in the service of his government he was dismissed from his command in the west but men on his side of the question declare that he was so dismissed because his political opponents had prevailed now at the moment that i am writing this men are saying that the president must give him another command he is still a major-general in the army of the states and is as probable a candidate as any other that i could name for the next presidency the same argument must be used with reference to the other gentlemen named mr wells is still a cabinet minister and secretary for the navy it has been found impossible to keep mr cameron in the cabinet but he was named as the minister of the state's government to russia after the publication of the van wyck report when the result of his old political friendship with mr alexander cummings was well known to the president who appointed him and to the senate who sanctioned his appointment the individual corruption of any one man of any ten men is not much it should not be insisted on loudly by any foreigner in making up a balance sheet of the virtues and vices of the good and bad qualities of any nation but the light in which such corruption is viewed by the people whom it most nearly concerns is very much i am far from saying that democracy has failed in america democracy there has done great things for a numerous people and will yet as i think be successful but that doctrine as to the necessity of smartness must be eschewed before a verdict in favour of american democracy can be pronounced it behoves a man to be smart sir in those words are contained the curse under which the state's government has been suffering for the last thirty years let us hope that the people will find a mode of ridding themselves of that curse i for one believe that they will do so End of chapter seven Chapter Eight, Part One of North America, Volume Two by Antony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eight, 
back to boston part one from louisville we returned to cincinnati in making which journey we were taken to a place called seymour in indiana at which spot we were to make connection with the train running on the mississippi and ohio line from st louis to cincinnati we did make the connection but were called upon to remain four hours at seymour in consequence of some accident on the line in the same way when going eastwards from cincinnati to baltimore a few days later i was detained another four hours at a place called cross line in ohio on both occasions i spent my time in realizing as far as that might be possible the sort of life which men lead who settle themselves at such localities both these towns for they call themselves towns had been created by the railways indeed this has been the case with almost every place at which a few hundred inhabitants have been drawn together in the western states with the exception of such cities as chicago st louis and cincinnati settlers can hardly be said to have chosen their own localities these have been chosen for them by the originators of the different lines of railway and there is nothing in europe in any way like these western railway settlements in the first place the line of the rails run through the main street of the town and forms not unfrequently the only road at seymour i could find no way of getting away from the rails unless i went into the fields at cross line which is a larger place i did find a street in which there was no railroad but it was deserted and manifestly out of favour with the inhabitants as there were railway junctions at both these posts there were of course cross streets and the houses extended themselves from the centre thus made along the lines houses being added to houses at short intervals as newcomers settled themselves down the panting and groaning and whistling of engines is continual for at such places freight trains are always kept waiting for passenger trains and the slower freight trains for those which are called fast this is the life of the town and indeed as the whole place is dependent on the railway so is the railway held in favour and beloved the noise of the engines is not disliked nor are its puffings and groanings held to be unmusical with us a locomotive steam engine is still as it were a beast of prey against which one has to be on one's guard in respect to which one specially warns the children but there in the western states it has been taken to the bosoms of them all as a domestic animal no one fears it and the little children run about almost among its wheels it is petted and made much of on all sides and as far as i know it seldom bites or tears i have not heard of children being destroyed wholesale in the streets or of drunken men becoming frequent sacrifices but had i been consulted beforehand as to the natural effects of such an arrangement i should have said that no child could have been reared in such a town and that any continuance of population under such circumstances must have been impracticable such places however do thrive and prosper with a prosperity especially their own and the boys and girls increase and multiply in spite of all dangers with us in england it is difficult to realize the importance which is attached to a railway in the states and the results which a railway creates we have roads everywhere and our country had been cultivated throughout with more or less care before our system of railways had been commenced but in america especially in the north the railways have been the precursors of cultivation they have been carried hither and thither through primeval forests and over prairies with small hope of other traffic than that which they themselves would make by their own influences the people settling on their edges have had the very best of all roads at their service but they have had no other roads the face of the country between one settlement and another is still in many cases utterly unknown but there is the connecting road by which produce is carried away and newcomers are brought in the town that is distant a hundred miles by the rail is so near that its inhabitants are neighbours but a settlement twenty miles distant across the uncleared country is unknown unvisited and probably unheard of by the women and children under such circumstances the railway is everything it is the first necessity of life and gives the only hope of wealth it is the backbone of existence from whence spring and by which are protected all the vital organs and functions of the community it is the right arm of civilization for the people and the discoverer of the fertility of the land it is all in all to those people and to those regions it has supplied the wants of frontier life with all the substantial comfort of the cities and carried education progress and social habits into the wilderness 
to the eye of the stranger such places as seymour and crossline are desolate and dreary there is nothing of beauty in them given either by nature or by art the railway itself is ugly and its numerous sidings and branches form a mass of iron road which is bewildering and according to my ideas in itself disagreeable the wooden houses open down upon the line and have no gardens to relieve them a foreigner when first surveying such a spot will certainly record within himself a verdict against it but in doing so he probably commits the error of judging it by a wrong standard he should compare it with the new settlements which men have opened up in spots where no railway has assisted them and not with old towns in which wealth has long been congregated the traveller may see what is the place with the railway then let him consider how it might have thriven without the railway i confess that i became tired of my sojourn at both the places i have named at each i think that i saw every house in the place although my visit to seymour was made in the night and at both i was lamentably at a loss for something to do at crossline i was all alone and began to feel that the hours which i knew must pass before the missing train could come would never make away with themselves there were many others stationed there as i was but to them had been given a capability for loafing which niggardly nature has denied to me an american has the power of seating himself in the close vicinity of a hot stove and feeding in silence on his own thoughts by the hour together it may be that he will smoke but after a while his cigar will come to an end he sits on however certainly patient and apparently contented it may be that he chews but if so he does it with motionless jaws and so slow a mastication of the pabulum on which he feeds that his employment in this respect only disturbs the absolute quiet of the circle when at certain long distant intervals he deposits the secretion of his tobacco in an ornamental utensil which may probably be placed in the furthest corner of the hall but during all this time he is happy it does not fret him to sit there and think and do nothing he is by no means an idle man probably one much given to commercial enterprise idle men out there in the west we may say there are none how should any idle man live in such a country all who were sitting hour after hour in that circle round the stove at the crossline hotel hall sitting there hour after hour in silence as i could not sit were men who earned their bread by labor they were farmers mechanics storekeepers there was a lawyer or two and one clergyman sufficient conversation took place at first to indicate the professions of many of them one may conclude that there could not be place there for an idle man but they all of them had a capacity for a prolonged state of doing nothing which is to me unintelligible and which is very much to be envied they are as patient as cows which from hour to hour lie on the grass chewing their cud an englishman if he be kept waiting by a train in some forlorn station in which he can find no employment curses his fate and all that has led to his present misfortune with an energy which tells the story of his deep and thorough misery such i confess is my state of existence under such circumstances but a western american gives himself up to loafing and is quite happy he balances himself on the back legs of an armchair and remains so without speaking drinking or smoking for an hour at a stretch and while he is doing so he looks as though he had all that he desired i believe that he is happy and that he has all that he wants for such an occasion an armchair in which to sit and a stove on which he can put his feet and by which he can make himself warm such was not the phase of character which i had expected to find among the people of the west of all virtues patience would have been the last which i should have thought of attributing to them i should have expected to see them angry when robbed of their time and irritable under the stress of such grievances as railway delays but they are never irritable under such circumstances as i have attempted to describe nor indeed are they a people prone to irritation under any grievances even in political matters they are long enduring and do not form themselves into mobs for the expression of hot opinion we in england thought that masses of the people would rise in anger if mr lincoln's government should consent to give up slidell and mason but the people bore it without any rising the habeas corpus has been suspended the liberty of the press has been destroyed for a time the telegraph wires have been taken up by the government into their own hands but nevertheless the people have said nothing there has been no rising of a mob 
and not even an expression of an adverse opinion the people require to be allowed to vote periodically and having acquired that privilege permit other matters to go by the board in this respect we have i think in some degree misunderstood their character they have all been taught to reverence the nature of that form of government under which they live but they are not specially addicted to hot political fermentation they have learned to understand that democratic institutions have given them liberty and on that subject they entertain a strong conviction which is universal but they have not habitually interested themselves deeply in the doings of their legislators or of their government on the subject of slavery there have been and are different opinions held with great tenacity and maintained occasionally with violence but on other subjects of daily policy the american people have not i think been eager politicians leading men in public life have been much less trammelled by popular will than among us indeed with us the most conspicuous of our statesmen and legislators do not lead but are led in the states the noted politicians of the day have been the leaders and not unfrequently the coercers of opinion seeing this i claim for england a broader freedom in political matters than the states have as yet achieved in speaking of the american form of government i will endeavour to explain more clearly the ideas which i have come to hold on this matter i survived my delay at seymour after which i passed again through cincinnati and then survived my subsequent delay at crossline as to cincinnati i must put on record the result of a country walk which i took there or rather on which i was taken by my friend he professed to know the beauties of the neighbourhood and to be well acquainted with all that was attractive in its vicinity cincinnati is built on the ohio and is closely surrounded by picturesque hills which overhangs the suburbs of the city over these i was taken ploughing my way through a depth of mud which cannot be understood by any ordinary englishman but the depth of mud was not the only impediment nor the worst which we encountered as we began to ascend from the level of the outskirts of the town we were greeted by a rising flavour in the air which soon grew into a strong odour and at last developed itself into a stench that surpassed in offensiveness anything that my nose had ever hitherto suffered when we were at the worst we hardly knew whether to descend or to proceed it had so increased in virulence that at one time i felt sure that it arose from some matter buried in the ground beneath my feet but my friend who declared himself to be quite at home in cincinnati matters and to understand the details of the great cincinnati trade declared against this opinion of mine hogs he said were at the bottom of it it was the odour of hogs going up to the ohio heavens of hogs in a state of transit from hoggish nature to clothes brushes saddles sausages and lard he spoke with an authority that constrained belief but i can never forgive him in that he took me over those hills knowing all that he professed to know let the visitors to cincinnati keep themselves within the city and not wander forth among the mountains it is well that the odour of hogs should ascend to heaven and not hang heavy over the streets but it is not well to intercept that odour in its ascent my friend became ill with fever and had to betake himself to the care of nursing friends so that i parted company with him at cincinnati i did not tell him that his illness was deserved as well as natural but such was my feeling on the matter i myself happily escaped the evil consequences which his imprudence might have entailed on me i passed again through pittsburgh and over the allegheny mountains by altoona and down to baltimore back into civilization secession conversation and gastronomy i never had secessionist sympathies and never expressed them i always believed in the north as a people discrediting however to the utmost the existing northern government or as i should more properly say the existing northern cabinet but nevertheless with such feelings and such belief i found myself very happy at baltimore putting aside boston which must i think be generally preferred by englishmen to any other city in the states i should choose baltimore as my residence if i were called upon to live in america i am not led to this opinion if i know myself solely by the canvas-back ducks and as to the terrapins i throw them to the winds the madeira which is still kept there with a reverence which i should call superstitious were it not that its free circulation among outside worshippers prohibits the just use of such a word may have something to do with it 
as may also the beauty of the women to some small extent trifles do bear upon our happiness in a manner that we do not ourselves understand and of which we are unconscious but there was an english look about the streets and houses which i think has as much to do with it as either the wine the women or the ducks and it seemed to me as though the manners of the people of maryland were more english than those of other americans i do not say that they were on this account better my english hat is i am well aware less graceful and i believe less comfortable than a turkish fez and turban nevertheless i prefer my english hat new york i regard as the most thoroughly american of all american cities it is by no means the one in which i should find myself the happiest but i do not on that account condemn it i have said that in returning to baltimore i found myself among secessionists in so saying i intend to speak of a certain set whose influence depends perhaps more on their wealth position and education than on their numbers i do not think that the population of the city was then in favor of secession even if it had ever been so i believe that the mob of baltimore is probably the roughest mob in the state is more akin to a paris mob and i may perhaps also say to a manchester mob than that of any other american city there are more roughs in baltimore than elsewhere and the roughs there are rougher in those early days of secession when the troops were being first hurried down from new england for the protection of washington this mob was vehemently opposed to its progress men had been taught to think that the rights of the state of maryland were being invaded by the passage of the soldiers and they also were undoubtedly imbued with a strong prepossession for the southern cause the two ideas had then gone together but the mob of baltimore had ceased to be secessionists within twelve months of their first exploit in april eighteen sixty one they had refused to allow massachusetts soldiers to pass through the town on their way to washington and in february eighteen sixty two they were nailing union flags on the doorposts of those who refused to display such banners as signs of triumph at the northern victories that maryland can never go with the south even in the event of the south succeeding in secession no marylander can believe it is not pretended that there is any struggle now going on with such an object no such result has been expected certainly since the possession of washington was secured to the north by the army of the potomac by few i believe was such a result expected even when washington was insecure and yet the feeling for secession among a certain class in baltimore is as strong now as it ever was and it is equally strong in certain districts of the state in those districts which are most akin to virginia in their habits modes of thought and ties of friendship these men and these women also pray for the south if they be pious give their money to the south if they be generous work for the south if they be industrious fight for the south if they be young and talk for the south morning noon and night in spite of general dix and his columbiads on federal hill it is in vain to say that such men and women have no strong feeling on the matter and that they are praying working fighting and talking under dictation their hearts are in it and judging from them even though there were no other evidence from which to judge i have no doubt that a similar feeling is strong through all the seceding states on this subject the north i think deceives itself in supposing that the southern rebellion has been carried on without any strong feeling on the part of the southern people whether the mob of charleston be like the mob of baltimore i cannot tell but i have no doubt as to the gentry of charleston and the gentry of baltimore being in accord on the subject in what way then when the question has been settled by the force of arms will these classes find themselves obliged to act in virginia and maryland they comprise as a rule the highest and best educated of the people as to parts of kentucky the same thing may be said and probably as to the whole of tennessee it must be remembered that this is not as though certain aristocratic families in a few english counties should find themselves divided off from the politics and national aspirations of their countrymen as was the case long since with reference to the roman catholic adherents of the stuarts and as has been the case since then in a lesser degree with the firmest of the old tories who had allowed themselves to be deceived by sir robert peel in each of these cases the minority of dissensions was so small that the nation suffered nothing though individuals were all but robbed of their nationality 
but as regards america it must be remembered that each state has in itself a governing power and is in fact a separate people each has its own legislature and must have its own line of politics the secessionists of maryland and of virginia may consent to live in obscurity but if this be so who is to rule in those states from whence are to come the senators and the members of congress the governors and attorney-generals from whence is to come the national spirit of the two states and the salt that shall preserve their political life i have never believed that these states would succeed in secession i have always felt that they would be held within the union whatever might be their own wishes but i think that they will be so held in a manner and after a fashion that will render any political vitality almost impossible till a new generation shall have sprung up in the meantime life goes on pleasantly enough in baltimore and ladies meet together knitting stockings and sewing shirts for the southern soldiers while the gentlemen talk southern politics and drink the health of the southern president in ambiguous terms as our cavaliers used to drink the health of the king during my second visit to baltimore i went over to washington for a day or two and found the capital still under the empire of king mud how the elite of a nation for the inhabitants of washington consider themselves to be the elite can consent to live in such a state of thraldom a foreigner cannot understand were i to say that it was intended to be typical of the condition of the government i might be considered cynical but undoubtedly the sloughs of despond which were deepest in their despondency were to be found in localities which gave an appearance of truth to such a surmise the secretary of state's office in which mr seward was still reigning though with diminished glory was divided from the headquarters of the commander-in-chief which are immediately opposite to it by an opaque river which admitted of no transit these buildings stand at the corner of president square and it had been long understood that any close intercourse between them had not been considered desirable by the occupants of the military side of the causeway but the secretary of state's office was altogether unapproachable without a long circuit and begrimed legs the secretary at war's department was if possible in a worse condition this is situated on the other side of the president's house and the mud lay if possible thicker in this quarter than it did round mr seward's chambers the passage over pennsylvania avenue immediately in front of the war office was a thing not to be attempted in those days mr cameron it is true had gone and mr stanton was installed but the labour of cleansing the interior of that establishment had hitherto allowed no time for a glance at the exterior dirt and mr stanton should perhaps be held as excused that the navy office should be buried in mud and quite debarred from approach was to be expected the space immediately in front of mr lincoln's own residence was still kept fairly clean and i am happy to be able to give testimony to this effect long may it remain so i could not however but think that an energetic and careful president would have seen to the removal of the dirt from his own immediate neighbourhood it was something that his own shoes should remain unpolluted but the foul mud always clinging to the boots and leggings of those by whom he was daily surrounded must i should think have been offensive to him the entrance to the treasury was difficult to achieve by those who had not learned by practice the ways of the place but i must confess that a tolerably clear passage was maintained on that side which led immediately down to the halls of congress up at the capitol the mud was again triumphant in the front of the building this however was not of great importance as the legislative chambers of the states are always reached by the back door i on this occasion attempted to leave the building by the grand entrance but i soon became entangled among rivers of mud and mazes of shifting sand with difficulty i recovered my steps and finding my way back to the building was forced to content myself by an exit among the crowd of senators and representatives who were thronging down the back stairs End of chapter eight part one chapter eight part two of north america volume two by antony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain eight back to boston part two of dirt of all kinds it behoves washington and those concerned in washington to make themselves free 
it is the augean stables through which some american hercules must turn a purifying river before the american people can justly boast either of their capital or of their government as to the material mud enough has been said the presence of the army perhaps caused it and the excessive quantity of rain which had fallen may also be taken as a fair plea but what excuse shall we find for that other dirt it also had been caused by the presence of the army and by that long continued downpouring of contracts which had fallen like danae's golden shower into the laps of those who understood how to avail themselves of such heavenly waters the leaders of the rebellion are hated in the north the names of jefferson davis of cobb toombs and floyd are mentioned with execration by the very children this has sprung from a true and noble feeling from a patriotic love of national greatness and a hatred of those who for small party purposes have been willing to lessen the name of the united states i have reverenced the feeling even when i have not shared it but in addition to this the names of those also should be execrated who have robbed their country when pretending to serve it who have taken its wages in the days of its great struggle and at the same time have filched from its coffers who have undertaken the task of steering the ship through the storm in order that their hands might be deep in the meal-tub and the bread-basket and that they might stuff their own sacks with the ship's provisions these are the men who must be loathed by the nation whose fate must be held up as a warning to others before good can come northern men and women talk of hanging davis and his accomplices i myself trust that there will be no hanging when the war is over i believe there will be none for the americans are not a bloodthirsty people but if punishment of any kind be meted out the men of the north should understand that they have worse offenders among them than davis and floyd at the period of which i am now speaking there had come a change over the spirit of mr lincoln's cabinet mr seward was still his secretary of state but he was as far as outside observers could judge no longer his prime minister in the early days of the war and up to the departure of mr cameron from out of the cabinet mr seward had been the minister of the nation in his dispatches he talks ever of we or of i in every word of his official writings of which a large volume has been published he shows plainly that he intends to be considered as the man of the day as the hero who is to bring the states through their difficulties mr lincoln may be king but mr seward is mayor of the palace and carries the king in his pocket from the depths of his own wisdom he undertakes to teach his ministers in all parts of the world not only their duties but their proper aspiration he is equally kind to foreign statesmen and sends to them messages as though from an altitude which no european politician had ever reached at home he has affected the prime minister in everything dropping the we and using the i in a manner that has hardly made up by its audacity for its deficiency in discretion it is of course known everywhere that he had run mr lincoln very hard for the position of republican candidate for the presidency mr lincoln beat him and mr seward is well aware that in the states a man has never a second chance for the presidential chair hence has arisen his ambition to make for himself a new place in the annals of american politics hitherto there has been no prime minister known in the government of the united states mr seward has attempted a revolution in that matter and has essayed to fill the situation for a while it almost seemed that he was successful he interfered with the army and his interferences were endured he took upon himself the business of the police and arrested men at his own will and pleasure the habeas corpus was in his hand and his name was current through the states as a covering authority for every outrage on the old laws sufficient craft or perhaps cleverness he possessed to organize a position which should give him a power greater than the power of the president but he had not the genius which would enable him to hold it he made foolish prophecies about the war and talked of the triumphs which he would win he wrote state papers on matters which he did not understand and gave himself the airs of diplomatic learning while he showed himself to be sadly ignorant of the very rudiments of diplomacy he tried to joke as lord palmerston jokes and nobody liked his joking he was greedy after the little appanages of power taking from others who loved them as well as he did privileges with which he might have dispensed and then lastly he was successful in nothing he had given himself out as the commander of the commander-in-chief but then under his command nothing got itself done 
for a month or two some men had really believed in mr seward the policemen of the country had come to have an absolute trust in him and the underlings of the public offices were beginning to think that he might be a great man but then as is ever the case with such men there came suddenly a downfall mr cameron went from the cabinet and everybody knew that mr seward would be no longer commander of the commander-in-chief his prime ministership was gone from him and he sank down into the comparatively humble position of minister for foreign affairs his lettre de cachet no longer ran his passport system was repealed his prisoners were released and though it is too much to say that writs of habeas corpus were no longer suspended the effect and very meaning of the suspension were at once altered when i first left washington mr seward was the only minister of the cabinet whose name was ever mentioned with reference to any great political measure when i returned to washington mr stanton was mr lincoln's leading minister and as secretary at war had practically the management of the army and of the internal police i have spoken here of mr seward by name and in my preceding paragraphs i have alluded with some asperity to the dishonesty of certain men who had obtained political power under mr lincoln and used it for their own dishonest purposes i trust that i may not be understood as bringing any such charges against mr seward that such dishonesty has been frightfully prevalent all men know who knew anything of washington during the year eighteen sixty one in a former chapter i have alluded to this more at length stating circumstances and in some cases giving the names of the persons charged with offences whenever i have done so i have based my statements on the van wyck report and the evidence therein given this is the published report of a committee appointed by the house of representatives and as it has been before the world for some months without refutation i think that i have a right to presume it to be true Note i ought perhaps to state that general fremont has published an answer to the charges preferred against him that answer refers chiefly to the matters of military capacity or incapacity as to which i have expressed no opinion general fremont does allude to the accusations made against him regarding the building of the forts but in doing so he seems to me rather to admit than to deny the facts as stated by the committee End note on no less authority than this would i consider myself justified in bringing any such charge of mr seward's incompetency i have heard very much among american politicians much also of his ambition with worse offences than these i have not heard him charged at the period of which i am writing february eighteen sixty two the long list of military successes which attended the northern army through the late winter and early spring had commenced fort henry on the tennessee river had first been taken and after that fort donelson on the cumberland river also in the state of tennessee price had been driven out of missouri into arkansas by general curtis acting under general halleck's orders the chief body of the confederate army in the west had abandoned the fortified position which they had long held at bowling green in the southwestern district of kentucky roanoke island on the coast of north carolina had been taken by general burnside's expedition and a belief had begun to manifest itself in washington that the army of the potomac was really about to advance it is impossible to explain in what way the renewed confidence of the northern party showed itself or how one learned that the hopes of the secessionists were waxing dim but it was so and even a stranger became aware of the general feeling as clearly as though it were a defined and established fact in the early part of the winter when i reached washington the feeling ran all the other way northern men did not say that they were despondent they did not with spoken words express diffidence as to their success but their looks betrayed diffidence and the moderation of their self-assurance almost amounted to despondency in the capital the parties were very much divided the old inhabitants were either secessionists or influenced by secession proclivities as the word went but the men of the government and of the two houses of congress were with a few exceptions of course northern it should be understood that these parties were at variance with each other on almost every point as to which men can disagree in our civil war it may be presumed that all englishmen were at any rate anxious for england they desired and fought for different modes of government but each party was equally english in its ambition in the states there is the hatred of a different nationality added to the rancor of different politics the southerners desire to be a people of themselves 
to divide themselves by every possible mark of division from new england to be as little akin to new york as they are to london or if possible less so their habits they say are different their education their beliefs their propensities their very virtues and vices are not the education or the beliefs or the propensities or the virtues and vices of the north the bond that ties them to the north is to them a mesentian marriage and they hate their northern spouses with a mesentian hatred they would be anything sooner than citizens of the united states they see to what mexico has come and the republics of central america but the prospect of even that degradation is less bitter to them than a share in the glory of the stars and stripes better with them to reign in hell than serve in heaven it is not only in politics that they will be beaten if they be beaten as one party with us may be beaten by another but they will be beaten as we should be beaten if france annexed us and directed that we should live under french rule let an englishman digest and realize that idea and he will comprehend the feelings of a southern gentleman as he contemplates the probability that his state will be brought back into the union and the northern feeling is as strong the northern man has founded his national ambition on the territorial greatness of his nation he has panted for new lands and for still extended boundaries the western world has opened her arms to him and has seemed to welcome him as her only lord british america has tempted him towards the north and mexico has been as a prey to him on the south he has made maps of his empire including all the continent and has preached the monroe doctrine as though it had been decreed by the gods he has told the world of his increasing millions and has never yet known his store to diminish he has pawed in the valley and rejoiced in his strength he has said among the trumpets ha ha he has boasted aloud in his pride and called on all men to look at his glory and now shall he be divided and shorn shall he be hemmed in from his ocean and shut off from his rivers shall he have a hook run into his nostrils and a thorn driven into his jaw shall men say that his day is over when he has hardly yet tasted the full cup of his success has his young life been a dream and not a truth shall he never reach that giant manhood which the growth of his boyish years has promised him if the south goes from him he will be divided shorn and hemmed in the hook will have pierced his nose and the thorn will fester in his jaw men will taunt him with his former boastings and he will awake to find himself but a mortal among mortals such is the light in which the struggle is regarded by the two parties and such the hopes and feelings which have been engendered it may therefore be surmised with what amount of neighbourly love secessionist and northern neighbours regarded each other in such towns as baltimore and washington of course there was hatred of the deepest dye of course there were muttered curses or curses which sometimes were not simply muttered of course there were wretchedness heart-burnings and fearful divisions in families that perhaps was the worst of all the daughter's husband would be in the northern ranks while the son was fighting in the south or two sons would hold equal rank in the two armies sometimes sending to each other frightful threats of personal vengeance old friends would meet each other on the street passing without speaking or worse still would utter words of insult for which payment is to be demanded when a southern gentleman may again be allowed to quarrel in his own defence and yet society went on women still smiled and men were happy to whom such smiles were given cakes and ale were going and ginger was still hot in the mouth when many were together no words of unhappiness were heard it was at those small meetings of two or three that women would weep instead of smiling and that men would run their hands through their hair and sit in silence thinking of their ruined hopes and divided children i have spoken of southern hopes and northern fears and have endeavoured to explain the feelings of each party for myself i think that the southerners have been wrong in their hopes and that those of the north have been wrong in their fears it is not better to rule in hell than serve in heaven of course a southern gentleman will not admit the premises which are here by me taken for granted the hell to which i allude is the sad position of a low and debased nation such i think will be the fate of the gulf states if they succeed in obtaining secession of a low and debased nation or worse still of many low and debased nations 
they will have lost their cotton monopoly by the competition created during the period of the war and will have no material of greatness on which either to found themselves or to flourish that they had much to bear when linked with the north much to endure on account of that slavery from which it was all but impossible that they should disentangle themselves may probably be true but so have all political parties among all free nations much to bear from political opponents and yet other free nations do not go to pieces had it been possible that the slave owners and slave property should have been scattered in parts through all the states and not congregated in the south the slave party would have maintained itself as other parties do but in such case as a matter of course it would not have thought of secession it has been the close vicinity of slave owners to each other the fact that their lands have been coterminous that theirs was especially a cotton district which has tempted them to secession they have been tempted to secession and will as i think still achieve it in those gulf states much to their misfortune and the fears of the north are i think equally wrong that they will be deceived as to that monroe doctrine is no doubt more than probable that ambition for an entire continent under one rule will not i should say be gratified but not on that account need the nation be less great or its civilization less extensive that hook in its nose and that thorn in its jaw will after all be but a hook of the imagination and an ideal thorn do not all great men suffer such ere their greatness be established and acknowledged there is scope enough for all that manhood can do between the atlantic and the pacific even though those hot swampy cotton fields be taken away even though the snows of the british provinces be denied to them and as for those rivers and that seaboard the americans of the north will have lost much of their old energy and usual force of will if any southern confederacy be allowed to deny their right of way or to stop their commercial enterprises i believe that the south will be badly off without the north but i feel certain that the north will never miss the south when once the wounds to her pride have been closed from washington i journeyed back to boston through the cities which i had visited in coming thither and stayed again on my route for a few days at baltimore at philadelphia and at new york at each town there were those whom i now regarded almost as old friends and as the time of my departure drew near i felt a sorrow that i was not to be allowed to stay longer as the general result of my sojourn in the country i must declare that i was always happy and comfortable in the eastern cities and generally unhappy and uncomfortable in the west i had previously been inclined to think that i should like the roughness of the west and that in the east i should encounter an arrogance which would have kept me always on the verge of hot water but in both these surmises i found myself to have been wrong and i think that most english travellers would come to the same conclusion the western people do not mean to be harsh or uncivil but they do not make themselves pleasant in all the eastern cities i speak of the eastern cities north of washington a society may be found which must be esteemed as agreeable by englishmen who like clever genial men and who love clever pretty women i was forced to pass twice again over the road between new york and boston as the packet by which i intended to leave america was fixed to sail from the former port I had promised myself and had promised others that I would spend in Boston the last week of my sojourn in the States, and this was a promise which I was by no means inclined to break. If there be a gratification in this world which has no alloy, it is that of going to an assured welcome. The belief that men's arms and hearts are open to receive one, and the arms and hearts of women too, as far as they allow themselves to open them, is the salt of the earth, the sole remedy against seasickness the only cure for the tedium of railways the one preservative amidst all the miseries and fatigue of travel these matters are private and should hardly be told of in a book but in writing of the states i should not do justice to my own convictions of the country if i did not say how pleasantly social intercourse there will ripen into friendship and how full of love that friendship may become i became enamoured of boston at last beacon street was very pleasant to me and the view over boston common was dear to my eyes even the state house with its great yellow painted dome became sightly and the sunset over the western waters that encompass the city beats all other sunsets that i have seen during my last week there the world of boston was moving itself on sleighs there was not a wheel to be seen in the town the omnibuses and public carriages had been dismounted from their axles 
and put themselves on snow-runners and the private world had taken out its winter carriages and wrapped itself up in buffalo robes men now spoke of the coming thaw as of a misfortune which must come but which a kind of providence might perhaps postpone as we all in short speak of death in the morning the snow would have been hardened by the night's frost and men would look happy and contented by an hour after noon the streets would be all wet and the ground would be slushy and men would look gloomy and speak of speedy dissolution there were those who would always prophesy that the next day would see the snow converted into one dull dingy river such i regarded as seers of tribulation and endeavoured with all my mind to disbelieve their interpretations of the signs that sleighing was excellent fun for myself i must own that i hardly saw the best of it at boston for the coming of the end was already at hand when i arrived there and the fresh beauty of the hard snow was gone moreover when i essayed to show my prowess with a pair of horses on the established course for such equipages the beasts ran away knowing that i was not practised in the use of snow chariots and brought me to grief and shame there was a lady with me on the sleigh whom for a while i felt that i was doomed to consign to a snowy grave whom i would willingly have overturned into a drift of snow so as to avoid worse consequences had i only known how to do so but providence even though without curbs and assisted only by simple snaffles did at last prevail and i brought the sleigh horses and a lady alive back to boston whether with or without permanent injury i have never yet ascertained at last the day of tribulation came and the snow was picked up and carted out of boston gangs of men standing shoulder to shoulder were at work along the chief streets picking shoveling and disposing of the dirty blocks even then the snow seemed to be nearly a foot thick but it was dirty rough half melted in some places though hard as stone in others the labour and cost of cleansing the city in this way must be very great the people were at it as i left and i felt that the day of tribulation had in truth come farewell to thee thou western athens when i have forgotten thee my right hand shall have forgotten its cunning and my heart forgotten its pulses let us look at the list of names with which boston has honoured itself in our days and then ask what other town of the same size has done more prescott bancroft motley longfellow lowell emerson dana agassiz holmes hawthorne who is there among us in england who has not been the better for these men who does not owe to some of them a debt of gratitude in whose ears is not their names familiar it is a bright galaxy and far extended for so small a city what city has done better than this all these men save one are now alive and in the full possession of their powers what other town of the same size has done as well in the same short space of time it may be that this is the augustan era of boston its elizabethan time if so i am thankful that my steps have wandered thither at such a period while i was at boston i had the sad privilege of attending the funeral of president felton the head of harvard college a few months before i had seen him a strong man apparently in perfect health and in the pride of life when i reached boston i heard of his death he also was an accomplished scholar and as a grecian has left few behind him who were his equals at his installation as president four ex-presidents of harvard college assisted whether they were all present at his funeral i do not know but i do know that they were all still living these are mr quincy who is now over ninety mr sparks mr everett the well-known orator and mr walker they all reside in boston or its neighborhood and will probably all assist at the installation of another president End of chapter eight